Trump is saying something like, um, I have the epistemic ability to completely verify these sciences that I'm affirming. Um, and that's why I'm doing it. What I think he's saying is he knows that he doesn't have the ability to completely verify it in all cases, but for practical purposes, he, he has evidence that this person like went to college and is good at their field. And it's more reasonable to at least provisionally take on what this person is saying until some other expert who also knows what they're talking about can refute it. Is that, it might be completely anti-scientific. Uh, well, my problem with that is that how do you get from that to making a medical all grand medical All he's saying point? is that that is rational. That's so it was like three no, things that's, there. That's one, one sec, one sec. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go so, ahead. so I'm talking about average people. And if an average person is just listening to a lecture of a physicist and the physicist says some really complicated equation and says this, this works, the r average person is rational to believe this. This is different from progress in science. Progress in science is done by lots of people who understand it and are challenging things. So there's Aren't a difference between T jump. Can I, I'd like to respond to that on I'm that gonna basis. Say, I'm going to start muting people. On, I swear to God on that <laughs> basis, then all the people. Uh, one at a time know, people. I just want to know what, um, I forgot my question. Well, can I ask one? Pragmatist. Ask me, ask me to the group pragmatist. My problem to jump is like, if you take philosophy of science, all right, he was literally giving a long response to something, and I wanted to hear it. I, so, was somebody talking? Because yeah. I can't hear it. There was like somebody who began a sentence, and then like just, I couldn't hear him anymore. Did you finish your point, he jumped? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I did. I was done. My, my point was just that an average person is rational to believe an expert in the field, and this is separate from like um, progress in science. Progress in science is done by a consensus of experts making predictions and testing them out. And so that has nothing to do with whether or not I read an average person is rational to believe in experts and uh, true. metaphysical claims. Average. Science can make metaphysical claims all the time. It's called scientific realism. We all that thing, but you don't need certainty for that. No one cares. If you have certainty, the consensus is fallibilism. You don't need certainty. Uh, so I don't know what that guy kept bringing up. You just, when you, by average people, you right, go ahead, experts, well, what I was saying people, was that, not in the field, right? That's what you're talking about. Uh, the United States average persons. Sure. Would be destroyed by nuclear fire, fire a coin. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Okay. D uh, what I was C saying was, by definition, metaphysical claims cannot be investigated by empirical scientific method. It no. rests on metaphysical assumptions. No. So no. This, my only issue is that when people yeah. appeal to science, is like disproving or proving wait, wait, a what, giant what metaphysical claim like, of what? what it is. What definition? What, of oh no! It's, it's an inductive. It's, it's um the Baptist. Whatever your name is, man. In. I don't know. One second, What's Baptist. The guy's name? It's called Baptist Mole. Somebody that guy. That's what his name is. Yeah, Baptist. I wanted to ask you. So, what? Why can't science investigate metaphysical claims? Because scientific realism is again the consensus among scientists. So they disagree with you. Like they all disagree with you. Why do you? The think empirical some... scientific method is by definition assuming a bunch of metaphysical um assumptions, right? And it's only investigating repeatable uh, inductive reasoning about giving you more probability of certainty about patterns in the material world. I'm not following. Not, you can't make metaphysical claims. You can you can infer them from the results of that, but you have to like plug them into your metaphysical assumptions. You well, cannot investigate metaphysical claims with physical, empirical, scientific methods. So, so the way science works is you make a hypothesis, which you can make up whatever you want. Magical pixie leprechauns are ruling the universe, whatever hypothesis you want. And then you say, if my hypothesis is true, here's what we would expect to see under some experiment. Do an experiment and see if you get the result. And if you get the result, that's evidence for whatever metaphysical hypothesis you have. So I'm not sure. Which, How do you test a metaphysical here? truth under a according, microscope? According to that, I can show that life is just yes you could if you had novel testable predictions but so the point here is that any any metaphysical hypothesis you have the world is purely material the idealism is true God is real don't care you can make up whatever you want the way That's to so indicate that it's true is you make novel testable predictions and if they're confirmed, right. that's evidence of your hypothesis. For example, um, <laughs> in Hinduism, the Bhagavad Gita predicts the age of the earth is 4.3 billion years old, which is within 5% accuracy. It's a very good prediction. That is some very minute evidence that the Bhagavad Gita's God thingy, Brahman, is true. So, yes, you can indicate metaphysical truths with empirical science. Right. You have to assume a metaphysical assumption. Today. 
like what? the uniformity of nature over time and stuff. That's what oh. you're not seeing. You have a blind spot epistemically. No, well, None of that matters. That's a part of the hypothesis. You're interpreting data to fit it into your metaphysics. You cannot the, test the metaphysical assumption. You're, you're confusing, assuming, you're confusing the hypothesis that. with the assumption. So if I make a hypothesis that has some variables to it, like there's uniformity of nature and magical leprechauns, uh, whatever I predict about the future, if I get it right, that's evidence of all of my assumptions and all of my hypotheses, because that's the point of the hypothesis. The hypothesis is all of your assumptions. You say, if okay, these I, are my, these I, are my I, assumptions, all of them. Right. If you have to true, read the data and see if that matches. You, you could say it makes it more likely, or you could have a completely false paradigm assumption where it seems like that. You cannot so get any truth out of that. I have no idea what you just said. Like, like, so no, I have sorry. assumptions. All my assumptions Here's are a, magical pixie leprechauns, and then I'm assuming all of this stuff, and then I make predictions. If magical pixie leprechauns, then I'm going to see this, this stuff in the future, and then if I look and I see this stuff in the future, that's evidence of every single one of my assumptions. All of my assumptions now have evidence for me to believe them. Or instead all of magical fairy whatever, it's actually something else you haven't even thought of, and it just seems like it seems like it fits to your magical fairy, sure, but it actually uh, does. One, one second, evidence. guys. Hey, T, T Jump. Um, Nikita wanted me to ask if you. She wanted to arrange a debate between you and someone else in the server. I told her already that, that you charge for that stuff, but I just she wanted to ask you. Yeah. Oh, does bucks. he charge? Oh, I didn't know. Okay, that's fine. Don't worry. Either. Yeah. So well, tell he's, tell he's Luca right, fifty it. bucks. <laughs> but yeah, go go ahead, guys. Unless it's a famous so person or someone. Who hey, I, wait. Hold on. I wanted I wanted to say something. I didn't get the chance earlier. On biology. Come on, bro. Oh, yeah. If if uh, my my hypothesis is that life was designed, so if life was designed, we should find properties that life possesses that are that arise only from intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, we've in the twentieth century we found we discovered that very thing. We discovered that DNA is a product of intelligence because it possesses prescriptive functional information which operates linguistically and algorithmically. And we know that prescriptive functional information, algorithms, and the semiotics of linguistics arise only from intelligence. Therefore, we have empirical evidence that the hypothesis was true. We are, in fact, designed. Who's the designer? That's the only question now. Well, that, that would be great evidence if it wasn't debunked by Shannon Claude's information it, theory and it, it information. Because genetic information is not Shannon information. Uh, any any information. information. Information is physical. It's not my mind. But uh, what is quantum? Quantum is wanted to say something? Physical. Right. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to say something. So based upon what you said earlier, Which you thing? know, the average person has like a rational basis to believe like the um, person who puts forth the equation, right? Well, on that same basis, like the average person living in like a Mayan society way back when would have a rational basis to believe that all these people being sacrificed on the temple tops to the gods, um, it was perfectly rational and in line with, in accordance with some higher truth, right? So that's part a... of the problem with that no. way of giving authority to people uh, just on the basis well, no, of so, an so arbitrary you got to ask a question and stop speaking and not assume your question. So, no, they were not justified because they didn't have any <laughs> demonstrable results of the people sacrificing. So if the people sacrificing virgins or whatever could consistently cause storms to arise or not arise, then, yeah, they'd be rational in believing that sacrificing virgins that was effective. They did. They'd get harvest of the crop or the, you know, the they'd have a whole solar eclipse. I'm like, that's proof right there. I mean. That's, that's, if, that's sacrifice, if they could do that, then, so, so if, for example, the uh, sacrificers knew when the eclipses were going to happen and then sacrificed a virgin right before an eclipse and the average person doesn't know this and all they see is, oh, look, someone sacrificed then eclipse, then, yeah, they would be rational in believing that the people doing the sacrificing knew more about them. About the, the yeah, by eclipse. your methodology, it's the same thing, I think, is what's going on. No. Right, can I ask a question, Super Saiyan? Yeah, go ahead. We talk about this appeal to authority or, or experts, and, and that's a great hypothesis or in a hypothetical world. Of course, we have morality that enters into the equation. But my question is at what level or, or when is it decided someone qualifies as an expert to be able to challenge the consensus? Uh, well, those are so like you don't need to be an expert to challenge the consensus. Those are two separate topics. But what makes someone an expert is the ability to create results in the field. So. Like novel testable predictions. If you can do novel testable predictions in the field, that's what makes you an expert. So was Jackson Pollock an expert in the field of banning? 
Jackson Pollock. Um, the painter? I, I don't know. I don't know what an expert in the field of painting is. That's not like the painting methodology isn't like a scientific methodology. So I don't, I don't know. It's not? No. So I mean, is, is there a difference between a Rembrandt painting and a Pollock painting? Uh, one people pay more for, but they're not like, again, correspond. There's no correspondence to reality with painting. So, so there is not an objective method by which you get one result as opposed to another. There's no correspondence to reality. So that's the part that's missing here. In science, you have a correspondence of course to reality. There is. No. The, the result is the, the accuracy of the depiction do, do as it like relates a, to you have like a legitimate question. Because the, que the topic here is what makes an expert in a scientific field, which is has a criteria on that it must correspond to reality. Painting doesn't have that criteria. You can paint whatever you want. You can paint unicorns. No correspondence to reality required. So what makes an expert in art is, I don't know, creativity. What makes an expert in science is the ability to make your ideas correspond to reality. That's not exactly true, but that's yeah, exactly I don't, I don't true. know what you're getting at, Quantum, because like art does not, not use the scientific method. It, it actually if, if does, it did, but well, we believe on. that art is separate from that. But yeah, uh, but I'll even if it did, no, no, though, okay, it, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Wait, the wait, main wait, point wait, I was quantum. trying to make. Thank you, whoever did yeah, that. Anyways, right. um, Quantum, even if you were right, that wouldn't be a problem for T Jump because then art just would be an analogy for science, but it's not. That's the problem. Yeah. So pragmatic. what I was saying was was that making an effect in a field isn't the same as making an advancement in a field, right? Like we would all say that Jackson Pollock made an effect in the field of painting, um, but that doesn't mean that he, you know, actually made a, a valid contribution upon which other things are built. He, in fact, regressed that field. So the same thing can be in the field of science. You, you can have people who are what? quack. Science. Okay. Pra pragmatist. Uh, pragmatist. Uh, Just one second, pragmatist, if I can. I've tried to explain this to quantum so many times. Science is a methodology. The fact that you can apply the scientific method to art doesn't make art the scientific methodology, does it? Right. So hold, hypothesis. No, but the they're putting hold authority on, in the hands of Chrome's particular next. scientists. Chrome, Chrome wants to say something next, and I think Alex wants to say something. I was just trying to point out, I think what quantum's appealing to is like specific techniques in the field and this, that, and the other, and different techniques give different results. And as far as uh, the, the painting themselves, right? I think that's what he's appealing to, but it does seem kind of like a bit of a derail. Yeah. So I'm not following which um, pseudoscientific, like flat earther, for example, has an effect on science without actually making progress. What's that? Well, you're appealing to authorities within science. Yeah. And right? I said, what makes someone an expert is their ability to make an effect in the field. And you said quacks can make an effect. And I'm like, okay, which quacks right. make an effect in science? Which? Well, like there's Darwin. people who we're told to believe are experts in science who are really just like, you know, pop um, <clears throat> apologists for what? it. What? like Richard Dawkins and stuff like that. No, he's an actual and biologist. He's an actual expert. He's actually made well, large contributions to the field of biology. Like significant. Right. Large. But like then very they the take field. the, they, they may have some like, you know, um, small area of discovery that they have actually made some contribution to, but then they take the next step and they make metaphysical claims or claims about the nature of reality that you can't extrapolate from those um, those discoveries that they have made. No, that's, and so that's that would a constitute of, a regression. No, that's scientific realism. That's the consensus in science. Yeah, appeal to a consensus is also a logical fallacy. Wait, I thought no, one D not. got banned from the server. <laughs> it's completely rational to come to appeal to consensus. You saying it's, it's rational does not make them not a fallacy. Wait, wait, wait. Well, that's what a fallacy is. Just listen to the experts. Um, Wait, I'll post you the say some, are, are you? If the consensus Wait a minute. actually hold says on, it, it's on. not a fallacy. So is Quantum's so critique of no. Dawkins based on the fact that Dawkins speaks about things that, I mean, we, we point to the same criticisms with like AIG, right? That they appeal to experts uh, who have like PhDs and they're 
they speak to fields other than what they hold expertise in, right? And and that's a legitimate criticism. And if you want to criticize Dawkins' uh, views on theology on the basis that he's not an expert in theology, okay, whatever. Yeah, it's legit. So if he's not an expert in a field, then he's not, he doesn't qualify as an expert in that field. So to be an expert, you have to make progress in that field. That's, so that would, that would be covered okay. by okay. my previous definition. Can I throw out an example that I think I would? it would be nice if people could address? When somebody goes to the doctor and says, I am ill, the doctor checks them and says, you have this illness, and gives them a prescription and tells them these are the side effects. They take the prescription. They accept that that is the consensus of medicine and that this authority is speaking on behalf of the consensus to say, for your pathology, this medicine is required. If people want to go online, research the pills, find alternatives and whatever, they are more than welcome to, but it is not required to be actually, rational. All you have to do is say, I have gone to an accredited doctor, I have given my symptoms, and I have received the pills. Even if you're skeptical, you could go to a second and a third doctor, you're going to appeal to the consensus authority of those adopters to then go, okay, I'll take my pills. Fun fact, it's actually irrational to do research on your own. Um, people who do research on their own usually get it wrong. And so trusting the experts is actually more rational than doing research on your own. I of course example agree. Neff. Uh, Teach up. I take issue with your uh, way that you're showing how you're showing scientific realism to play out, but this might not be the right place for the conversation, and people are going to misunderstand it. So, perhaps later or another time, I'd like to point. Right. So the doctor is going to give you the medication. He's also going to give you the list of all the side effects. Right. Sure. Yeah, that's what I said. I specifically said that they would have formed consent with a list of side effects, yes. But what they aren't going to do is explain right, to you so the molecular structure. Right, so it might make your condition structure. worse. What they aren't <laughs> going to do is explain to you the molecular structure of it and how it works and what the science was that came to that detail, and you need not ask that. Let, let and quantum, yes, let science ask is fallible. So, so, so it might make it worse, but the percent chance of making it worse is significantly lower than the percent chance of making it better. Oh, that's just an arbitrary thing that you're saying. It would depend what? on each case specifically. Well, no, no, that's literally and the on opposite what medication of that it that's, is. That's literally the opposite of arbitrary. The whole point of uh, medications is that it has yeah, a higher probability so of making you better. Have you ever heard like there's lies, there's damned lies, and then there's statistics, right? Because yes. people aren't statistics. So if one person people takes a medication statistics. that works for other people and that person gets sick or ill, um, I mean, it's just a demonstration that what it believes it, what it's believed that that medication does isn't necessarily the case, or it, it may not be accurate fully. No, you just give the I'm just saying that it's there's a limit, <sighs> and we should have skepticism of doctors and people who wear lab coats well, and no, the, know the no. truth Look. because they're just like so, you know priests in previous times, which was like what I was saying. So you just gonna preach thing, and model. On so it's, quantum quantum brings um, up an interesting point. Sorry uh, that you can't pay attention. Quantum, quantum but... you bring up an interesting point that you're right that the medication that we give to people isn't particularly designed for each individual because it, we can't measure each individual. What we can do is we can measure trends in populations and try to generalize from those trends. If we could literally measure each and every individual and specifically design drugs for each and every individual, yes, that would be better, but we can't do that. But that does not mean we can be skeptical of the medication because you also don't have any way to specifically design medication for yourself. So the best evidence we have that anyone has, that the experts have, that you have, that anybody has, is that this general drug that applies to the vast majority of people will most likely work for you. And so it's not rational to be skeptical because you have no better source of information available. No, it's specifically rational to be skeptical because everything that is concentric circles outside of your particular investigation, even if you just believe in materialism with your five sense reality, uh, represents a, a horizon to your certainty about whatever you're being told. That, that was so, my question. So, so, so you quantum. yourself have to be a scientist quantum. to actually prove every single thing. Quantum. Would you, you know, please get off this box? What's a quantum? The question was, is this a box, drug? Chrome. Okay. Quantum, I don't know. Quantum, You've quantum, given quantum, yourself quantum, over focus. to focus. demonic boomerism, whatever. Okay, you stop. You can reject Just God. Stop. That's cool. Quantum. But quantum. Question. Oh, that's okay. not what everybody quantum. else is doing. Quantum. So the question was, is if there's a drug and this drug works at some rate in the population, and, he, and the doctor gives you the drug, 
are you rational to be skeptical of the drug or are you rational to believe it has this percent chance of working on you? Now, if all of the evidence we have is just how the drug works on the population, what you would need to be rational to be skeptical is some new evidence, some something, some new access to new information that nobody else has to give you a reason to be skeptical that your the data of this drug applying to you would be different from the population. The same thing applies to no. I would just have to reject the evidence that they're offering to begin with because I am not the source of those findings, right? Right. But so that's, that's not like rational. earlier when we were talking about that question of who vets the. Um, those who do peer review, it's the same question, right? But why do you so think that's somebody rational? can give me Quantum. give me a sheet of paper that says Quantum. this uh, medical product works Quantum. with whatever amount of accuracy on this population? Uh, I still don't personally know that, so I'm engaged in a risk if I enter into you know if I consent to that medical operation or those uh, drugs or whatever it is. Yeah, is and that, is that it would rational, just be being intellectually honest about it. Is it rational to say the doctor is wrong and you're going to be skeptical? Is it that, is. Why? I just explained it to you because there's limits to your certainty as to what you're being presented with. So, so and you can't escape wrong. that. So, so at a point you enter into a faith commitment where you say, I guess that probably it's true. They're wearing a lab coat. They're talking fancy. Probably I should no, take that's this drug the that they're basis. handing me. No, that is that's basically what it is. It's just that product. you guys euphemize it and you try to make it out to seem more legitimate than it actually is. No, no. So Quantum. you can compare the results. How often is the doctor right? How often is yeah. the doctor wrong? And the doctor's right. That's so many levels of percent a fallacious correct. argument, bro. Wait, wait, how, that's <laughs> We've already induction. established that that is a fallacious argument. No, that's wait, basic but... induction. Um, I don't know why you think that's fallacious. Uh, it's just induction. Um, wait, but Quantum, would you go to like a doctor's in like Romania if like or oh, that's a bad example in like a let's say a, a less well off country if time and time again they were wrong they did like bad surgeries things like that would you go to that doctor's just because they're wearing the lab coat and appear to look like a doctor of course not yeah so clearly it, it, like the thing influencing you is part of the success rate not just what they're wearing and the appearance they seem to give off and the fancy words clearly it's something more than that like success, like the success rate of yeah, okay. you're the, the more fundamental reliability. The the more yeah, fundamental point that I'm trying to convey is that you never have perfect certainty. No you one can cares. only claim no, perfect. no one does. Yeah, pretty much everyone in the room agrees with that quantum. But uh, here's what here's what bugs me: us looking at this authority thing in a vacuum. It, it, we're we're doing this like we don't have this huge history of science coming through for us. Like we have planes and iPhones and all this crap. Like we, I think we have like as a normal person, like T Jump said, enough evidence to at least like have some confidence in them, right? I I'd like to address the peer review thing, but I don't know if that's a rabbit hole that people aren't interested. But this constant thing of who peer reviews the peer ahead, review is my... is just somebody who doesn't know how peer review works. Uh, okay, explain the absolute the science of it. Generally, it's not even science, right? It's admin. Generally speaking, the way that peer review works is that it has several key facets in order to work properly, which is why you are tiering of journals. And the journals that emit to high tier always have, number one, anonymized peer reviewers so that the people which who cares? are peer reviewing can't be bribed or can't be gotten to. Second of all, multiple peer reviewers, depending on what the topic is. If it's going into a C-level journal with something mundane, like we reacted these two things and we didn't find anything and there's no conclusion, you're likely going to only have one peer reviewer. If it's going in a top tier nature journal on the front page, you're going to have over 10 peer reviewers, all anonymized and all from the field. They are built to be competitive. Anonymous. Their Anonymous. goal, their goal is in order, their goal, up. Their goal is to show that the work isn't the case because they are working in the field and would like to make the discoveries themselves. It is a competition and peer reviewers are disincentivized from 
accepting papers, I th right? I think Depending right. on the field but those, of you're, you're failing to see honest. that those very people who apparently, according to you, have a benevolent reason for doing it, they're still fallible in their research capabilities, et cetera, because by the nature that they're human beings. So you haven't they don't solved have the a problem at all. All you did was try to claim that they have some, um, you know, positive motivation and that they can't be bribed or something. I didn't say they have positive motivation. Minimum. They have negative motivation, not positive. Their goal is not to prove the thing correct. Do you their have access in general, to their minds? Do you have access to their yes, minds? No, yes, you don't. I have access. You're a liar. I, I do. I, 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 prob I, I do. I have access to the system and how the system is set up to work and what it incentivizes for. Do you have access for. to the understanding well, of each of those may, people's may I, motivations? May I, I think, may, I, may I think yeah. you're, there's an easier way to explain this. So, like, if you're okay. asking, like, if you use a whetstone to sharpen a knife and you're asking well who sharpens the whetstone well the knife is also sharpening the whetstone they're they're grading against one another so in peer review the process itself is self-correcting it causes itself to be self-peer reviewed because of the way it works and the way it works is that any new idea that comes in from any direction if it supersedes or challenges other ideas and it makes novel predictions and it works and somebody else checks it and finds out it works then that now revolutionized the entire process it's all that's required and uh, and just one last thing and and i'll drop uh talking about it i mean it also is a case of peer reviewers reviewing the peer reviewers when somebody is submitting to say nature ai where i happen to know the editor right the person that does the peer review their peer review is reviewed three times by others because it is in the top tier journal it could be reviewed That's it. infinite numbers of times it doesn't mean that they've gotten to the truth of what it is yeah it, so it does I, because because you this is just hyper skepticism taken to like the nth exactly degree. no Thank this you. is this That's is necessary say, skepticism quadrant. If, wait, no, no there, okay. there's a level of time to talk, buddy. Yeah, so all the all this is is just an appeal to infallibilism. I see this all the time, right? Everybody here is admitting that science is fallible and that we are fallible when we're uh, looking at science, right? That's not the issue here. If that's your standard, that's not a reasonable standard. You couldn't even navigate and cross the street on a standard like that. Yeah, the, the the point of the appeal the appeal to, of science is the is reliability, right? Science works; it produces results. And science doesn't proclaim that things are true or absolutely true. Science only proclaims that these are the best understandings of the moment and liable to change. Right. Holding the standard of truth is ridiculous to a field that doesn't even proclaim to find truth in that sense. Right, which is why most people who talk about science don't engage in actual science because most of you don't admit that this process um you're not engaged in actually that scientific process because you don't begin with so much skepticism you're already saying that you defer to authority figures on these things when you don't conduct the quote unquote science yourself uh, actually so I'm just I, saying I, I, that's I, not I, accurate here's the problem i'll agree with, wait, i wait, agree wait. with quantum i want to agree with quantum really quick quantum i agree with you when you have your bespoke definition and no one else holds to it you are right that no one else is holding to your bespoke definition it's also true that no one cares though well i i would i would say uh quantum I, you know you you're free to criticize all you want but if you have a more reliable method i would love to see it nobody cares about your proprietary definition Making right i now. care I, I i care i want to know his proprietary definition but just in you know the purview of context you want to know the actual argument more of course i think his definition is going to be more funny I will not well as it stands right now value. the most this is still the most robust system we have, and I'm still waiting for someone to produce a more robust system. Okay, I'll give you the proprietary definition, and we can move on, and you'll be happy, uh, T-Job. Here's the definition. Science is only methods that produce absolute certainty. <laughs> Cogito. Cogito is science. Cogito is science, and I, myself, am the physical body of fucking science. <laughs> But yeah, I do think it would be funny if he gave an actual definition of what he thinks is required for science, because I think it would sound very much like that. I think it would be very funny. 
I'm going to go to the uh, hangout, heat and hangout thing now. See you guys. Our panel on our Discord stage to uh, convince us that one or more deities exist. So we're here um, with our panel, who I'm going to introduce now. Uh, we start off with um, Amy Newman. Um, she's known for her trademark slogan, Sending Love. Um, she's a professional comedian and skeptic who hosts debates, interviews, and conversations on her YouTube channel. She also creates educational and other important content. Her YouTube channel is at youtube.com slash Amy Newman. Tom Jump, or T-Jump, is an atheist philosopher who hosts conversations with professors, philosophers, and other academics about topics ranging from biology and physics to religion and morality and so on. T-Jump's YouTube channel is at youtube.com slash T-Jump. J. Mike is one of the co-hosts of the Talk Heathen show, and he joins us from time to time as well. Jefferson Spatchcock is an atheist inquisitor and intellectual who has particular expertise in analyzing and reviewing debates. His YouTube channel is available in the uh, YouTube video description. J.L. Warren is an atheist activist, educator, and entertainer. He runs the Bridge the Divide YouTube channel where he addresses in irrational beliefs, the irrational behaviors that often follow, the societal divides they create, and how those divides can be bridged with education, rationality, and reason. His YouTube channel is at youtube.com slash JL Warren. I'm Randolph Richardson, an atheist from British Columbia, Canada. I'm the founding president of the Canadian Atheists, and I'm an advocate for freedom, fair justice, and critical thinking. You can find out more about the Canadian Atheists at canadianatheists.ca, that's the website, and my YouTube channel is at youtube.com slash Randolph Richardson. IX is a Tom Unboxes subscriber and former atheist community of Discord admin who enjoys long walks through evolutionary biology inspired computer science, archaeological academic biblical criticism, and so on. Jack Burton is a self described middle aged college educated nobody who drives the pork chop express truck in his spare time. He's a deist and mostly non committal to philosophical stances. Peter de Tucker is an atheist from the Netherlands who handles the production of various YouTube channels, including Aaron Raw's channel, and generously contributes his professional artistic skills for free to atheists all around the world. His YouTube channel is at youtube.com slash gonna go for it. Taco, our organizer, is the number one Discord debater who has never lost a Discord debate in his life. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you to everybody on the panel for being here. Uh, did every, anybody have any burning points you wanted to make before we started our program? Uh, I think we should do intros last at the end when most people are here or, or to actually listen and potentially care. Uh, do intros at the beginning kind of ways because there's only like 10 people in the audience when we first start. You can do it at the start and the finish. It's not a big deal. So we've got uh, Prax, Pre, Pred. I don't know how to say that, but he wants to come up and talk with us about there being a potential simulation that's not necessarily a god existing, right? But it sounds pretty interesting. Hey guys. Good morning, Peter. So, oh um, I guess uh, Pax might be a little busy at the moment. Uh, he was interested uh, before the show started, so uh, if, uh, if that's that's the case. We could move on to yeah. another person. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Amy. Is, with them later. is Randolph cutting out for anybody every like 15 seconds or so? A little bit. He's cutting out a little bit for me. Oh, oh, Tangelo, fix that. You need to go push to talk, man. I'm going to invite you back up. Make sure you're push to talk. Thanks, T-Jump. Oh, it looked like Godless Girl is uh, wanting to come up. Shall we bring her up? Sure. Good morning, Godless Girl. How are you? Muted. <laughs> yeah, your microphone's muted, as T-Jump just pointed out. How are you, Godless Girl? Welcome. Thank you for joining us.
Okay, I guess. You, oh, sorry, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Well, we can hear you now. How are you doing? Okay, how are you guys? Pretty good, pretty good. So, um, I, you're godless, which means you're not uh, a theist. Did you have some perspective you'd like to share with us? Yeah, well, I'm I'm really critical of other atheists, though. I debate them more than I do theists. Oh, um, my ears perked up when I heard that Taco thinks he never lost a debate. Is that like a, just a joke, or is that true? <laughs> The world may meant, never know. I think it's meant to be tongue in cheek. So, no, it's it's completely legit, one hundred percent factual, unquestionable, <laughs> objective truth. I, I th Once again, the world thought, may never know. Otherwise, uh, an atheist challenging talk when that's not really the purpose of the stage. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. So, how would you guys respond to somebody who is saying they were a deist, but it's not like rationally justified? They're just believing it because. Um, of some intuition. If they're intellectually fine. honest about it, then there's not a problem. So you wouldn't have an argument against it? No. Well, it's it's, it's unfalsifiable. So you know, it's just, if they if they but if they believe in it and they're holding to it as an emotional appeal, they're aware of that. They're they're intellectually honest about it, and they're not running around making assertions about reality that everybody else should believe in it. Then they're they're allowed to believe whatever they want to believe, just as long as they're intellectually honest about it. That's cool. Oh, okay. I thought somebody would have, at least one of you would have some kind of objection to it. But uh, just because something is unfalsifiable doesn't mean that you can't, you can have like an a priori argument against something. Well, I can tell you the objection I would have is if they're trying to impose those beliefs on others. And uh, because I, I'm very much in favor of uh, people having intellectual sovereignty, as I like to call it. So, uh, but I, I don't think that really addresses your question, does it? Well, I thought you guys would try to argue that somebody couldn't rationally hold that belief. Well, it's it's irrational, yes, but it's as long irrational as aware, or irrational. It's it's irrational. It is not rational. It is irrational. So they can hold that, and but it, I mean, you can hold an irrational position as long as you're aware that it's irrational and you can accept that. If you're intellectually well, I, honest about it, then there shouldn't be a there shouldn't be a problem there. I don't think it would be irrational. Yeah, that's so what I would want an argument for because I don't think it's irrational. I think it's just irrational when you believe something because of an intuition in the absence of a defeater. Right. So I think it'd only be irrational if they claimed to have evidence that they didn't or something along those lines. If their beliefs were not proportional to the evidence that they claimed to have, if they just choose to believe based off of intuition and don't claim to have any evidence, then that's not irrational. They're just choosing to believe, and that's fine. Okay, so T Jump agrees with me, but JL Warren does not. He thinks it's irrational. Do you have an argument that it's irrational, JL? It's not rational. Yeah, it's irrational, like I said. A rational with an A. Okay, then it's irrational. Oh, yo, you're backpedaling. I, I don't say care. It's irrational. I don't care. Because this is not the purpose of the stage. You don't care if you backpedal? Okay. But I would just point out that there's no evidence that a mind can exist without a brain, and all the current evidence actually points to the fact that you need a brain, a physical, natural brain, to have a mind. It's not backpedaling, so, Liz. I'm just giving you what you want so you can go away. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't have to be on stage if you don't want me here. Cool. I good. love everybody. Mwah. All right. Thanks for coming up. Um, I, a friend of mine, Neil Spirits, is in the audience. I was PMing him here. I think he might want to come up. I'm going back and forth with him right now, but um, he has a lot of experiences with ghosts and spirits, so I think that would be a fun one if he'll come up. Experience with ghosts and spirits. Now, that's, uh, I'm assuming that's not just Halloween. <laughs> are we talking like I went to Valley Fair with him. or? Are we talking Demi Moore experience, or are we talking like Ray Stan's experience? I, I don't know exactly. That's why I'm saying I'd like to have him up here, because that seems like a very, very interesting topic. I saw him on the audience, and uh, he's got some cool graphs, even. Um, the uh, T-Jump, you recently were in a debate with uh, Kent Hovind, as I understand. How, how do you think that went? That was interesting. It was it was so close to like a really fun debate, but he kind of weaseled out of it because the debate with was, was testable predictions, and he didn't really understand that in science, testable predictions isn't just literally predicting anything about the future. Like I could predict that in five seconds I'm going to pick my nose, and if that happens, 
clearly that's not evidence of anything in science. No one cares. What cares? What people care about in science is novel, testable predictions, things that we don't know about yet. Um, but he he kind of evaded that topic well, as much as possible desperately. I, I watched that debate, and so Me too. I was really curious, uh, Tom. What did it say in the email that the title of the debate was? Because I know for a fact that you have to pin him down on a topic. If you don't do that meticulously, he's going to run away from it. Oh, I didn't set it up. Because... So it was uh, Donnie standing for truth set it up. So I wasn't a part of that. Yeah, what what confused me is that apparently there's a series and it's the same topic for every debate. According to Kent, so, I'm surprised. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, don't uh, think uh, he, TDM, TDM, did you get a chance to see McKinnon Mitchell's documentary on Hovind? Uh, he literally uh, said, maybe I don't know that he wasn't he wasn't required to defend his position. Well, yeah, I don't think Kent oh. has multiple debate strategies. He has one debate strategy and he just repeats the same strategy over and over again, no matter what you do with the title. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, we just have brought up a guest. Uh, Zeet, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Welcome. How are you doing? Zeit. Zeit. Thank you for correcting me, Zeit. How are you doing today, Zeit? No, no, no. Zeit. With, starting with a T. Zeit. Well, okay. Well, Zeit has uh, disappeared. He was offended well, thank by you for joining us. Oh, he wants to come back. I, I think it was his time. And if anybody else would like to come chat with us, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get you in the queue. The water is fine. Hello. 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 Welcome. Hello. What you got for us today? You can begin your argument. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. So we've got uh, Jordan in queue. So we'll go ahead and uh chat with jordan here what's going on good morning jordan good morning to you guys as well morning. um what you got for us today i apologize if i'm not very experienced in this topic but one of the arguments although by philosophers is not really that many have found that convincing one has been influential for me is like the moral argument for god and the reason why I see it as convincing is because when I look at things like moral naturalism or moral particularism, I like I generally usually assume moral realism is like the, the default position that most people have because we don't believe usually that morality is subjective, that there must be like some sort of um, explanation for that and and the way to account for that objectively would be um, a moral lawgiver because it, it, it always seems really intuitive to me like a, an objective moral law would need an objective moral lawgiver and i know people would like to object isn't that god's opinion well if he is <clears throat> saw um, then he would be the foundation of such principles so, so. Just wondering so if are. if wondering. there yeah so if there is uh, an objective moral um, then it should be independent of a mind I would think and so what uh, would justify uh, classing classifying it as objective when it is issued by a deity who obviously has a mind a god or a goddess um, I, I'm wondering how you uh, justify that, because it seems to me that uh, like the, the laws of nature, laws of physics and whatnot, seem to be just an emergent, uh, emergent property of, uh, of reality. Um, and so if, uh, and they're objective. So if, uh, if the moral laws that you're talking about are, and maybe you can give an example of a moral law that, that, that would work for this, but uh, I, looking, I, I'm interested in seeing how it would be um, uh, kind of uh, an emergent property of reality, I guess, part of reality, um, it should be, I think, uh, independent of there being any deities. If I can add to that just a little bit. So I agree morality is objective, but why not think morality being objective as a law of nature rather than a law given by a mind, like a law of legal system? Thank you, T-Jump. We also, oh. just to, just to, to piggyback on that, we also understand that, that moral concepts being subjected to individuals, to groups, to societies, to nations, to the world in and of itself, 
um, that we understand that, you know, these things strive, you know, they derive from our empathy, from our ability to empathize with other people, uh, formation of mirror neurons and the like. And of course, these are empathy and our ability to connect with the people, our ability to love. These, these were positive, positively selected traits because they were, um, they supported our survival. And so as human beings evolved over the past, you know, 2 million years that we developed these and because, <clears throat> you know, um, connecting or cooperative action and uh, empathy would allow us to survive better than selfish action. And so we would typically ostracize those individuals that worked against the group. We'd kick them out, which means that they would not breed and, and spread those genes. And then those individuals who were uh, more inclined to be empathetic with their fellow human beings were a part of the group. They passed their genes on. And so we artificially selected for our own empathy as we were protecting our group as a survival mechanism. And so and from our ability to empathize with others is is where moral stem from is where these moral considerations stem from so we understand this as a product of our evolution and instead of making a statement i'll give it back over to you, jordan to answer it but i do want to know afterwards just questions about hell if we are going to talk about the moral argument but feel free to respond anything those three gentlemen that I apologize if I can't get to all your objections. They all seem like they're very worth considering I, I, if I just don't remember them all. But if I were to just um, like look at this in order, the, like people spoke, uh, I think Randolph pointed out like, oh, you know, morality is an, an objective morality wouldn't seem like it would be dependent on a particular mind. And, you know, I think that there's some substance to that. And I think when I've talked to a lot of uh, yes. Sorry, can I just clarify? I, I what I did say, maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but what I did say was, it seems to me if it's going to be objective, it would not, it would be independent of a mind. Is the wording that I used, like the laws of nature. So the moral laws would be the same thing. Emergent properties of reality, regardless of whether there's a deity, and and that's kind of what I was getting at. Fair point. I'm sorry if I misrepresented you. No uh, problem, man. No problem. Um, regardless of that, uh, I think I'll, I'll, in my experience, when I've asked this question, people usually ground the moral properties as like the essence of God or in his, in his property. So it's not just based on the minds, but on like the divine, um, they're often referred to as like transcendental categories or properties of God. Um, and what I've experienced, people will usually ground that to say that, oh, well, you know, it's not like it's he's making a decision. It's in his his essence in which we can derive that these laws are given. And if I were to move on to, uh, I think it was T jump. Can I can I just respond to that? Um, can we break the laws of physics? They seem to be consistent. We don't seem to be able to do that. We seem to have to be. Uh, working within those laws so and they they seem to be objective if that's also the case we have objective morality then I would expect logically this to be the same we would not be able to violate these moral laws and yet people are violating what people consider to be moral laws like not murdering other people uh, not stealing from people not vandalizing property and things like that well that's a that's a good that's a good point um, though I think what David, I just want to appeal to a distinction David Hume made, is that like, it, there just seems to be a distinction when we look at the laws of physics between is claims when we're describing the world versus describing it ought. Like, the, there's, there seems to be a difference between the claims that, oh, um, someone is murdering another person versus you ought not murder that other person. Uh, they seem to be like, it's they're categorically different. So in that sense, it doesn't seem like you could derive uh, like a statement that's just you know a fact describing it versus like those odd statements. So that's why I would probably just um, draw that sort of distinction because how would you derive any sort of moral claim? Say that you know someone goes up and kills another man. Um, how would you derive that is good or that is bad from just looking at the empirical facts about the situation? 
In the science fiction story I'm writing, I've been working on this since the 1980s uh, in my spare time. I'm working on a lot of things. Um, they, there's one planet where there's a society of assassins where uh, um, killing people, uh, killing other, they're, they're, they're alien species, but I'll just call them people for simplicity. Killing other people is uh, con not considered to be immoral. Um, there's um, certain situations where uh, it's not acceptable, but most of the time it's uh, it's something that can happen. They've got a huge overpopulation problem there. Um, they they multiply like rabbits. <laughs> so um, this is uh, part of the solution. So you know, to me, this is uh, the point of this is that uh, there are circumstances where if we're going to use killing another person is. Um, uh, is actually moral. Um, one thing I can think of is a mercy killing where somebody is suffering with a terminal illness that is only getting worse day by day and more painful for them and they they want euthanasia. So um, in my view it would be moral to kill that person uh, because they're requesting it and um, they obviously and I think and the reason I mentioned the, the the terminal illness is just to kind of make it easier for people to, to consider this thought experiment. Um, there are um, other situations where people are okay with capital punishment. Now I'm opposed to capital punishment in its current forms. I think that I do have a suggestion for improving the situation um, and, and I'll just mention this briefly, what it is, uh, is, uh, and I've written about this, is that um, with a better solution would be if you still need capital punishment <clears throat> to instead make it a life sentence with after minimum time served, the, uh, the, con the convicted person can uh, apply to a judge to get the death penalty. So that way uh, it doesn't violate their uh, personal uh, bodily autonomy. And so their human rights would still be respected there. So to me that would be an improvement. Um, I, I think the whole problem with, with the incarceration is, is problematic though um, because a lot of the, the systems that are out there are punishment based and not uh, rehabilitation focused and <clears throat> as nearly as much as they should be. But um, these are, uh, I guess I'm, I've covered a number of different examples where we've provided a number of different examples where there's a lot of different views on these subjects. Can you provide an example of an objective moral that, um, that you think would be a good one to use as an example in this conversation? Um, so, this is, um, I'll, okay, I'll give one, uh, that you should not treat some people as an end, uh, as a means to an end. I think that will just resolve in some sort of like utilitarianism kind of thinking where you just view people as a, a, a means to get some sort of utility or um, pleasure points, which, you know, I think can be kind of arbitrary if you um, line it up. At least that's what I'm inclined to think so. So I think that objective moral law or maxim could be formulated as you should treat people as ends in themselves because we're all um, products of like rational decision makers. That actually brings up a good way to me to ask questions like, first, do you believe in a hell? Uh, I'm just, I, I'm curious. I'm presently, I don't know, to be honest. Well, I wanted to uh, go back to... Tricky. Randolph brought up a really good point that I want to kind of like rephrased it when I was talking is if we agree morality is objective, um, objective meaning it's not up to our opinions, the things that we know of that are objective are like laws of physics, gravity, uh, electromagnetism, weak, strong nuclear forces. Those are objective facts. And so if morality is objective, it seems to make more sense that it's going to be like one of those things, a law of physics, rather than a thing determined by a mind, like a God based morality. So why would we think if we agree morality is objective, wouldn't it make more sense that it's going to be one of like the law things like gravity more than like a law of legal system, like a God based God says it kind of a thing. Well, here's the thing though. I do treat it as like those laws of physics and I'm not saying that a, a bit being objective that it's purely based off of, you know, like the, you know, the a will the love of God. It's in his very nature, not just a decision. Otherwise, you get problems like the Euthyphio problem. I can't pronounce that right. But the, basically, the, the Euthyphro dilemma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how you pronounce it. Anyway, uh, you get situations like that 
in which it seems like morality can be con construed as morally arbitrary. So it seems to me that you would have to phrase morality as a sort of objective, uh, like nature of God in order to avoid those problems is not just dependent on the mind. It's about the facts of God's nature. Well, wouldn't so, it be better explained without the God part? Just say it's a nature of reality, like a law of physics. Why do you need the, why is the God part even included in that sentence? Well, it's because it's contingent upon his existence. Um, within his nature and, and but, but jordan so so just just to clarify to make sure i'm all caught up on your position is that you're asserting that um morale there is an objective morality and god is the foundation for that objective morality correct yeah mm -hmm. okay and that you hold to certain moral standards because you get them essentially from god and that you hold those those moral standards to be objective yes okay but if your God were to command you to do something that was different from that, like if your God commanded you to kill somebody and you believed in all one in 100 percent certainty that it was coming from God, despite the fact that you that you held the you priorly held the moral consideration that you would never do that. If it came from God, then how would you reconcile that? Well, I think as humans, we're morally fallible in the sense that. When we're going throughout our everyday lives, we don't have access to the appropriate knowledge at all the time versus like God who has access to all the facts in the world. So I think that's kind of a relevant factor because like, for example, if you're if you're trying to find out who's like the burglar of like someone broke into your shop or something. Right. And you you see a person who's just coming out and he looks very suspicious and you want to go and interrogate him. But like somehow God reveals to you that you, you shouldn't do that. Um, and it's probably part of his plan. And somehow he gets find out because the police are waiting outside and you didn't have to deal with anything because you're like, um, you're inside, whatever. I, I think that's, that's kind of a bad example, but what the point I'm just trying to illustrate is that, um, I think if God were to somehow reveal to me directly those types of messages, I, I should trust him because of the knowledge that he has. Also, due to the fact that I have, um, that he's, he's omnibenevolent, and an omnibenevolent person couldn't lie. If, okay, if, but, but the, the, the issue well, there I, is I wanted, that if, I was kind of like going somewhere with what I was asking. I'm not, I'm sure why you keep saying this is evidence of God. Like the reason you brought this up, as you said, one of the potential arguments for God is the moral argument. And my argument, what I said was that, why is this evidence of a God? Because I can grant there's objective morality, but if it's objective, that means it's probably has nothing to do with the mind. Like you said, it's the nature of God, which it's fine. But then why do you need the consciousness at all? You can just get rid of the consciousness entirely and say it's a law of physics, nature of nature. Why would this morality, why couldn't it be grounded in nature without any mind of any kind related to it whatsoever? Well, because of the, like the, you know, the is ought distinction that I bring up and I'd, I'd have to point out that it, if it wasn't based in some sort of, you know, single deity, then it seems that it would morality would be arbit like uh, queer in a sense. Jordan, can I get rid of that is ought problem? Because you said ver something very interesting, which is God has all knowledge, and you seem to imply that the more you know about something, the more we can understand this objective morality. And I guess. If knowledge is not going to make us more moral, why does God having all knowledge make him more moral? Well, I, I mean, if you have more knowledge about something, you're going to have um, a greater access to know how to act on a certain thing. Because if you treat the, the morality as laws, if you like, if, if you're like a um, a lawyer and you know the legal code you're obviously going to be able to act upon those laws and deliberate more effectively because of your knowledge. Um, I'm not sure. Could you mind, do you mind, could you rephrase your question? Because maybe I just missed it. Well, it just seems T-Jump and I, you know, I'm somewhere in between, but I'm leaning towards 
a morality and situations that we can objectively understand ethically, but I think we could take a God out of it. I don't understand. In fact, it seems to lie on this being that is all knowledgeable. And I just don't think we have good evidence for that. Nonetheless, I think we can become more, more knowledgeable in ethical situations, in morality. Well, if, if we were just want to go from that premise, you know, I, I, I can see how you might want to do that. You would have to engage with things like then, like the problem of the criterion, which I think is especially potent in epistemology, but and it can apply to morality, is that the problem can be phrased as how do you form a criterion for that? And if you if you say you you say you, you put in a criterion, right? Like to say it's utilitarianism, for instance. Say it's God's then nature. You, then you can just say, what's the criterion for that? And and so forth. And I think if you don't have some sort of like objective grounding for your criterion, then it seems that people can disagree about what morality is. And if people can disagree, that means it does, there doesn't seem to be a truth of the matter. If th this only is the case, if morality is, is grounded in human beings, for instance, then it seems that disagreement would lead to moral arbitrariness. Well, so you could apply the problem of the criterion also applies to God. So you can say it's grounded in God's nature and then we can disagree because we're atheists. That doesn't make any sense. And so the problem of the criterion applies to every model, including the God model. The God model doesn't solve the problem. So that wouldn't actually help your position there. But I think Amy brought up a really interesting point um, with the is-ought problem. Uh, knowledge is all is it. So you know all is statements. And if God has omniscience and knows all is statements, that still doesn't get you to an ought. So the is-ought problem would mean that his omniscience is kind of irrelevant because it can't get you from any of those is's and all of his infinite knowledge, they're all is statements and none of them get you to an ought. Well, I mean, the, it just seems like God would have some sort of moral ought, like his, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you would, what part of him would be an ought, but there seems there would be some sort of ought um in tribute to God, but I'm currently not really sure in how that would be like what type of foundation that would take place in. Yeah, in it doesn't make sense to me to say that like ought exists as like a part of God somewhere. Like I don't I don't even know what that means. It's one of his attributes. We uh, normally say the benevolent, omnipotent, or at least in the Western theistic um sense. And all the other omnis are attributes of God. I mean, that doesn't seem too out of the ordinary. Well, oughtness isn't one of those things, typically. Uh, oughtness, I don't think, can be, a. it's not like a property. It's not even, it doesn't even work that way. I don't I don't know what it means for oughtness to be a property. Are you, would you consider yourself like a moral anti-realist? No, just I'm a moral don't realist. I'm a mo very much moral uh, realist. I see, I see. Then... I'm curious how you would think that moral facts would like manifest themselves or like the like the laws of physics. Yeah, so I think instead of God's nature, it's nature's nature, but I don't think it has like a property of oughtness anywhere. I don't think there's like an oughtness particle hiding. Like I don't think that even makes sense. I think oughtness is a category we label things once like you can prove that oughtness isn't a part of morality. Like is something moral because you ought to do it? Or ought you do it because it's moral? Like try try to answer that. Can you say that again? Should you do it because you ought to do it, or you ought to do it because it is moral? Is something moral because you ought to do it, or ought you do it because it's moral? Euthyphro. No spoilers. Couldn't either way. Like... <laughs> well, no. So the, the first horn is saying, um, if you imagine a box that contains all the things that make something moral, oughtness would be one of the things in that box. So it is something moral because you ought to do it. That means oughtness is uh, one of the entailed properties that make something moral. And the second question is, ought you do it because it's moral? That means there's some box and all the set of moral properties are in that box. And once you know that, 
then you apply this outside property of oughtness that has nothing to do with morality. You're just applying it to the moral things. And to me, the second one seems to make more sense. You ought to do something because you know it's moral. So once you have a set of moral facts or whatever makes something moral and you know what that is, then you can say you ought to do it. But oughtness is never going to be one of those facts. Um, let me try and like uh, give my thoughts on what you, what the Euthyphro dilemma would look like. I I usually interpret it as saying either gods like he did in Euthyphro, the Plato did. Um, he formulated it as like, um, should the gods do something or is something pious? Because... Well, so just to just clarify, what I said literally has nothing to do with the Euthyphro dilemma other than the structure of the argument. So so my argument is is something moral because you ought to do it or ought you do it because it's moral so forget the youth of dilemma um i'm gonna be honest i don't know to be honest okay that's fair to me it seems like obvious you ought to do something because it's moral seems to be the correct answer there so i would say that no oughtness isn't really a property in morality anywhere it's something we add on later but i still wanted also, to go back to no. um also, if, if moral determinations um, can change, or if there, if God determines what moral considerations are, like what moral valuations are, what it, what a, what the morality is, if God makes that determination, then there is a change in that determination, or if there is a change possible in that determination, or if God can change it, then it's it, it's subjective to God. So it's either it's subjective to God or it's subjective to human beings. It's one of the two. Because if it was objective, then God would just be appealing to something outside of it. This would be I will. God can't violate the objective morality of the universe. So it's subjective either way. It's subjective to us or it's subjective to God. It's one of the two. Well, why couldn't it be like, you know, how foundationalists have some like um, non-inferential beliefs? It would be like, uh, like a sort of non-inferential belief with God being the like the foundation of morality. Like you, there would no be further justifier because that would be like the, the, like the self-justifying belief. I forget what foundationalists use um, as the term, um, but it's basically like self-evident beliefs or something like that. Well, it doesn't work because again, it goes back to what I said before. If you want to say that there is some kind of foundation, ultimate foundation that is the ground for morality, you can just say it's nature. You say there is a necessary aspect of nature or a quantum field or something, and it grounds all the laws and morality is one of those laws. And then the God part is completely arbitrary. It's irrelevant. You don't need it. That's actually, I want to piggyback off of that because that's where I, that's where I was kind of going in the very beginning of this is that if we have, if we have the explanatory model of where our morals come from and we understand that they are, uh, that they are essentially, uh, they are, they, they're derived from our empathy, from the empathy that we have for one another, the empathy that we, empathy that we have evolved over time because we've artificially selected for that because it's what aided our survival. So even if we weren't like consciously aware of it, uh, we realized cooperative action works, selfish action does not work. So we want people in the group that are, that are cooperative. We want to get rid of the people that are selfish. So we ostracize within the group, their genes don't get passed on. And so empathy becomes a selected, uh, a, positively, a positively selected trait. So we artificially selected for this. We understand this, it has explanatory power. It, it explains things. Um, so just saying like God is it doesn't offer anything. It's not an explanation. It's simply, it, you're making an assertion about something regardless of the, of the evidence at hand. So if we have this, this explanatory model of where morality comes from, where morals come from, where moral valuations come from, but where empathy comes from, and we understand this, why do we need a God to explain it? Well, then, because, and I would have to reject one of your premises that, uh, that the empathy would be a su sufficient explanatory model for morality because it seems like it can't account for cases, or at least in the evolutionary sense, these evolutionary debunking arguments can't take place or account for situations where it seems like it would be fit for survival, but it would be immoral. Uh, at no, least sure we do. Evolutionary game theory. Cooperative action leads to great, leads to more positive results in the long term than selfish action. So selfish action leads to positive results in the short term, but negative results in the long term. If everybody acts selfishly, then the society or the civilization will fall apart. If everybody acts cooperatively, then the society will flourish because we get long term positive results because of this. We share food, we share uh, um, shelter, we uh, we we 
work together. So we, we learned this very early on. And the thing that uh, facilitates that is our ability to empathy, uh, empathize, but that empathy comes from mirror neuron. And mirror neurons are things that exist in many species, not just us. So we understand this, that mirror neurons are integral to developing em empathetic relationships with other people. So through this evolution of these of mirror neurons and our ability to empathize with other people, we understand and we have an explanation as to where all this comes from. As to where our moral considerations, our moral valuations, why they are subjective, because they're subjective from group, from individual to individual, group to group, nation to nation, all over the planet, it's all subjective. So we understand this. I'm saying in the face of an explanatory model, why do we need to appeal to something that offers no explanation? Jordan, I can illustrate this to you, what JL is speaking about. Say you are walking down a street and you have a sandwich and you notice that a homeless person is on the street. And so what you do is that you split the sandwich in half and you hand it to him and walk away. Now, my question to you is, why did you split that sandwich and was it God? Uh, well, I think you, you there could be a, a numerous different reasons why someone would do that. Um, okay. Like, hey, sandwich to someone. It could be for, you know, selfish reasons. Like, he could want uh, people to recognize him for fame, for, um, for like, like, you know, approval on his peers. He could do it because, like, uh, he just wants to help out the guy. Um mm -hmm. And like the empathy that um, DL Warren was talking about. Um, yeah, but, or... but he gave him the sandwich because he looked because he looked hungry, right? I mean, in this hypothetical situation, it could be that or many other causes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, he's looking at him. He, he looks like he needs a sandwich. He looks hungry. He's not asking for one, but you decide to to do it anyway. It doesn't matter why. It's how did you make the determination that this person was in need? is because you recognize what need looks like in yourself. And so you empathize with the fact that they are needy, that they are in need. You recognize that, you internalize their experience, mirror neurons, and then you react accordingly. So it's either you reject it, which you can find considerations, which makes, you know, you can subjectively say, no, I don't want to, I'm really hungry and I want to eat my sandwich and he should get a job. Or you can say, no, I have this and I don't need this all the, all of this sandwich, so I'm going to split it. I'm going to give it to him. Or it says, oh, you know what? I wasn't really all that hungry anyway. Have the whole sandwich. Or, hey, oh, look, everybody's looking. I ought to do this because it makes me look good. Doesn't matter. You wouldn't have been able to identify with the other person's plight without those mirror neurons. So, so to summarize, they're saying morality is subjective. It's not objective. Therefore, you don't need a god to explain objective morality because there isn't one. That's what that's their argument. My argument is is even if morality is objective, that doesn't indicate a god because it can be objective without a god. And I agree with both those assessments. Well, that's uh, quite interesting. <laughs> I'm I'm just wondering like how and T drums view because he thinks that morality is uh, objective because it's like a fact. Uh, at least that's what I think he thinks. Yes. Um, how could how he, how can he account for differing expert intuitions on a certain subject and and come to a con conclusion regarding that because i think that's one of the things you know that religions often have a better time doing is giving us a more definitive answer in those moral situations but like for example just take you know a controversial situation like abortion right um it's very controversial there's many arguments on both sides how would you, in a moral, like in a, from a moral naturalist perspective, be able to um, come to a conclusion based off of um, radically different expert opinions on the subject? So it would be like there's a law of physics that is the moral law, and other things uh, contravene on that law. And when the other things are mitigated and are less effective, then the moral law begins to take over. And so as uh, society progresses, if the thing that's preventing us from um, acknowledging the moral law to its fullest extent is our pragmatic needs, for example, as our pragmatic needs will decrease, then our openness to the moral law will increase and more societies will go become more morally inclined. So it's pretty easy to explain a differentiation the same way any laws in physics work as one law is 
predominant in one domain. If the domain changes, then the other's law becomes dominant, which causes a gradient. And why I don't know why you think that God answers that question better, or why religions answer that question better. Because as far as I know, they don't have a good answer for that question. Well, oftentimes they, they can come through the form of divine revelation or, you know, like the Bible or Quran or other sorts of guides. But it, I'm, what I'm raising here is some sort of like um, moral skepticism towards that view, because it seems that even if it were to be true, they're it, under like an atheistic type of source or anything, you know, related to that domain, that it would be... It, hard at least almost impossible to get moral knowledge regarding specific specific cases and if it can't do that then it doesn't seem to be a good model because you know even pra practically speaking as you say we would want to have those um the sort uh, sort of conclusions not in sure mind. what you're arguing there so like i'm saying that our moral intuitions are kind of like our eyes we see things they're not always accurate they are inaccurate many times and but they, we can still gain knowledge about the world through our eyes. And so the fact that our moral senses would be exactly the same as any of our other senses would make perfect sense. We can gain knowledge in the same way we do for any other senses, essentially. But I don't, like when we're comparing that explanation to um, the Bible and the Quran and people have a bunch of different religions, it seems like the more plausible explanation of what explains moral disagreement is uh, our moral intuitions are like a sense, like eyes, and they're fallible, and they come up with different con different conclusions. Seems like a much better explanation than there's a whole bunch of different Bibles. Well, if it's grounded on intuitions, the whole point of bringing up is that then when we look at human um, like you know experiences, people have differing intuitions. So yes. how are you, how are we going to decipher about that? Like you know, with perception, it's a little bit different because. You know, we're looking out to an objective world that exists beyond our perception, but with like intuitions, you know, like it can get a lot more fuzzy that in that realm. Well, so I'm just saying it's exactly like that. So our intuitions are kind of like our eyes. They're trying to sense the moral law. They're trying to see what morality is, just like our eyes are trying to see what the world is. And you do that in varying degrees. Like you have um, disabilities, like you're blind. People literally can't see. People who are psychopath have that intuition disabled they don't have a moral intuition so i'm saying that in the naturalist view morality is exactly like all of the other senses and they come in gradients and you have differing opinions and you have diseases that affect them and that makes perfect sense seems to make a lot of sense a lot more sense than there's an all-powerful being god but a whole bunch of different bibles that seems to make a lot less sense in fact i would say that we have one less presupposition than theists all like, like you have the benefit of parsimony well i mean i, I would that's a, a different argument but yes i, I would say all powerful all-knowing all living being has infinitely many more assumptions but it's a different thing so but jordan i still i mean if you can i don't know i kind of want to because the I never got an answer on that it was like but in the face of an explanatory model why would we need to appeal to something that that offers no explanation um well i mean i think that was a little bit of a loaded question because obviously well, I mean, if, you, if you have two options, right? Okay, so I've got option A and option B. And option A maybe fulfills some sort of psychological utility with me or whatever. But, you know, but it doesn't offer a mechanistic explanation for a phenomenon. And then I've got option B that offers a mechanistic explanation for a phenomenon. So I'm looking for a reason why this phenomena occurs. And I've got two options. One says that one has the mechanistic, mechanistic explanation, one does not. Why would I favor the one that offers no mechanistic explanation? Why would you I? You wouldn't. You exactly. wouldn't. And I, yeah. And what? I, but that's not what I'm saying. From my perspective, I'm arguing that that there are attributes about well, like objective moral laws that concern God that can explain some things. Like because I generally take it as a premise that uh, there are moral um, duties that kind of transcend you know the the evolutionary makeup of the mind because um if, if we're going to consider objective in my opinion it shouldn't be dependent upon what anyone else thinks so but in, you, but in your worldview it's dependent upon what god thinks it's not just what he thinks it's about the fact of the matter regarding his essence 
or yes, his but, property. But, but as, as indicated by the Bible, that can change. When, when God makes a determination that one group of people should be killed and then other people should not be killed and the reasons for those are different, then he's justifying murder under certain mitigating circumstances and then, and then saying murder is not justified under these mitigating circumstances. For example, if you're Jewish, you shouldn't murder your fellow Jews. But if you are a, um, are, uh, you know, someone else, go and murder them. See, well, that makes it subjective. That's a subjective determination. So, like I said, give me a, give me a moral law, give me an objective moral law that doesn't require appealing to an agent. In terms of like, well, I mean, if we're talking about moral acts, you could probably argue that this. Uh, it depends on how you define agent. It's not that simple. Like, if we consider animals as agents, in when we were talking about. Um, otherwise, we'd just be talking past each other. Well, if an um, agent it, uh, is something that can choose, because if something is objective, it is outside of it literally is something that it, it, it is true, regardless of what you think, feel or whatever power you have. OK, like you, you appeal to the objective. And if you don't, if there's no objective to appeal to, then it's subjective determination. So that's what I'm saying. If, if these are objective, then God is not appealing to them. God, then I'm saying that, but we see the evidence of it, that it is subjective to God. God makes these determinations on the fly. Like, for example, at one point, if God exists, if, if God actually exists, uh, then slavery was moral at one point and had specific rules set down for it. But now slavery is not moral. So there was a change there. Well, e even if we take in general principles, I don't think that anyone would dispute the fact that even if there's an objective law that that it can differ in some cases but that doesn't mean it's subjective like for example even if we have like laws that say you shouldn't kill there's still like reasonable exceptions to the law that it, it's still objective that is, is it is united states law but you're allowed to kill someone if someone's like um like murdering your family and that, wild that makes it subjective Unjustified I don't, I, killing, unjustified killing is one. There's justified killing, and then there's unjustified killing. And a right. justified killing is within the parameters of the law. An unjustified killing is outside of the parameters of the law. They're both the same action. But that makes the determination of these things of when they're legal or when they're illegal or when they're moral or immoral to be subjective. And can I actually just ask um, Jordan, maybe this will cut to the heart of it. Do you think that something is good because God says so, or is something just good and God says so? Well, that is you. That, uh, that is the word I cannot pronounce ever. Euthyphro. Um, Euthyphro. Euthyphro. So I sorry. I just got my retainers in, so it's hard to speak. <laughs> okay, you're good. Um. Like, regardless, I think that's a false dichotomy. Uh, I think there's more options that can be presented. So, um, right. in that right, instead of, like, it being independent of God or just a choice, the usual option is to say that it's grounded in this nature, which is a third option that is valid. But grounded I, in its I, nature. I, I, yeah, I apologize. I have to go. I have to go take a test. Um, so uh, I thank you. So thank you guys for the call. I I, I, I apologize if I wasn't speaking clearly earlier. Right. No problem. You're, you're good, Jordan. Thank Jordan you for coming up. Jordan, you did great. We really enjoyed the conversation. You brought up a deep and uh, fascinating topic. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. That was a good conversation. Now, feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to join us. Uh, Concrete, we see you in queue. Hang on. Uh, Aaron? Oh, yes, sir? Just, I'm just wondering if uh, uh, maybe, J.L. Warren, you sound like you're familiar with the Euthyphro uh, Dilemma. Would you would you be willing to talk just briefly about it? Um, well, I mean, I know a lot of people in the audience are they're, they're familiar with the familiar with it. Uh, just saying, I, I, all I'd have to say on it is that just saying it's grounded in God's nature doesn't doesn't answer the question. That's why it is the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, but ultimately, I think you can derive from it is that morality is either it's it's are it's arbitrary to either God. If God exists, then morality is arbitrary to it, or if there's no it's oh, if there's no God, it's arbitrary to us. Either way, 
because if there is an objective standard, then it's then it stands outside of God, and God is merely appealing to that, and then by definition, God is not God. You know, given have given the kind of Abrahamic standards of what you know God is determined to be, so that there's nothing objective outside of it. So um, I think a lot of people understand that, and but I will just throw out there that just saying morality is grounded in God or grounded in God's nature, that just means it it's it's a subjective determination because it's he God makes the moral determination as to when things should be applied, you know, what things are moral, what things are not moral. And this changes, it, it moves, it, you know, it very much seems to adapt to what humans think over time, you know? And that would inherently, I mean, that, that just goes to show that it is inherently subjective, but uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, just just throwing out there the objective. I had another theist run it, you know, try to do that, say, oh, well, it's, just, it's, it's grounded in God's nature, that's it. And that's not an answer to it, that doesn't. That doesn't solve the Euthyphro dilemma. That's a nonsense response that appeals to nothing. Yeah. Just imagination. Uh, if I could just not really. And, so so Oh no, absolutely. It's it's a legitimate response to the way the youth for dilemma is phrased and interpreted in one sense. Like the way it's phrased in Socrates' actual work is slightly different than the way we say it, like is something good because God says so, or does God say it because it's good? That phrasing is not a perfect phrasing it's a generalization and in that generalization you can apply this oh well maybe it's god's nature garbage but the point of the dilemma in socrates's thing you're right it doesn't answer that one but it does answer the imprecise phrasing of the way that most atheists say it and so it's very it's usually best to like phrase it slightly differently what's the best way to phrase it is something good because of God deems it so, or is it good by something other than God deems it so? I just want to say, it just seems like they want their cake and to eat it too, because um, it, it takes things from subjective and objective morality, because arbitrary, uh, it would be based on a mind. It would be based on this being and yet it has somehow an objective quality to it that gets away from every other mind that we know of oh welcome Aaron. yeah aaron was uh uh messaging me he wanted to talk about uh theistic god kind of it sounded like might be as, somewhat as opposed, related to Islam as opposed to a non theistic God. I said deistic. Oh, gotcha. Oh, deistic. Where's Jack? Um, hey, Aaron, so, how's it going? I'm good. I good. Um, so for, first, I would say I don't really want to, I don't mean to be throwing Jordan under the bus here, but um, I don't think the moral argument really works here because, um, mainly because, um, one, it comes with the presupposition of, um, Ob uh, morality is objective without the evidence of morality being objective. That's a first. And second, um, it doesn't naturally follow, doesn't necessarily naturally follow, follow from objective morality to therefore God exists. I don't think it necessarily follows from that. There's more explanation outside of that. So but, dare, um, I, um, dare, I, dare I say you're preaching to the choir? <laughs> that's, that's what my argument and Taco's argument were. Those those were the two things we both said. Yeah, I, I would say I, I agree with them. Um, those arguments, or jail but Warren's um, jail Warren, me, me and jail Warren, that was yeah, yeah. Um, I would uh, so I mean, okay, this is not exactly a conventional way to 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 get this conversation going, but I would um, I've heard um, jail Warren talk a lot, and um, I wanna, I I know that I, rather than making the whole contingency argument over again, I I think we've all heard it over here, so um, I want jail Warren specifically to. Explain to me his understanding of um, the contingency argument, if you don't mind. Well, could you like give him give give like is this an argument for God? Could you present it instead of asking him to present your argument? You should you should probably. No, I, I want I want to basically what the aim of it is just to understand, um, just to see where we both stand in with regards to the argument, just so I can know that just to see that like if we're on the same page, because I other people have made the argument before, we've all heard the argument, but then. I just want to see that we're on the same page with regards to the argument, like with what the argument is actually saying, not whether I, we agree on it. I don't know about him, but 
if someone was agnostic to, I mean, this ultimately boils down to a necessary being claim, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And if somebody was, say, agnostic to the necessary being claim, maybe it's a brute fact instead or, or, or something else, right? Well, can, can a like, simulation. I don't, I'd like I'd like him to present his version, so we actually know what he's yeah, talking about. Yeah. So, okay. Could so you Aaron prove a necessary? To, so, Aaron, uh, just to being? clarify, you're talking about everything is either necessary or contingent. Uh, that things are either necessary or contingent, and because not every since not every being can be contingent, it follows that there must be a necessary being upon which upon, upon which all things are conti- uh, contingent, right? Uh, it, it's where, it's more like um. Okay. It, it's more like by virtue of the existence of contingent um, beings, um, there cannot be only contingent beings. There must also be a necessary existence upon which those okay. contingent beings. So, exists. so I hold. Okay. So I hold that 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 the, the, the argument for contingency doesn't get you to God because there's no logical contradiction in infinite regress. That you there's could no have an infinite, you could in have infinite regress. regress. You could have an infinite regress of contingency. So you're essentially saying that there is, there can be an act, actualized infinite. Yes, Absolutely. that is logically possible. Yeah, that is that. There's no logical contradiction there. So how um, how's them? I don't have a physical substrate. I don't see how we, there can be a, an actualized infinite. Because I, there's I because see, there's no logical because there's, because Aaron, there's no logical contradiction there. Now I would I would argue there is a logical contradiction in saying that there can be an infinite regress. What is it? Okay, let, let me put it this way. Um, could I ever get to this point in time if I had to wait an infinite amount of time before getting to this point in time? It's not a logical contradiction. Have a no logical contradiction. It's not a logical con- A logical contradiction is P and not P. So you, in order to say that there's a logical contradiction with a past infinite, you're going to need to show which property in the past infinite is logically contradictory as in it literally the thing exists and does not exist at the same time. So no, I'm, sa- example, I'm saying, okay, example, I'm saying this so, point in time exists, right? Yeah. For, I'm for saying example, it is Aaron, impossible Aaron, for it to Aaron, have been. For, yeah, Aaron, Aaron, for example, no, whole numbers go forever in either direction, right? But five, but, but six still, still follows five and four still precedes five. Mm-hmm. So those are there. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can still have a number chain and still get to five. And still get to six mm-hmm. and seven and eight and nine and ten. So there's no logical yeah. contradiction for there to be an infinite number chain and us simply be at five, six, or seven, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So there's no logical contradiction there. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying okay. Here's here's what um I, I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I'm not arguing against that. In abstraction, it is possible for there to be okay. It, there is an p- infinite number of potential outcomes. Let's say, or an, it, there could there's a potential infinite, right? Inf- infinity can manifest potentially, but it cannot manifest actually. It cannot be in the physical world. Yes, it can. That's that's the argument I'm making. The universe could go on eternally, and yet we could There's still no have a finite beginning <sighs> with the Big Bang. Wait, so, so you need to show... Then, 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 I mean, it's not infinite. If there was a beginning for it, there is isn't You need to infinite. show the logical contradiction. There is no logical contradiction with a past eternal infinite. Even if, like you say, the present moment exists. If the B theory is mm-hmm. time is true, there's a past infinite and the present moment exists. If there's a, a way to variate a variation method in order to skip different interval times, the present moment can exist and there can still be a past infinite regression. There's no logical contradiction with there being a past infinite regression and the present moment existing. The only way that would be impossible is if you must necessarily go through every single point in time sequentially from the beginning. And even so, there's still going to be a present moment at some point. And that's why... Which means it cannot be infinite. No, it can be infinite. And so that's why the the argument for the argument for contingency that all things are contingent except for this one thing, that doesn't work. You need to be able to, so if all things are contingent, and the, except for one thing, you're just special pleading this one thing out in order to justify the argument. So, which is, and because there's no logical contradiction, there's no logical contradiction in an infinite regress, then that's the best explanation we have given the evidence we have at hand. Well, just you're, special you're, pleading, I want to just pleading, the point you just made before Special that. pleading something because you're special pleading something out in order to basically end the chain. Well, I want to understand something before that. So, 
you're saying that um, I'm essentially making an exception for the necessary existence, right? In that um, it is not contingent. Is that is that the point of the argument you just made, or have I misunderstood? Yes. No, it's because the argument for contingency relies upon special pleading. How so? Because you're special pleading God. Everything is contingent except for God. Yeah, I'm saying that that ha that occurs by necessity. Okay. You, because everything is contingent. But you're simply defining God as that. How do you get from a physical no, necessity? I'm concluding, uh, okay. okay. No, I'm, I haven't, haven't said, I haven't mentioned God at all. I'm just I'm just making the case for a necessity. But that's what they, no, but, the, but that's what the argument goes to. But the whole point is is that you cannot eliminate the possibility of an infinite regress because an infinite regress is not logically contradictory. And I'm making the case that it is logically contradictory. And you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, Jay, I'm, okay, Jay, okay. you're you're defending some type of atheist or or non-atheist view right now, but I'm more interested in how Aaron would go to God and and how he would get from like a physical necessity to some type of God, right? Like gra like Grand Oppie poses some type of like physical necessity, right? But like, how do you get from that to God? Because because that's and, a Big step. Yeah, and even if yeah, it was a god, god even that, if it that's wasn't, why I but Aaron, said Aaron, Aaron even if it that was a god, is, yeah. that god could still be contingent on a previous god, and that god could still be contingent on a previous god. Then that and so on and so on and so forth. Definition is not god. Then you'd have my definition that is not god because you just have an no, you just have an infinite regress of god. Which technically, if god is eternal, that's what that is. Because God would have to eternally exist. God would have to eternally exist into the past before God arrived at the moment of creation. So there is no logical contradiction in it from either direction. We're just saying that there's insufficient evidence to warrant belief in a god, and you're special pleading by basically saying God is this, God is the stopping point. Everything is contingent except for God. No, everything is necessarily contingent upon God. Well, Aaron, can I ask? I yeah, have a claim. I mm -hmm. believe that God is contingent on humans, and that's where all the evidence lays. How would we know? The difference between God being contingent on humans or humans being contingent on God. I don't understand how God would be. Can you clarify that? Please? Sure. So if we were to eliminate all human minds, Yahweh would no longer exist because he only exists in our minds. And so if you were to eliminate all humans, God would cease to be. He's contingent on us. Okay, is that in line with the idea that perception is reality? Perception is reality? I don't know. I don't know why you'd make a one-word definition, like perception equal reality. No, perception is perception, reality is reality. Okay, okay. I, I, I just wanted to clear that up. Wait, so you're saying that... Okay, so you're saying assuming that the contingency uh, argument is true and that necessary existence well, then, exists and that there is God, right? between both contingencies? You're saying we're contingent on God. I'm saying God is contingent on us. How okay, okay. So, who's right? Okay, let, let me just clarify this just so I can understand it better. Okay. So you're saying that you're putting, you're putting the contingency relationship aside for further questioning, but you're saying, let's say, hypothetically, there is God, right? No, I'm saying hypoth. Well, I'm not saying hypothetically. I'm saying God doesn't exist. We create him in our mind. And so if humans don't exist, God wouldn't exist, just like any other fictional character that we create. Yeah, that presupposes that we do create God in our minds. It does. How can we tell yeah. the difference between you presupposing that God just creates us? I don't understand. I mean, I don't know how else to tell you. Like... Do you think, how about this, do mm -hmm. you think that Thor and Odin would still exist if humans did not exist? I'm saying, I'm saying Thor and Odin don't actually exist. I'm making uh, the case that God actually You're starting to understand the atheist position. And we are, and we are saying that God, the no, I understand what the atheist position is. Add one more God. Add one more God. Aaron, we yep. are adding, we, and, and in the category of gods that human beings have created, the yep. Abrahamic God is a part of that category. And, you, and I'm making the no, case there is no there is no way to determine that that is not true. No, I'm arguing that it isn't though. I'm arguing that that God objectively exists, necessarily How exists. Tell? That that's what I'm trying to argue right now. I'm saying that God objectively and necessarily exists. 
Okay. Whereas in, in, in order to do that, in order to do that, I don't, I don't think that. No, but Aaron, that Aaron, Aaron, was Aaron, in order yeah. to do that, you have to show how the impossibility of that. You have to show how uh, that can't, how it can't not the be possible. So, so so but yeah, so the and because the, because the infinite regress is not logically contradictory, it still holds as a valid uh, conclusion. Okay, well, let, let's just present let's, a contradictory position, right? So you could be like. Aaron, so that's impossible because the physical necessity exists. Sorry, could you could you just reiterate that? Yeah, I'm saying, how do you get from the physical necessity? I presented a contradiction. The physical mm -hmm. necessity exists. You're saying it's God. You're saying the necessary being is God. I'm saying it's some type of physical substrate. I'm saying, okay, it's impossible for it to be physical. Well, that's impossible because it is physical. It's impossible for uh, it to like not be physical. Necessary existence. Yes, it's impossible for it to not be physical. It must be physical. Well, you say, you're saying the necessary existence must be physical. Yes, absolutely. It is yes. impossible for it to. I'm not saying be it's physical. an. I'm saying it's an impossibility because something that is well, that's impossible because it has to be because it is. Oppose it. Now I'm we, saying okay, a contingent, a physical something that is physical is contingent upon the no. car, uh, upon the parts that um that it's uh, that it's formed by. No. And that that contradicts the the whole idea of the necessary existence no. necessary existence cannot be contingent quantum fields are not composed by anything well it would be necessary not contingent so there's no contradiction it just contradicts your view that's why you aren't understanding it it would be necessary what would be would, can, can, you just, can you just like rephrase that yeah it's the necessary uh existence i guess necessary being but it's more like a necessary substrate if you will, whatever the physical substrate is, whether it be quantum fields, energy, whatever that ultimate physical substrate is, where it can no, the, no longer be further broken down, um, that that would be the physical substrate. That would be, or, or quantum fields, whatever it ends up being, that is the physical necessity that exists. And you're saying it's something else. And we're saying that's impossible because that already exists. No, I'm saying it's impossible for it to be physical. I'm, I'm saying it's impossible for the necessary existence. That's impossible to be because it's physical. Don't, it necessarily let him, let him has to be let physical. Him, let him finish. Let him finish. So I don't understand. What What do you mean it has to be physical? What, why would it have to be physical? Because physical is all that exists. That's a That's a presupposition. You don't know that. Yours is also a presupposition. You don't know that. What, which part, what do you mean, which one's a presupposition? That what physical things can't be necessary or physical things need parts that God can be, own, is not No, that, that's just a fact. If, some, if something, a presupposition. If, if there's an existence that's physical, okay, that that physical thing is contingent. Do we agree no, on that? No, no, that's your presupposition. Nowhere in physics does it say that. Why is it not contingent? Science? It has parts upon which it depends. It can't that's be contingent, contingent if it's necessary. It's the I'm, definition I'm, of necessary. There's, there's nothing, I'm saying it's not necessary. There's nothing, but you're wrong. You're just saying that. There's nothing how, in, how am I wrong? There's nothing in any branch of physics or science that necessarily states that anything that is physical must be contingent. In fact, contingent isn't even a property in any science field at all. I mean, I'm not making... That's the thing. I'm not making the case from a naturalist worldview. Right, so I know. Here's, here, look, the, here's the problem. Look, here's the problem with viewing things as everything is physical. That is a... Th that is not even a scientific view at all. So you're applying right. the scientific method to absolutely everything that could possibly exist. I don't think you're... so. The point here is we're we're mirroring your argument. We're saying that if you want to say that something is necessary, you can say whatever you want is necessary. We can say a physical thing is necessary. You can say a supernatural thing is necessary. We can say a physical thing has no parts. You can say a supernatural thing has no parts. There's no evidence for either of those. They're both equally ad hoc nonsense claims that we're just asserting out of our butts. And I no, I'm saying that based on I'm, natural, no, but I, I've had, and energy. I'm saying that comes off the back of a hole. So was that, and, and, well, no, I just want to put uh, as far as natural goes, we have matter and energy. So non-physical things could be maybe our thoughts as electrical currency, but it's still yeah. energy in a physical world. So that's yeah, not what you mean. That, by that is true. But I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying you don't know that everything that exists is physical. 
Yes, and you can don't we, know that there is a that. supernatural. Yeah, did, well, you could just provide one non just provide one non physical thing, and then we can all agree. No, no, I don't, right no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. No, I, I'm not in a position where I have to prove that something that is non physical. Then we can just exists. say no. It's only physical. I'm saying There's no non physical. No, can you can you say that? Can you? How can you verify that everything that exists must be physical? Because that's the only thing that exists. It's the only thing that you know exists, but can you say that it's a fact it's that everything it's that irrelevant. exists must be physical? So, so the argument is, is that you are asserting that something is necessary. We can assert that something else, something different is necessary. Just like you can't prove that God is necessary because you're just making it up. We have the same lack of ability to prove things are physically necessary. So just like what you're claiming about ours, we don't, we can't prove that there's a necessary physical thing. You can't prove there isn't. and You can't prove God is. But okay, look, that's the whole point of the argument that I'm making here. But then you're just you're just throwing it out here, like without like no, without no, regarding the argument. We are that came taking before. your argument and using it for a different conclusion. So we're using exactly your same argument for physicalism. Mm -hmm. So your argument either it works for both or it works for neither. When did I argue that? No, I, that's my argument. So so you are arguing oh, for okay. a necessary being, and we're saying we mm -hmm. can also argue for a necessary being. And you have no way to show that one kind is more likely than another kind. I'm not. I'm not purely just saying no. There's a necessary being, and that's it. Full stop. But, there's a whole argument that comes before that. Before that, well, that's the part we're trying to get you to. We're trying to get you to show why is one kind of necessary being more plausible than a different kind of necessary being. It's what I was putting forth before the contingency. The contingency argument. No. So the contingency argument just says there is a necessary being. So there's a physical necessary. That, that's being what. That that's works. what it concludes. Yes. Yes, so so it doesn't tell us which kind of necessary being is the correct kind. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't necessarily say. It doesn't point to a particular necessary being. It just right. says there is a necessary. Okay, right. This is the con, this is the conclusion of the argument. This is as far as the conclusion yes. of the argument goes. It has some implications, but this is as far as the conclusion of the argument goes. It says that by virtue of everything, by virtue of Yes, I know the argument. So we can say beings. that there is a necessary yeah. being, but it's physical. Problem solved. So we grant the argument. No, it's physical. No, I'm saying no. no I'm saying okay, okay. If if you're if you're if you're trying to make that case by naturally following from the premises of the contingency argument, you can't say that because yes, you can. Literally, there's no premise no. You can't. I'll, that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Go for it. Because if you if you take the premises of the contingency argument, okay. You are saying that anything that is contingent is dependent, and everything that is um, every contingent thing has to depend on the necessary existence, right? And the necessary yes. existence cannot depend on anything else. Sure. Because it's necessary. Sure, and it can be physical. Right. Otherwise, you'd have sorry. Sure, and it can be physical. It's a physical quantum field. No, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying it's not possible for it to be physical. I know you're saying that, because but that would make it wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. No, that would make it contingent. Stop, that stop, stop talking. Stop necessary. talking. Stop talking. You said it's impossible to be physical based on the premises of the contingency argument. None of the premises say it can't be physical. It's not in any of the premises. So I can grant all of the premises. I can grant the entire contingency argument and say it's a physical quantum field and it's necessary. There's no part okay. of the argument that says it can't be physical. It doesn't exist. Okay. No one says that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now. And can right. I ask, Aaron, what yeah, go specific ahead. god do you think it's contingent on? Does that does that really matter here? Not really. I'll be honest with you. I think that's the most important because I think so? in my um, experience, it has been that theists of a specific variety like to defend deism because once you defend miracle claims, it starts to sound a little silly. I mean, to be fair, if he could get us to deism, that would be closer than we are now, right? So it would be. I have big problems with deism. I have big problems with a mind existing outside of a body. We could go that route, but well, I... it's not necessarily. I mean, deism no, I, could I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't make that deism could be a sufficiently powerful enough agent that kicked the football in the universe and then pissed off with no evidence of its existence and it doesn't interact with us. So <sighs> that could very well be deism. But um, if he's asserting something beyond deism, that's when you're going to get you're going to get into problems with the logical entailments. Yeah, it's, it's and I'd much, also say it's why it's, most 
theists it, believe that it's much harder to defend a specific kind of a god like islam or christianity that's very difficult to do so if right. you're trying to make him defend that kind of a thing it's going to be a much more difficult task so i like to give him the benefit of the doubt give him the easiest argument he can possibly present <laughs> contingency and see if he can actually make that work so give him a much smaller burden of proof here than trying to actually pick a specific god but Aaron, T Jump is correct there. There's nothing, there's no provision that there cannot be a a physical thing that is necessary. There's no provision for that. So it could be a physical okay. thing that is necessary, and then all other things that are physical are contingent upon that necessary physical thing. Okay. Uh, can can the can the necessary existence be contingent? No. No, by definition, it's necessary. Can it be <laughs> yes. Okay. So so we agree on that, right? Yes, that's that's one of the premises. Okay. Yes. If it is necessary and it cannot be contingent, anything that's physical is contingent. No, You're just no, that's not no a premise. There's no, no that this. is not in the argument. I can just add in the premise that say anything okay, supernatural does, does, is contingent, but it's not there. I'm just making shit up. Okay, let me let me justify that claim then. Sure. Okay. Does do physical thi are physical things dependent on the parts that they they are composed of? No. How so? What do you mean? No. Space and time are emergent. They require not, those parts in order, no, in order no, to exist, no, right? No, no, Space and time are emergent. They're not the most basic things. So no, and there are many physical things prior to and outside of space-time. That doesn't contradict what I said, though. Yes, it does, because you said it's based on temporal, like what's before it. And so if space-time is a specific field, and there's a different field that's outside of space-time, there, there's no before. It's, it's outside of space-time. So if space and time are emergent, I, I didn't make some... any. I didn't make any argument about sequence or time. You said well, you said it's contingent on what's before it. That's what you said. No, I, I said I, it's contingent on what it is composed of. Sure. And so there's okay. There's physical things that are not composed of anything. Quantum fields are not composed. They are not composed of parts. But they are dependent upon other things, right? No, they are dependent on nothing. They are the most fundamental necessary thing. They're contingent on nothing. Okay, can you give me an example of that? Yes, quantum fields. That's This is the consensus in physics. Quantum fields are the most fundamental thing that ground everything else that exists. Can you, can you explain that a bit more? Because I'm not, I, not exactly familiar with it. I'm not sure. Like uh, All of the things, like space and time, are emergent from other quantum fields. Quantum fields are the things that interact to create literally everything. Every field, every particle, every piece of energy, they are the most fundamental thing that creates everything else. So is that a fact of quantum physics or is it is it yes. like what's I don't what's the history of the development of that? Uh, like that conclusion? You'd have to Google search emergent space time and look at the papers. It's really complicated okay. stuff. I, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 this education that goes into that classes you could take, scholar scholarly articles you can read on that. But uh, I'll just say you can't have movement of being causality without space time it, unless you have an no. expansion no physics says no no you don't need space time space time is not the most basic thing in the universe even in physics it's not no no i'm not saying ba i'm saying to have a being as far as i could tell or this type of reality oh yeah but you said like interactions you can't you can't have interactions without space time oh, no, no. I don't when they say necessary being level, though it doesn't necessarily apply to like a god it could be a physical substrate you could put anything in place it's just necessary being is just like some type of necessary existence basically yeah being in, in philosophy just means an object that exists okay can i um can i go back to the um the infinite regress the the contradiction of the infinite regress here because i i still can't sure. um i can't i can't see how it's well, there well, isn't a I, contradiction. I there isn't a logical contradiction in the infinite re in infinite regress. So, okay, do we know of any physical example of an infinite regress that's, wait, that, wait, wait, wait. that we know that to demonstrate the possibility? Whether or not we know it doesn't make it a logical contradiction. So we don't need to know of one that exists for it to not be a logical contradiction. So what you would need to show is where is the logical contradiction? I mean, I explained how there would be a logical contradiction. Where is the, how? But I was just told no. 
Like, well, I don't well, what you said was well, no, explain it again. Explain it again. How, where do you think? Because Aristotle, who came up with this idea of the potential and actual infinites, he admitted there's no logical contradiction in his works. William Lane Craig, who gives this argument all the time, has admitted there is no logical contradiction in infinite regress. All of the the academics who talk about this admit there is no logical contradiction in infinite regress. So I would like you to explain to me what is the logical contradiction. So the arguments they use that how would we get to the present isn't a logical contradiction. How, how is that a log logical contradiction? If we cannot possibly get to the present, if, if what was required to get to the present okay. is an infinite I amount explain of that time before. to pass so, before that. The only way it would not work is if you assume the A theory of time, where you have to go from one sequential moment to the next sequential moment to the next sequential moment. Now, if you're doing that, then you wouldn't be able to skip ahead to like the 50 second sequential moment or whatever. If the B theory of time is true, that means all of the times exist at all points of time, essentially. They always exist. And you're not going from one sequential moment to the next sequential moment. And so if they all exist, then there's no contradiction with every every moment being a present moment. Um, and okay. that's one example. Can I get another example then? Sure, go for it. All right. If, let's say, let's say I'm, and I, I usually, I, I, play, I play volleyball. So let's say I'm about to take a serve, right? Yeah. If I had to get permission from an infinite number of people before I can take that serve, that's the will I take time. that serve? That's the A theory of time. That's the same thing yeah. I just said. So I, if you don't yeah, assume I'm, the I'm A try, theory I'm trying of time. To, it, okay, you, well, Aaron, th this no, different Aaron, example Aaron, is more for me to you understand. Down, your... Can you knock down B theory? Sorry? Can you knock down B theory? Can Can you explain B theory? B the theory, B theory of, time. of time. It's that every yeah, every every that? moment in time exists at the present moment. So like, there's infinitely many present moments. They all exist. All time points exist at all times. They're always there. It's like a movie. They're like the slides in a movie. I don't see how I would have to refute that if i if it's if we don't have any evidence that it's it's a fact because uh, you have to show that b theory of the, no, 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 no. he said no, you said no. it's logically I, I impossible i don't see how wait, it's wait, a fact wait 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 you oh. said it's logically impossible <laughs> yes. it's a logical contradiction which means we don't need any evidence that it's true all we have to show is there it's possible because if it's possible that means by definition it is not a logical contradiction so if b theory of time is possible that means that no, there is not a logical contradiction with a past infinite regress existing. It doesn't matter if we have evidence for it. It doesn't matter. Because all we need to do is show there's no logical contradiction. That's it. There you go. Still want to see any evidence that there can be a consciousness on the quantum level or a supernatural level or or even for a beyond that. Or or even, how, how you or, or even a demonstration of how a thing can exist outside of space time when that is not a thing that can exist. I, I, I don't, I don't think we, we've, we've gotten there yet, to be honest. But um... B theory of time is possible, which means the infinite regress is not logically contradictory. What do you mean possible? As in, in abstraction, it's just possible? So because logical, we don't know that it's impossible? Logical contradiction means that it's P and not P is somewhere in the argument. And B theory yes. of time doesn't have one of those. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's possible. Because possible just means no logical contradiction. And so if you're saying that an infinite regress entails a logical contradiction, and I can give you an example of an infinite regress that is possible, that means by definition... It doesn't entail a logical contradiction. So, so you would need to like show where the logical contradiction in B theory of time is. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You need you need to knock down B theory of time in order to show that your position is the only one that's that's available. What about the A theory of time? What would I have to do about that? Nothing, because it's irrelevant. The point is, all I, I need one example. I just need one example of a past infinite with no logical contradiction. That's all I need. A theory of time isn't supported by evidence anyway, so a theory of time is not the consensus in physics. So mm -hmm. there's no there's so equal is there's equal of time the consensus. No, they're both not the consensus. So neither one of them oh, okay. is the consensus. But the point here is that so if they're you're both saying, like the strongest what? theories. Then no, neither of them are the strongest theories. There, there's not a consensus on the topic. So no. But okay. the point here is that if you're saying an infinite regress is logically impossible, all I need to do is give one example of an infinite regress. And then if it's not, if there's no contradiction in it, then that proves your claim wrong, proves, proves your entire argument false. 
that an infinite regress is logically contradictory. All I need is one example. So saying that there's a, like, even if a theory of time had a logical contradiction, which it doesn't, but it's, it's harder to explain why. All I need is one. I just need one example. And B theory of time is my example because it's easier to explain. Okay, let me, let, me, let me see if I've understood the B theory of time to begin with first. So the B theory of time is essentially saying that every point in time ever exists. is it exists simultaneously right happening. Well, it exists. Think, they all exist. So it's kind of like a movie. Think, think of it like a movie reel. And mm -hmm. all of the frames of the movie reel, they all exist. And yeah. you're just looking at, you're looking at one right now, which we call the present. Mm -hmm. But all of the frames still exist. Just because the movie has, has played doesn't mean that those previous frames do not exist. It doesn't mean that the frames that have yet to play do not exist. So let's you, well, you, so can be, movie, um... you can start a movie right in the middle, right? You can skip to scene 37, mm -hmm. right? Right. So there, so it doesn't matter if there's infinitely many scenes. I can skip to whatever scene I want and just say, we're going to play from this point, whatever. And so even if I'm playing from the middle of Kung Fu Panda or whatever, even if there's yeah. infinitely many movie before this, it doesn't make a difference. It still exists there because I didn't have to go from the very, very beginning to here. I didn't have to go in sequential order because in B theory, they're all there and I can just pick a slide. I can just pick scene number 8 billion and 37. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's okay. no logical contradiction. All right. Assuming I grant that, right? I still don't see how that um how that negates the the contingency argument here. Because well, the contingency that, argument is making the, the argument from would be false. So dependence. It, the all contingent things must uh, have a necessary cause. It would be false because there wouldn't be. There'd be no necessary thing here. There'd just be there'd infinite be an, infinite in, contingent infinite things. regression of contingency. Yeah, well, they all depend upon something. They must yes. depend, right? Yes, yeah. they're all, but Before, they're all, they're, they're dependent. Regression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they depend on a previous contingent thing, yeah. which depends on a previous contingent thing, which depends on a previous contingent thing forever, and that never stops, never ever stops. So that's just an infinite number of contingency and no explanation then. Correct, which is possible. Each one, each one explains the one after, or I would say each one explains the one after it, and then already. So there's no ultimate explanation back. for it. Correct. It just keeps coming back. Just continue. Infinite regress. Continue. Yes. Infinite. I would say a finite by definition never gets <laughs> just, there. Or an infinite never gets there because, because by definition it's it, 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 it is conceivable. Inherent, inherent. It, it is. It's it's literally plus one or minus one, depending upon what direction you're going. Okay, that, then that's not an actualized infinite. Y yes, it is. We're not talking about numbers. There literally is a thing that no, actually I, yeah, exists. I was using use me as an analogy. It's just like, what's the explanation for this? This. What's the explanation for that? Mm -hmm. This. And, and then so on and so on and so on and ad infinitum. But it can't be actualized because you're having, you, you, you're just adding one, 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 one. That's, so even in mathematics, even in mathematics, he used a bad example. Infinity it's is, not like is simply a concept. It's, it's, it's not, not like numbers. It's, we're not talking about it, numbers. It's not. Here. It's I a was, bad it, example. Yeah. This is there was literally a existing things that mm. already exist. They're okay. not adding anything. They're already there. Yeah. No, I'm I'm not saying adding existences. I'm saying I'm saying explanations. What? Not necessarily adding an existence. I'm saying let's say let's say they already exist, but you're viewing explanation per like you're explaining one like in sequence, one at a time. You explain you explain one after the other. Mm -hmm. So that would go ad infinitum. Yes. I don't see how that's logical, logically conceivable. What do you mean? How it's, it, it is logically conceivable because you just keep explaining the prior one. You just keep going back. There's nothing logically contradictory about that. In fact, but I'm saying, explaining incrementing in programming. Explaining what? Sorry. Uh, it's the fact that it goes on forever and incrementing. Just add one. You add one forever. I would also just like to put that, once again, it could be that there was a finite past and an infinite future, as in the Big Bang is the farthest back that we can currently go, and it could be that we just go on for expanding. Yeah, yeah it's like the, the Big Bang is the point, is the initial point of observability for our universe, but it, it makes no statement about, about sure. what exists, what you know, the state of the universe before the Big Bang. So so let, me bring, so would, initial, let me try to explain it this way. Would, observation. The, the present would, moment would you, the present yeah. moment isn't contingent on anything. It's just random, essentially. So it's not like 
to get to the present moment, you must have gone through all of these infinite steps to get here. That part is that's possible. the B theory of time, time, right? Yeah, essentially. Okay. Okay. Would you still make the case for the idea that everything that exists, i.e., the universe, is um is physical and there's nothing outside of that that's not physical? Yes. Well, that's okay. Is everything that's physical quantifiable? No, not necessarily. I mean, can like, you give me an example of something like, that's physical. You, you and can not quantify quantifiable? anything. I can say God is one. There, God has been quantified. So I don't know what you mean. Like, as in, like, you can understand it th through numbers. Yes, God you is. Can count God, it. is God is one. You, I just count. No, not, I'm, so, I'm not talking about God. Yeah, I'm not talking about God. You, get, you can understand literally anything through numbers unless it's a logical contradiction. So, God, the supernatural, angels, spirits, demons, they can all be quantified. Quantified just means you put a number behind something, it's a label. Okay, can you can you count things in the universe? Can everything physical be counted, essentially? No, you can't like count parts of a quantum field because it doesn't have any parts. Okay, I'm saying okay, I'm not okay. I need, I need, well, yeah, Aaron, friends, the whole no. point is is that when you came up on the stage, you brought up the argument from contingency, and then we ex mm -hmm. we've explained ad nauseum that there is no logical contradiction in an infinite regress of of contingency. And we've explained how it is possible. So unless you can knock down B time, uh, B theory, which you can't, then our position holds. And there's no defeater there. So if it's something that you need to go and do some more research on or you need to look into further, then you're more than welcome to do that. And you can come back and we can, we can address this again. But as far as the argument of contingency, it doesn't hold. I mean, I don't see how the infinite regress fallacy is not it's not like, a fallacy that's the point it's not a fallacy we've yes, already explained that that's multiple, the we've explained yeah, multiple times how it making. is not yeah i understand that okay so, so I, I, would... I, sim I simply disagree no no he this guy literally thinks that infinite regress is a fallacy it's a theistic thing that's been going around for some reason on discord i guess i've been encountered it a few times but he legitimate so Infinite regress is not a fallacy. Infinite regress is a thing that you could demonstrate is like viciously circular or something like that. Uh, you could say their no. explanation is fallacious somehow, right? I, I'd, no, call it a conceptual, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd call it a conceptual phenomenon. But but so you just do some research on physicists. Like I think Skydive Phil does, does a great video addressing William Lane Craig's arguments about contingency in, in relation to the Klom, where they literally go through this and just explain, yeah, no, it's not. There's no logical contradiction. Just Google Skydive Phil part one and two on the Kalam, and there it's explained by physicists, by actual professional physicists. Cool, cool. And I would just want to know how we would get to your God being the contingent thing, because um, it's one thing to say that we need something at the beginning, which I think we should only believe when we have evidence. And so I just want to know what that good evidence is for that contingent thing. That's well, from, from, from their from their worldview, it's because it's defined as such. Well, it would be, it would be a necessary thing, but point holds. Because yeah, Amy said that God was contingent, and that was that was funny. Good to go, Aaron. Thanks for coming up, bud. Good having uh, you. Yeah. Oh, you're All still right. here. Yeah. Th thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, bud. Take care. Hey, thanks a lot. Man. We've got Concrete, who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, Cloudy Coyote, I'm familiar with. I recognize that name. He was a good conversation last time, for sure. We've also got Fitnesses in queue, so we've got a few uh, people that'll be fun uh, in line. Concrete, come on up. Oh, too slow. Next. <laughs> let's let's go Concrete. on to Cloudy Concrete. Coyote then. All right, Cloudy Coyote, come on up. Hello. Hey, Cloudy. How's it going, man? What's up? I'm doing okay. <laughs> So, yeah, so I just wanted to address the first thing that you said, uh, specifically jail, right? So I think you guys were saying that the contingent argument, uh, correct me if I'm strawmanning, right? But you said the contingency argument isn't valid because everything in the set is explained, right? If it's an infinite No, set, it's right? valid. It's definitely valid. Um, the conclusion follows um, from the premises. 
Okay, but I'm saying that, do you guys, like, for example, do you believe that everything in the set is explained by one thing or another? Like, for example, each contingent thing is explained in the set for infinitum, so therefore everything is explained? I have no idea what you're asking. Okay, so are you asking Jay, if we hold? If you're, are you asking if we hold that that everything can be explained, or there is an explanation for everything? Yes, like, I like I the idea possibly. of a necessary quantum field. So I think I like the necessary thing hypothesis. I would yeah. posit that there is an explanation for everything, even though we don't have that explanation yet. Uh, but I would posit that for for every phenomena, there is an explanation. Yes. Okay. Would you posit a necessary existence, Jail, or no? Uh, it's it's possible that there's a necessary existence. Um, I'm inclined to go with the with the quantum field or the quantum field route. Okay, so can you explain a quantum field more indeed? What would that be? Uh, go ask the physicist. It's too complicated, but it's more plausible than a god. It's infinitely yeah, better it, explained it, than a god. And and it has and it provides mechanistic explanation and and predictive power. Okay, but like. I think because when in, when I hear a field like in physics, it usually refers to like a property of the universe, right? So property of reality, like not the universe. Sure, property of reality, yeah. But um, a quantum field isn't an actual existence, is it? No, they they like, literally are actual things that exist. Literally, it comes, down, it, comes to, it comes down to it, cloudy. If I have two options and one provides a mechanistic explanation and the other one does not, why would I choose the one that does not? Okay, yeah, but you first you need to prove that. Uh, first, I let me prove that it provides an explanation, right? No, 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 but, no. It's it's no. I asked you a question. It's like, why would I choose the thing that offers no mechanistic explanation? If I have one, if I have one thing, the quantum field, and it provides mechanistic mechan a mechanistic explanation for what we see, I can make predictions using it, so on and so forth. And then I've got God did it, which provides no mechanistic explanation, has no true. predictive power. Why would I choose the God did it? No, I would disagree with that. I would say that um, God does provide a mechanistic explanation. And uh, in terms of the quantum field theory, I mean, I would have to ask for at least a simple explanation for what it is. I don't well, know you, just, you just made a statement that God does provide a mechanistic explanation for things. So please, Absolutely. please, the mechanistic explanation for how God did it. No problem. Yeah. So look, would you? so you would agree that contingent things require a reason for their existence, right? Correct? No. No. And granted, for the sake no. of the argument, a contingent but... thing by definition is um, something that could be another way, correct? Yes. Something that could fail to exist? Yes. Okay. So, therefore, bear, do you not hold to the principle of sufficient reasoning? No, but that's a different question altogether. So, I can say that a no, brute no, fact because... is possible. No, it is. And are you appealing to reason as like a purpose or reason as in like a cause? Reason as in like explanation for why it exists. Okay. That's just cause. I mean, yeah, I mean, not necessarily sure. I mean, not necessarily. Yeah, but, but it, it sounded to me, it sounded to me like you were saying reason is in like purpose, no, like an agential I mean. purpose for for something to mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. I need this to happen because of, you know, for this particular reason. Uh, not necessarily. No, that's not. Okay. I just want to make sure we're not, I just want to make sure we're not abusing the language here. It's all. Okay. Sure. No problem. So look, if, so the reason, so you don't, so do you believe that a contingent thing, which it could be another way or could fail to exist, that doesn't require an explanation? Yeah, for it's called a brute fact. Brute facts, yes. Brute facts are possible. Wouldn't a brute fact be necessary because mm -hmm. it could not be another way? No, brute facts are a contingent fact that happens to be the case. Literally, a brute fact is like not that. You can have a brute necessity. A brute necessity would be necessary. Okay, so give an example of a brute fact. Anything could be a brute fact. Potato. A potato exists in the universe could be a brute fact. Like a brute fact is just the way things happen to be. But then, uh, but then you're you're denying the principle of sufficient reasoning. It has nothing to do. With yes, the vast because... majority of philosophers deny the principle of reason. That's like principle I, of sufficient I reason. The P I don't hold the PSR. You don't it's hold garbage. the PSR. Yeah, it's garbage. You most philosophers reject it. I've never heard that most philosophers reject it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, what's Phil Survey's paper, twenty twenty results. There's a question specifically about the PSR. Okay, can you give an can you give an explanation for why you reject the PSR? It's, uh, brute facts are possible. Brute fact is a contingent thing that exists without any explanation. Therefore, the PSR is but wrong. You're presupposing that it doesn't need that it doesn't have an explanation. Can you prove that it doesn't need an explanation? It's logically possible. So it's it's logically Total possible time. to have a brute fact existing. There's no logical contradiction. I'm saying it's logically impossible. So prove that is logically possible. Well, if you have the burden of proof to claim it's a logical contradiction, like where's the logical contradiction with a thing existing with no explanation? 
it's a, I, I'll tell you why it's logical impossible. It's an impossibility for something be contingent by definition, and then also be um, not have an explanation for why it exists. Because if something could be another way, right? Like if an existence could be different, right? For example, like you give the example of a potato, right? If I had a potato on my table, and it could be an apple, for for example, right? Then it needs an explanation for why that specific potato is on a table rather than that. Apple. Even no, it doesn't. It could be an apple. Not if it's rude. So can you prove? Yeah. Okay, so that and why? Because if it could be another way, it requires an explanation for no, it why it is that specific way. And but if it has it, no explanation, it wouldn't need that. It doesn't need it. It, it. it wouldn't need it. Can you please explain I why? I can't explain it. I can explain it. Has it has no explanation. I'm Dutch. A, pota <laughs> a potato in Dutch is an earth apple. So the potato is actually an apple. There, we're done. Wait, uh, so can you actually, wait, so in all seriousness, that's a funny joke. I'll give you that. But in, in all seriousness, T Jump and JL, you keep saying that, you keep saying no, but can you, pr why is that the case that it's logically possible? I just keep hearing this. I gave you a reasoning. Can you refute that reason? Yeah, so an object can exist, which could have been a different object, but has no explanation why. Okay, give an example of that. Any brute fact, a potato exists. In a, you, you say a universe, a possible world, where there's just a potato. I'd also like to know why a potato but, has the potential to be something else, but God has to be stuck as God. Well, so there's a possible world with just a potato, and there's a possible world with just an apple, and a possible world with just a tomato. Yeah, sure, those are all possible worlds. Yes, yes, I'm not doubting that. And therefore, I was, I was trying to aim you with that one. Well, I just I don't understand why God gets this special reasoning. Once again, it's this agent outside of time and space that everything is contingent on. I'm going to say what I said before. We would need evidence for that because you are adding a presupposition that we don't have. Right, right. You're right, Amy. We could say that God is also, there's different ways God could be, and him just arguing that God must have one necessary way is arbitrary, but that's a different argument. So you're saying I'm still that waiting. So at I'm still it's waiting. Okay. JL asked you a question, no, how no. God did it. And you, and you, asked, he said, can you explain that? You said, yes. And then yeah. started talking about yeah, everything I know. I but I that. No, you don't. No, you don't. You just need to give me the mechanistic explanation. No, no, Cloudy. You just need to give me the mechanistic explanation of how God did it. Yeah, I know. My mechanistic yeah. explanation, right, requires you to at least, like, at least to say that contingent thing requires an explanation for its existence it doesn't but we the consensus that... in philosophy is that that is not the case that is dumb it's but very we, easy to understand. I, I, I would disagree with that a contingent thing does not the, need an explanation. the explanation the explanation for its existence in in this case would be you explaining how god no made that's it irrelevant that's irrelevant to what he's asking so you're asking him to change the topic brute facts are a very well attested thing in philosophy if you want to doubt brute okay, facts that's that fine. A brute fact has not it does not have an explanation you're again you're presupposing in your no, 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 no. A, it's logically possible for a thing to exist with no explanation which we would then call a brute fact there's no logical contradiction. Exactly. I don't want to. I don't want to change the topic. I want him to explain why we should add a god as a brute fact. I'm not there. Why we should add a god as a brute fact? You mean as a necessary existence? Yeah, that'd be why brute necessity. Be, why we would be contingent on brute him? Necessity. Yes. Yeah, no problem. I, I mean, I would. I I will go there, and I want to go there. But first, I have to get past this step, and then I'll progress my argument. It, okay, Cloudy. Is talk. there a logical contradiction in brute facts? No, there's not a logical contradiction in brute fact. There's a logical contradiction in saying that brute facts don't need an explanation. If you're saying a brute fact is contingent, then, you know, it needs an explanation. What, what is the definition of a brute fact to you? Um, something that could not be any other way. Uh, no, that's a necessary fact. So a brute fact, in contemporary philosophy, a brute fact is a fact that cannot be explained in terms of a deeper or more fundamental fact. Okay, so are you using the argument from ignorance? So you can just can because... can God can God be in a, in no, no, another way? Wait, wait, so so it's not an argument from ignorance. It's not saying this this is it cannot be explained in terms of a deeper form. More, not just we just don't know it. It's, it does not. It is not it explained cannot. by okay. a more. So you're making you're making that claim. Okay, so then right. prove that. I'm asking you to prove it. And there's, there's, not, no, just there's, said, no proof. there's no proof. There's no proof. Is it logically no possible for such a thing to exist? Yes, that's the proof. That's the proof. Okay. Yeah, we don't How need to actually show possible? this object is a brute fact. 
We just need to show, is it logically possible? Because if it's logically possible, the PSR is proven false. It's logically possible that the PSR is proven false. Okay, can you can you give me an example of a brute fact? Yes, right? a universe with only a potato, and I've given you this four times. That would be a brute okay, fact. Okay, a universe with only a potato. You gave that example, right? Yes. Okay, can you prove that there's no explanation? For why the universe it's is literally my example. I'm literally telling you, this is my possible. I know, world. I know. You can you can say your example, right? But can you? That's not your argument. What? Your argument is is that it is logically possible yes. for an for a universe, right, with just a potato that yes. doesn't need an explanation. So yes. it's contingent, meaning it could be a potato or could be an apple. Right. right. Yes. No problem. So you're saying that there's no explanation for why it's a potato. Right. There's no explanation. Correct. Okay. So, if, okay. Can you prove that? Yes. It's a brute yeah. fact. There's, there's a possible world with a potato right, and a possible stop, 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 stop. Listen, listen cloudy, to the words. Cloudy, listen cloudy. to the words. It's, it's, so, it's so, the possibility that it can exist. That's the okay. point. Because okay. it can exist, because there's no logical contradiction there. Because it can exist, the PSR is proven, is is uh, what T-Jump said. Okay, let me let me just uh, let me give you. I feel like we're going round and round here, and you keep we keep. It's literally you keep going back to the exact same thing T-Jump has said over and over and over again. Okay, fine. Let me give you an example. Maybe it'll help, right? So if I, and I think you've probably, maybe you've heard this example, right? Okay. So if I'm walking around, okay, and I see a big orb, right, okay, on the ground, yeah, and there's let somebody tells me that there's oh there's no um, explanation for its existence, it just exists. The orb just exists. It's just there. Would you agree with that? There's no. nothing logically contradictory about it. Well, it's nothing logically contradictory about it, but inductively, it's a bad explanation because inductively, the things we all interact with have an explanation. Okay, so if induct, so then okay, inductively, everything has an issue, right? Yes. Okay, so can you? So if inductively everything has an explanation, how are you positing that a brute fact doesn't need an explanation? Because it's not logically entailed. The fact that inductively something like if all swans are white and you say, oh, therefore it's logically impossible to be black, I can be like, no, I can imagine long being black very easily. And that proves you wrong. It's not logically impossible for there to be a non-white swan. So if you keep saying that, oh, well, inductively things have a cause, therefore everything necessarily must have a cause. It's impossible for anything to not have a cause. All I need to do is just imagine a thing that doesn't have a cause. And I've debunked you. I've proven that it's not the case. That it's logically impossible for things to exist without a cause. Okay, fine. But I'm still waiting for you to actually debunk the principle of sufficient reasoning. It is possible for there to be a potato, which is a brute fact. Debunk. Okay, can you prove that? I just did. I'm imagining it. So if, if I'm imagining it, that means it's not logically contradictory. But you can imagine a potato in the universe. There's no problem with that. But can you imagine that I'm the I'm imagining a is, possible no world. For I'm imagining for a possible world with no explanation with the potato with no explanation. So imagine a possible world, potato, no explanation. I can, you can imagine the words no explanation, but the fact that a potato exists and nothing else exists and there's no explanation, but it could be an apple. If it's yes. a, Okay, let me repeat this, right? If a potato in the universe only, and it could be an apple, then by definition, it requires no, an explanation. No, there's no definition there. Why there's no definition there. No, no, there is no definition there that must require an explanation. It okay. does not exist. So you anyway. said that, okay, fine. Tijam, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay, so you said the universe is a potato, right? It's a hypothetical. A potato in the I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're saying the universe is a potato, but let's give it a hypothetical example that have the universe as a potato, right? Sure. Why is it not an apple? It doesn't have an explanation. It's a brute fact. So Literally you can't not a you thing. You can't explain it? No, it's, no there no, doesn't well, why have is it an not an apple? It doesn't have you an explanation. I've already, I've already answered this. I've, it doesn't have an explanation. Could I know. Could it be an apple? Yes, it could be an apple. There's a possible world where there's an apple, and there's a possible world with a potato, and it is not the possible world with the potato with the apple. Okay, then perfect. So either that it's necessary that the potato exists only. No, or... I've already debunked this. So, so again, you're just demonstrating you're your not ignorance this. of brute facts. I, no, I literally did debunk this. You're just demonstrating your ignorance of brute facts. Google brute facts. You don't understand how brute facts work in philosophy. This is a well-developed concept. Brute fact is contingent. Yes, it is contingent and has no explanation. That literally contradicts the definition of oh my god you're so dumb this is a well-developed concept in philosophy you saying it's a contradiction when literally every philosopher no. in the world says you're a dumbass is your problem okay, Google then, brute okay, facts. okay, okay, okay Google let's not call definition. people names but coyote come on okay wait, wait look the, the fact is right okay, can you give me a philosopher right that says that maybe, if something coyote maybe i can help maybe i can help do you think a god exists? Yes. 
Okay. Is he outside of space and time? Um, yes. He was uh, sans creation. He was timeless, yes. Why is he not a potato? <laughs> because potatoes are contingent things. Technically, nothing could be outside of space and time, so that's that doesn't even make any sense. But that I, I mean, I yes, in this, there, there, uh, time is a measurement of change, and it's just oh, proof, sans proof creation. Can, a static, can you prove? A can static you, state can of you prove that? Can you prove that he's not a potato? You prove again. This is cloudy. The same. Cloudy is God a mind? This yes, God is a mind. This, oh, this, this is, this is, is your line Peter. of questioning. Peter, hang on a sec, Peter. Cloudy, cloudy this, if God, if God is a no, mind. No, wait, wait, wait. This is your line of questioning. Uh, no, it, cloudy. If God is a mind, does God have thoughts? Um, yes, but they don't progress in time. In in the sense, sans creation, they didn't progress in time. No. Then that That's is then that, then that is like literally, if if God does not have a have sequential thoughts, then God is not a mind. A mind God has mind sequential, sequential thoughts, thoughts, but it's a static state of affairs. It's not no, because if it's sequential, if it's sequential, it adheres to time because there's one thought before the no, next thought. Time is a measurement that of change. That is temporal. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me explain. That is temporal. That is the let definition of temporal. Can I no, it is not. That is the definition of temporal. Yeah, if I have a thought and then I have another thought, then one thought came before one thought, one thought came after. Yeah, and if I, I thought about I creation agree. before I created, and this is a sequence of events. This I agree. Be, no, I have no problem so, with that. So God is still so so God would still be in space time. It's not sequential in that sense. That's what can I explain to you how God's thoughts are sequential? So look, sans creation, right? There was a static state of affairs, right? Okay, meaning that there was no there's no time to adhere to, right? So there's no time is a measurement of change. So there's no change in his thought, and there's no yes, like, there it's not one and it's not one after the other. It's yes, there is. There was the there was the moment oh he God. thought of creation. I, can you let the me moment, finish my explanation? No, now. cloudy. You just That's know, like cloudy. There's the moment he thought about creation and the moment it created. The moment it thought about creation and the moment it created are two separate. Are two separate moments. It was spontaneous until it, bro. This is a, like again. Look, I'm not finished with my explanation, and yet you're already assuming. No, no, I'm, I'm asserting. I'm asserting you don't understand physics. You do not understand what space time is. You do not understand that a mind that is not subjective to a sequence of thoughts is not a mind. That is that is something. Minds are not quiescent. Okay, look, a mind, right? It's a static state of affairs. It's a static. No, it's not. Right? Minds are not static. That is not no, a mind. No, I, I look. No, I'm not even done finishing. Can I, okay, let me explain, and then after that, you can go on your whole right. Is that okay? No, no. Explain to me how a mind is static. How a mind is quiescent. Sans creation. Sure. No, no, I'm asking you to define a mind. Tell me how a mind is static and how it is still a mind. How a mind is static. I'm saying a that mind, all the thoughts, a mind the thoughts by are definition. They're static in the sense that it's not progress. His thoughts are not progressing in time, meaning he doesn't have one thought and then think something else after. Right? His thoughts are all necessary, right? Okay. That, that makes no thought. sense, Cloudy. How does that not make he sense? Can't have a thought. He can't have a thought if he, if he has no time. Okay, prove that. I literally said a billion times that a thought, in the sense that how we have thoughts, is we have time thoughts sequentially. Well, so we might see, think something the, now. The problem and not is, the problem is, Listen, you're not, the okay, problem right? is, and this is what JL yeah. is trying to explain to you the word mind has a specific definition. If you sure. say that God is a mind, then that mind has a specific definition. Yes, there are entailments has, to that. It, okay. Yes, well, it has sequential thoughts. If it doesn't have sequential thoughts, it's not a mind. As it has we thoughts that aren't sequential sans creation. It can't it do to... that. That is not a mind, Cloudy. What? That's the, and then I reject your definition of a mind. My oh, then, then, then you're just, it's, you're just it's okay. Like then saying, you just reject reality and replace it with your own. I, yeah, no, the I'm not. What? Can you define a like mind for the us? Prosecution, the prosecution rests. Gladly do that. It's like saying I have a car, but it doesn't have wheels. Do you think that a mind it's not a car? Do you think a mind can exist independently of a physical substrate? Do you think do I think a mind can exist in how you're defining a mind as in it needs to have sequential thoughts? Then I would say no. But sans creation, that's not what God was. Finally, can I ask then? Are these thoughts? Are you saying they're all happening at once? He's hearing the, all thoughts of the universe or that are his own at once? Hearing all his thoughts of the universe in, at once. In no, in no time. Because in we no hear time. like a thought. We go like, I am hungry. I will open fridge. I will get cookies. Like it happens one at a time. What oh, yeah, it sure. sounds like you're saying is he's having all thoughts at all time. That's just... 
Amy, uh, that's just silly. You don't you don't put cookies in the fridge. <laughs> that's true. I uh, don't put carbohydrates. <laughs> God, God is all knowing, so he knows all true propositions, right? By my definition. So, yeah. so, so, so if this God has thoughts, how is it having thoughts? Because the only thoughts that we know of require a brain, well, a consciousness, which Time. requires a brain, which requires the body, which requires all these processes on Earth, which requires sure. space time to exist, right? And, mm -hmm. and you're saying that this mind exists separately prior to everything, and that it that doesn't seems, function in the way and, 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 and that it does. No, no, we can even grant that that this mind exists without a body and with no physical substrate, and it exists like sure, yeah, sure. outside of space time, and that time does not apply to it. That it that that temporality does not exist to this thing. But that's the problem, is that then it is, by definition, not a mind. No. Okay? You're no, simply, I, I you're, reject, you're, you're simply, well, you're simply jail, only, but you, but That's you just, non-existent. You, you just ex describe something that doesn't exist. That's exactly. That's non-existent. Exactly. Okay, look, and uh, just because, jail, Cloudy, just mind. because you want to call it a mind doesn't make it a mind. Okay, fine. If it's, if that's your definition of a mind, that's not, but let me that's it, that, that, that's, that's not my definition of a mind, Cloudy. That is the definition of a mind. Sand, bro, no, it's not. I'll tell you why. And <laughs> creation, right? God did not have thoughts sequentially in the sense that he did not think something. And then two minutes later, he thought something else, right? God's thoughts are all necessary, right? Meaning that they all exist at once in a static state of affairs sans creation, right? So in the sense that, look, and how we perceive minds, right? As humans, sure, yes, we think sequentially, but I'm not applying that standard to God. So there's no contradiction. Is God eternal? Uh, what do you mean by eternal? Does this God existed eternally? The thing about the, the, thing, the tricky thing about uh, using the word eternal is that it usually comports with time, right? So as God existed, okay, then is, is has God existed infinitely? Infinitely, I mean, see, it's has hard God, to has God, has God right, ever right? has God ever not existed? Has God ever not existed? No, God has always existed. Okay, so God has always existed, which means that there was a point in time when there was no creation. Oh, again, you're using time again. See, no, I knew cloudy, that. cloudy, okay. stop. That, that means that there that. was a point in God's existence in which creation did not exist, and a point in God's existence when creation did exist. This is a temporal state. Again, yes. this is because if God existed eternally, if God existed infinitely, never not existing. Okay, then all the time that other than then all the period of God's existence in which there was no creation is a state before creation existed. There was before oh. creation and there is after creation, which means that's temporal, which You're means God had the thought of creation be after God had no thought of creation. Okay, number one is you're wrong on so many fronts. Okay, and let me let me address this, right? Okay, well, let me address it, right? I, I think I think what you the point you just okay. made, Cloudy, okay. is that creation has always existed. No, it's you not. don't realize it yet. Yes. If creation has not always existed, there was a point that creation did not exist. That means God existed. Look, you're in using point, and you're using all these bro, you're cloudy, using vocabulary cloudy. that only comports with time. Cloudy. Again, that's why you're being deceptive. If you're, you just said creation did not always exist, that means that there was a point where, point where creation did not exist. There was pre-creation and there was post-creation, okay? For yep. there to be a pre-creation, a moment of creation, and post-creation, these are temporal. Which no, means, I agree with that. For which that means the thoughts, means. the thoughts that precede these things, no, no, given no. your definition of God, are also temporal. No, which would comport that. with it being a mind. Okay, can I, can I, can I? But that means that mind exists in space time. Okay, can I tell you why that's false? Let me explain, at least. You can try. So, okay. You won't, you won't succeed, you. but you can try. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I don't appreciate the condescending tone, but at least let me address the argument, right? So, if you have, right, the universe being instantiated, right, like from pre creation and post creation, right? So, yes, that itself. Is a measurement of change, which is time. There's, I cannot deny that, right? Okay. And the theological position of William Lane Craig, of even famous philosophers, Al Ghazali, right, is that this was, right, spontaneous, right? It was a spontaneous creation that existed, right? Now, no, that right? doesn't that doesn't comport with an omniscient, omnipotent entity. It's still, you, okay, wait, can can you let me finish? Still, no, and it's still cloudy. It still it still doesn't work because okay. now you're putting the creation of time 
before creation, which no, I'm not. I'm saying he entered already into time spontaneously with, with creation. If you listen to me, like no, no, because if God is omniscient, okay. it hey guys, no. guys, guys, back. Hey guys, we're we're dogpiling him. Can we back up a second? And well, well, maybe no, let but, but he keeps making assertions that that he keeps contradicting himself on. Not, if God no, is omniscient by definition, which you have defined God as as knowing all truth propositions, then there cannot be any spontaneity. Can, it, can you God would God would have knowledge would have infallible knowledge of the creation point before the creation point. Look, Joe, Joe, I respect your passion, right? But can you let me explain my assertions before saying that I'm only making assertions? So let me explain them, and then after that, I would respect you addressing my argument. I think that's sure, the best way go ahead. Like, great. Okay. Explain. Okay. So when I say right that God spontaneously create, like He spontaneously entered into time with creation. That itself is a temporal change. But the thoughts preceding that, sans creation, right, are not temporal at all, right? Those are all necessary thoughts, yes, okay? And there's no sequential order of his thoughts. There's no like, okay, I think this, and now I think this. That would be a measurement of change, which is time. So the sec so when we have creation existing, right, that itself, pre-creation and post-creation, right, that specific event, right, is a measurement of uh, change. Right. And spontaneously, right, God entered into time, right, along with that. So he entered into time spontaneously when the universe was instantiated. There's no logical contradiction with that. And I would like you to prove that there rather is. than you making an assertion that it is logical. Go ahead. There is there is no pre and post if there is no time. And there is I no just, spontaneity if the if if the if the entity is defined. If the entity is defined as omniscient, then there is no spontaneous action. Use the word sans. I, I mean, I, I say without the universe. I'm not pretty. And if the entity is omniscient, if the entity okay. knows all true propositions as you define it, then there is no spontaneous action because it knows exactly at what point it is doing this. And it know and it knew it before it did it. Okay, sure. And which also think, required time. No, it did not. Okay, that's no, it does not. Knowing yes, it does. Yes, it does. If you know you're going to do something before some you do it. If you know you're going to do something before you do it, that requires a temp a temporal change. So knowing yes. that I'm going to, okay, if I, if there's, if God has like thoughts, right? Okay, that are not going in sequential order, not following time, right? If there's a thought that he is going to create the universe, right? That thought is not, does not require time. The only thing that requires time is the instantiation of the universe. The thought so doesn't, so Cloudy, listen, the thought that maybe not requires time, but the, the, okay, there's a sequence between thinking about creating something no, and then creating something. No, there's not. Or it is if God existed. No, if, if the God, only it is if God has existed has, has never not existed. Again, if God has if God has ever has, has never not existed, then you are creating the temporal state there because that means that there is a point where God exists and there is no creation and God is independent and there's nothing else. And there's a point where God exists and there is creation, which is which is then contingent upon God. Sure. Which you're already invoking a temporal a temporal change right there. No, I'm not yeah. denying that I'm invoking a temporal change with the instantiation of the universe. I'm not denying that. I'm okay, saying, so wait, wait, listen. Which means right? that God's no, thoughts no, are finish. not which means that God's mind is not quiescent. It means God has a sequence of thoughts. Oh, that the thought before that. how does that entail that in any way? Please explain. Because I the thought that. before creation and then the and then the act of before, creation. It's timelessness. It's sans creation. Again, you're using before so you can be deceptive and say that God. I'm not being time. deceptive. I'm saying that I'm saying that you're operating off of a definition that nobody accepts. That nobody accepts of what? Of a mind? Yes. Okay, what you were to, what you are using as a mind is not a mind by definition. Okay, of what you, you are you are defining God completely out of existence is what you're doing. No, I'm not. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, I'm saying that sans you creation. Look, you're making you, you claim that I'm making assertions without evidence, but literally all you've been doing is making assertions this whole time. No, we're not. We're pointing out the logical fail. We're pointing out the logical contradictions in your argument, Cloudy. But you've you've literally not. Okay, let me I, let me explain this for like the tenth billion times. Okay, right. I'm done. Okay. Does anyone else want to? Cloudy. Anything? Cloudy. Cloudy, was there was there a point where there was only God and no creation? Sans creation, so without creation, uh, yes, God existed. I am creation. asking a simple yes or no question. Was there a the point where there was only God and no creation? 
Yes, but by point, if you mean a point in time, then no. But yes, there was a, there was with sans creation, God existed only. Yes, not a point in time. So at no this specific point, there was both a creation uh, and no creation. At this specific point, was there no creation? And what? Repeat that. Sorry. Yeah, I'm 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 just trying. I'm trying Repeat to. Repeat that. I didn't hear you in front of you. Okay, so you say that there's no time. And there was a point where there was no creation, not a temporal point, just a point. If uh, there is no time, then at that same point, there is creation and no creation. That's, that's not just use I mean. a different definition of time. So use time to measure something different, like, like the existence of God, like somewhere uh, along the duration of the existence of the God. Maybe, there, and then you can use time, right? I think there is no point in uh, sans creation. There's no point in anything because all God, uh, God is sans, what God is sans creation is necessary. Is yeah. just necessary thoughts. It's all necessary. He enters yeah. into and, the and so with the creation. Okay, universe. when 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 God is sans creation and when God is with creation, mm -hmm. how can how can that happen if there is no time in between the two? Because uh, again, I explain this again. So that when the when the instantiation of the universe happens, let me repeat this again. Right. So with the instantiation of the universe, right, which is a measurement of change, right, post creation, pre creation, that is. We're a not talking about the instantiation. We're looking from God's about. point of view. No, no, I'm trying to help you here. Okay. We're looking from God's point of view, not from creation's point of view. From God's point of view. No problem. So. So what what can you repeat? Then what do you mean God's point of view? What's your argument? Explain how there can be pre-creation and post-creation without time. Easy. From I God's explain. point of view, how does okay, this yeah. work? Okay, I I'm, great question. I've answered a lot, but this time, can you listen to me and have an open mind this time? Don't try to refute me. That would be really appreciated. Let me explain. Right. I'm so, having an I'm open mind, mind, which is why I'm no. asking the question. That's great. So you okay? Let me explain it to you, right? So without the universe, right? And the reason I use sans creation and not before, right? Is because time was instantiated as the universe. Time is not eternal. It does not eternally exist, right? So from God's point of view, right? Is before creation. So sans, I don't want to use before. Sans creation, right? God is has a, a lot of necessary thoughts that don't go in sequential order. Now you can say that's not a mind. You can say that is a mind. Okay, but this is my position of God. You have to prove it's a logical contradiction, right? Okay. So, sans creation, God has a lot of necessary thoughts, right? All of his thoughts, right, or and his attributes are all necessary. So you know, about, can listen, you please listen. stop talking about thoughts? No, and I've you're, asked you a specific I mean, question. Explain. I've asked you, but listen. I've asked you a specific question. question. There was there was no creation and there is creation. Yes. Right? Two different things. Yes. God, no creation, God creation. Yes. Correct? Yes. And correct. there's no time. And and there's no time. Before creation, there's no time. But within the but no. the no, listen. no, listen, no. Listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. I'm not. I'm not going to progress into creation. There. I'm just addressing the point where there is no creation mm -hmm. and there is creation. Sure. Those two yes. things you say happened. Yes, and they require time. Yes. Correct. Okay. If there is no time, then creation has existed as 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 long as your God has has existed, because there's no time. You're saying that existence you're that you're presupposing that existence requires time. Can you prove that? I'm not existence requires time. I'm not talking about existence. I'm using your words. Creation. What are Creation, no true. creation and creation. Yes. If there's no time for yes. no creation to exist, I mean, there's no. What then do you no mean? creation and creation have existed for the exact same time, 
and your God has existed for the exact same time. Uh, look, God has existed. No, look, if this is a this is a flawed line of questioning. I'll point out why. Right? Is existence can occur? Existence. So God exists sans creation, regardless of time. He's outside of time. Right? So existence is before time. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you basically, you, you basically what you're saying. Basically, what you're saying. I'm trying to to uh, reflecting back to you. Sure. Basically, what you're saying is God existed for no time. That's the equivalent of no, non-existence. That's, that's not what I'm saying. For God existed for no time. Is that's not that's not what it is. That is what you're saying. God you're saying that, no, no, cloudy, that is what you, cloudy, that is cloudy, what cloudy, you're cloudy, saying. Cloudy because you're cloudy because you're saying God existed atemporally. Atemporally means if out something of time, exists, no, if something yeah, if, it, if it's exists, outside of time, there is no time. No time. Sure, sure, sure. But it exists outside. Of it time. doesn't exist. Okay, so that's atemporal. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah. So God existed for no time? God existed out of time, yeah. For no time. Again, you're using time so deceptively. He did not No, I'm not anyway. using time deceptively. When we say that, oh, you didn't exist for oh he he did not he didn't do this all that he didn't do this anytime. Like when we're talking casually. I, yes, I, I think I think it. we should but move on because this is this is getting us nowhere. I think we should move on yes, and I proprietary really, definition really of... want to hear an answer to JL's question. How did God create? Yes, I still I want to hear the mechanistic knew? explanation. No problem. Can I explain yeah, you said and then you can knew. reject it after I'm done with my explanation? Okay, yes, great. yes. Then... Give us the give us the, the mechanistic explanation of how God did it. Okay, so you won't interrupt me during my explanation. Okay. The floor is yours, Cloudy. Do okay. do do there we have do we have to say it four times? Okay, no, no, no. I will explain it. Just please, we want, we want, we want the we want okay, the answer. Let me explain to you the answer, right? Okay, is sans creation, right? Without creation, okay? God existed atemporally, right? He did not exist in time. Let's right? drop the atemporal. Get to the mechanism yeah, okay, God I, I, used. I, I, this is pre this is preceding. I need to explain this to explain the mechanism, and yet you said you won't interrupt me. Yet you're constantly interrupting me, and you're presupposing my argument. We're so okay, already, okay. We're already... Brother, you stop, Cloudy. Go. Your the floor is yours. Peter, quiet for a moment. Let him let him explain this, because okay, I, I'm I'm not okay. convinced at all. Just so you know, but I'm listening. Yeah, yeah Cloudy, go okay. go yeah, for it too. now. Just 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 to clarify, Cloudy, the mm -hmm. the atemporal like that does not matter. We're looking for the mechanistic explanation of how God did it. Sure, no, but I for the mechanistic explanation, I'd like to. I need to explain a temple briefly. I'll try to wrap it up. I'll try to. You'll get it okay, once. Go, I okay, the floor is yours. Go for it. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so God exists a temporally, right? Meaning that all His thoughts are necessary, and it doesn't progress in time, right? So God doesn't think something now, and then two minutes later He thinks of something else, right? All God is at this point is a, there's no state of affairs. It's a static being, right, with all necessary thoughts and necessary attributes, right? It sans creation. So now he enters into time, right, with the instantiation of the universe, right? Okay. And so when you instantiate the universe, right, he creates time and spontaneously enters into time with the creation of the universe. And that's how he enters into time, right? Just so he did it. Wait, hang on, hang on. Keep going, Cloudy, because okay. you still haven't gotten to a mechanistic explanation, but keep, keep going. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Okay, can you explain what, what mechanistic explanation you're looking for? Because my mechanistic explanation... The mechanism, the mechanism God used to create time. The mechanism God used to create time? Yes. Because, okay, that because, is the question. Because cloudy, cloudy. Oh, I, God, bro, you know, I, I say, okay. Cloudy, God did it, or God magic did, is not a mechanistic explanation. Okay, In fact, no it's not even an explanation at all. No, okay. I, I, okay, I know. So I, I'm asking you for the mechanistic explanation of of creation. Go for it. Okay, when you said the mechanistic explanation, I was concerned because we were talking about the topic of that God existed for the same time of the, as his creation. No, it, that's the whole point. That's yeah. the, no. that's why that's why you got interrupted okay. before is because um, the state of God's existence before creation has nothing to do with this. Okay, the so whole point that. is okay, that what is that. by what mechanism did God create everything? Um. He created it. Uh, I mean, he created it through his essence. I mean, he created it through his actions. So he magic it. So you're saying he magic it? He magic it. When you pick, so, when you do something, is that magic? No, but when I do something, there's a mechanistic explanation for the for 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 what I do. Yeah. 
So we're if, asking if for I, the mechanism. So, no, so, so cloudy. So hang on a sec. So cloudy. Mm -hmm. What this goes back to is this: if I have two explanations for a phenomena, mm -hmm. one provides a mechanistic explanation for that phenomena, the other one does not. Why would I choose the one that doesn't to understand the phenomena? Jail, jail. Really, I'll address that point. But if you believe that, then you should wholeheartedly accept the contingency argument. No, 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 I don't need to, and that's already been cloudy. I do not need to because it's already been explained why it's not logically contradictory, okay? So please oh, answer the oh, question. But then it just magicked it, so the explanation was magic? Is that what you're saying? Is that, is is that your explanation? Is, is that, no, is that your explanation? Saying, but by your logic, if a brute fact has no explanation, then it's magic. Okay, okay, <sighs> let, let, let me roll, let I'm me sorry, roll I, with I, this. Okay, let me address your question. What is, cloudy, cloudy. Cloudy, what's magic the is an explanation. So, use magic is what? What's the magic is an explanation. He, magic. he said instantiated, or I hope I'm saying that word right, but that's the term that he used. That was the mechanism. That's why when you're asking him for the mechanism, he's like, What? I provided it. But all that means is that God created it when you say that. I think but, it's, I think it's, but more then like, you're, are you created? It's not, it's I think, created. I think it's more like God thought poofed it. God thought poofed it into existence. That's what I'm no. talking about. And yeah, God thought poofed it. It is not sufficient. It's divinitis, basically. That's how. That's is not a mechanism. It's not, not a mechanism. You know it doesn't explain is. anything. It doesn't explain Peter, anything. You know what ectodivinitis is? Cloudy. Again? It does the the the, you know, the, wait, no, wait, jail, the mechanism you're using that's doesn't fine. explain anything. No, I'm. I know. I know. You. I'm not saying instantiation was the mechanism. Okay. So I'm asking. You, your so I'm asking you, if there is. No explanation on one side and an explanation on the other side, and the God offers no explanation, and the other side does offer an explanation. Why would I accept the God one? Because the God does offer an explanation. I can tell you why. So you just said he, he just you just said he magicked it. I didn't say that. I said we've, been, no. we've been waiting for that answer from the okay, moment no, the JL the asked you, which was which was about a half an hour ago. The reason I kept on saying instantiation is because I assumed that you guys were talking about the same thing when it was post creation, pre creation. But if you're okay. not talking about the same thing, right? We've got then, we've got we've got to move on. We have a few more people in queue. I'm going to give you question. like four minutes to provide the mechanism that God used to instantiate reality or however you want to phrase that yeah, sure. it's all so it's you ex, you got a few minutes so it's, it's ex divinitis right meaning that the instantiation of the basic you know construction or creation of a single thing right is based on his will so if god says be then it is yes <laughs> not not, not a, how's that not, how's no. that a, how's that a mechanism <laughs> No, that, not that's, an explanation at all. Because you have things that are ex nihilo, you have things that are ex materia, and this is ex divinitis. Yeah. We know we we know that's that that is what you think. Yeah, but appeal, how it's, is it's, this it's a appeal a to divinity. It's appeal to divinity, and it's thought it doesn't. It, sorry, God. Thought okay, then then then, yeah. then I'd have to go back, and then we have to. Okay, Jail, can I ask you a quick question too? Shoot. Okay, so you're method you're a methodological naturalist, correct? Yes. So you'd agree with an infinite regress in time, right? Yes, it is possible. Okay. Um, so you'd say under the A theory of time, would you say it's possible or under the B theory? or both? B theory. Okay, can you explain the B theory of time briefly? This has been explained uh, in the previous, with the, with the previous dude that I we know, I know, with. But I just want like a brief explanation, like a short explanation. That, as, as best that present, that, that past, present, and future all exist. Okay. Do you believe in free will? Um, that's a more complicated question. I think that there is evidence for free will and there's evidence against free will. So okay. no, but because, because our actions are defined by the information we have prior to that. So we don't really have free will, but we can still choose. So it's kind of like, I kind of like, I kind of go with the Hitchens explanation of that we have free will because we have no choice not to. Okay, sure. No problem. No, but basically what your position would entail, right? Is if past, present and future all exist, right? regardless of our point in time or whether what or what whether we, what we perceive as our point in time right it would mean that it would logically entail that there's no free will that we have for example if it's if i could pick up a phone or if i could not pick up a phone that i have right next to me right the fact is if the future exists already right then that would mean that in the future i already picked up the phone regardless of my point in time and my perception Congrat so congratulations you you, no congratulations you get calvinism I, I'm saying your position entails that we have no free will. 
I, from from one perspective, perspective, yes. I don't think we have all the information, but it could. I mean, it could. Like I said, it, we could have free will because we have no choice to. But did you see the logical entailment of... It doesn't the matter. There's no logical contradiction in us not having free will. No logical contradiction. I'm not saying there is. I'm not saying there is. Okay, I'm just so that logically point? Entailed that there's no... Do you, so I'm saying that it would be logically contradictory if you hold to free will. So if we believe that you have free will of some sort, then that would contradict your position. Well, if you're asking me if I hold to libertarian free will, no, I don't. I know. Even if you hold to compatibilism, you'd have to hold hard determinism. There's evidence either way. I'm kind of undecided on that. But then again, it doesn't okay. matter because I don't have omni I don't have infallible knowledge of the future. So from my perspective, I have free will. And until okay, that perspective sure. is able to be changed, I have no reason to change my perspective. That's great. I, I understand that. But your position of saying that the past, present, and future exist, regardless of our perception in time, if they just exist, that would entail, right, they, that there's no free will. Because, for example, if I pick up something, right, that future moment already exists, right, of the implications of me picking it up, regardless before I picked it up or not. So that would mean right? That there was no free will. There was no action of me deciding if the future already necessarily exists. So cloudy, yeah. cloudy. Oh, can so I ask you a question? If no, you, no, no, cloudy, no, no, Peter, cloudy. I'm trying to understand where he's going with this. It, it, he's trying like, to say because matter? free will is true, no, but free will isn't true. I'm saying that, that, that that's what your position entails. So if you hold to hard determinism, your com position is completely, it's not logically contradictory. Just that you would have to hold to hard determinism. If you hold to free will or compatibilism, then it would be logically common. I, okay. I don't have a question. I don't think I don't think you can pigeonhole me like that, but I don't I'm not pigeonholing you. I just gave you No no like, like as a hard determinist, because I'm not a hard determinist. Okay, then your position is contradictory. No, it's not. I'm going off the I'm going off what I have evidence of, and I'm going off of that I can't make determinations based upon what I don't know. Okay. So, because I, because I, because I, because, because, because there's information I don't have, and there's information that is not accessible to me, and will never be accessible to me, a la the halting problem or uh, Girdle's incompleteness theorem. So, right. there is information that's not available to me. I can only work with what I have. Mm -hmm. And while there is okay. evidence towards determinism, and there's evidence towards free will, mm -hmm. there's evidence for both. I can I simply agree. say I can only make decisions based upon what I priorly know, but I don't know all the potential outcomes of that and what my decisions will be after that fact, but I will decide in the moment, which means I, I have free will because I perceive that I have free will. Okay, but do the implications of your decisions exist um, uh, in the future? Do they exist? Cla like, Cloudy, I think we're right? off topic now we're and we're off topic. past uh, 25, which is where I had given you two. Okay. We've got Can you give me a little more, more uh, If you want to raise your hand, we can, and and we have time at the end, we can bring you back up, but we need to bring up some other people who have been waiting for a while. Uh, we do appreciate you coming up. It was a good conversation, um, but feel free so, to raise your hand. Thanks, Cloudy. Kai. I just want to let you know there's lots of people in the text chats on YouTube and Discord cheering for you. <laughs> Mister, we appreciate you coming up. Uh, fifth assist. Uh, is up next. Uh, he's quite the interesting fellow. Fithesis, you want to come up? Hello. Hi. How are you? So what would you like to talk to us about today? Uh, well, if we're talking about group facts, that's not a satisfactory answer. I mean, if you're asking why things are the way that they are, God is a very satisfactory answer because he's personal. Why a lot of that's times an emotion, it's a that's an emotional appeal. Uh, not just an emotional appeal, it's an appeal for a satisfactory answer. When if we ask what, why, we're been... asking for an explanation that either justifies more exploration or says to the person that no more additional exploration is needed. How can you have that with a universe that has no mouth, no feelings, no explanatory power whatsoever? It's better with a God who can explain stuff to us and take us by the hand and help us out. I no, am, because the I universe have, does have explanatory power. So. One sec, I have no idea what you're saying. Like exploration, like what, what does exploration have to do with a better explanation? Well, if we're looking at a dead universe with no mouth and no feelings, there could be other explanations as to why an event is occurring that we don't know about, that the universe isn't telling us about. How will we ever know that we've done adequate enough exploration without a God with a mouth, feelings, and explanatory power to say, hey, keep exploring this way, or hey, stop exploring? 
I just don't see any way to solve that problem without a personal God to answer these why questions. Well, that's because, it, that's because in our it's because in our worldview, it's not a problem, and you're just making an emotional appeal. Well, can I try taking a crack? The fact that our universe is cold and unfeeling doesn't mean that we as humans should be cold and unfeeling. In fact, as the only agents that we are aware of on this blue and green planet, we should spend the one life that we know trying to be kind. Well, the thing is, I mean, by natural principles, we say light comes from light. So if we're not cold and unfeeling and we have emotions, the question beg by natural principle is, where did those feelings come from? Evolution. Are we going to say that they just emerged as brute facts out of the unfeeling universe that's unnatural in fact that's supernatural where something feeling us came from something unfeeling the unfeeling universe with no mouth no feelings no personality that's unsatisfactory there's no contradiction there and your, your use of satisfactory is an emotional appeal yes yes we have feelings those feelings come from our brains and our brains are the product of natural evolution. process Evolution, but, thank you. But yeah. that's so not so it's not a brute fact. She said that that's a brute fact. A brute fact is something that has no explanation. So emotions are not a brute fact. Well, the thing is, I mean, that contradicts natural principles. By natural what? principles, we normally say light comes from like a no. cat comes from a cat, no. a dog comes from no, a no, dog. No. Wait, Feelings wait, wait, would wait, come wait, wait, wait. from another personal wait. agent. So so if if you think there's some natural principle that says light comes from like, well, nothing in the early universe contains stars, planets, rivers, tornadoes, uh, earthquakes, um, complex particles, oxygen, gold, uranium. None of those existed at the early universe. And so all of those things are different things that didn't come from the original stuff. So and all of just... pretty much everything we see is emergent combinations of the original stuff. Like, emotions are an emergent combination none of it was originally in the big bang it's so so none, none nowhere in nature do we say light comes from light that's not a thing this is why when you, you when you sit when this is why when theists use the term like the big bang created stuff that's improper language usage the big bang didn't create anything the, the everything th things that are are a result of the sequence of events from the big bang which is you know the oh, initial point of our observability so like one thing leads to another one leads to another but the big bang didn't create anything and i just want to say i think we have a good understanding of where feelings came from as multicellular organisms and it means that for two billion years life had no spectrum as as far as we can tell of feelings even with life it was on cold yeah emotions are a pretty recent development as far as like, you know, the planet. But the thing is, by natural principles, we normally say light comes from like. No, and don't. if you're saying it just emerges, no. that's the same as saying anything can happen, which is an extremely unsatisfactory explanation. Where no, you no, 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 no. Are you just that invoking is emergent properties to just Fithesis. avoid an otherwise necessary explanation? I mean, Fithesis. it's just. Physicist, that is unsatisfactory to you because you don't like it. So, so it is satisfactory okay. to wanna, you because it's the only option other than God. No, it's just wanna, lazy scholarship this, and this, just really blase. I, I mean, just saying wait, it just emerges on, and happens, on, dumb. I mean, so, it's so, just lazy. Let's go back to this <laughs> like causes like thing. So that sounds a lot like a composition division fallacy to me. So like if I said water can only come from water, I mean, that would obviously make no sense, right? Because hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms, neither of them are water. But when you combine them, you get water, right? supposedly according to the theory but we could go with other theories with that i'm just trying to encapsulate what if anything wait, natural wait, means wait, 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 wait. water is h2o and uh, <laughs> the natural principle we define something as natural it's like coming from like if you're talking about something natural versus something that's supernatural no yeah. it's not he, he just explained it water is is literally h2o but you separate those two you have hydrogen and you have oxygen Hydrogen and oxygen separate are not water. The two of them together are water. There are problems even with the atomic theory of water saying that it's hydrogen and oxygen. When they were doing their chemical studies, they were getting different ratios for hydrogen to oxygen. They were getting 100 to 1, 50 to 1. They were all over the place. Water may just be an indivisible elemental mm -hmm. thing that's not necessarily hydrogen and oxygen. So even that theory is problematic. The point oh is, if we're going to define Perfect. natural, it's like coming from like. So to break that natural circle uh, that's just that's going to last forever and be an infinite regression you need something supernatural to step into the circle and jumpstart things like a god or something like that no That's you don't no you don't in physicists you need to stop using theory 
when you actually you're trying to use hypothesis. Okay. When you think theory, when you, when you, when we say theory, think explanatory model. And when we say hypothesis, think educated guess. Okay. Okay. Well, you're so you're using those terms incorrectly. That's, that's first and foremost, the problem. Okay. You're trying there's to, come no, up there's with... no, there's no theory regarding the chem, the chemical formation of water, which is H2O. Well, if we're talking about hydrogen, one part oxygen, that is water. So maybe we should maybe we should use a different example that's um, not as complicated as water because water is apparently <laughs> complicated. So if, if I take a beaker of water and put in like magnesium sulfate and just let it cool, crystals are going to start to form. Now, magnesium sulfate and water aren't crystals, so crystals are coming from non-crystals, right? Uh, crystals would just be the magnesium sulfate. It's just magnesium sulfate, you no. know, forming in a different way. That's just no. structure. No. That's no. just a structure, though. No. So you understand chemistry as well as you understand physics. Okay, gotcha. So the only way to break natural circles like this, where we say something co comes from something else with similar causative power and similar ability to create the thing, aka human coming from other humans and to break the infinite regression for a theist and philosophically appears to be something from outside of the natural circle something supernatural in the category of god or something that at least breaks this natural stuff where light comes from like no again it's competition division fallacy you're making a competition division fallacy and i'm trying to like walk through this so let's go with an even simpler example a brick no brick is a wall right but if you add a whole bunch of bricks together you can build a wall right but sure but aren't you making like a fallacy of um, a category or like a category fallacy or something you're saying that the crystal exists in the magnesium sulfate example from the micro you know um a level to the macro level we think of the um ultimate stuff that's there the thing that's essentially there being magnesium sulfate the crystal is just a different structure of the same thing no the so crystal is a result of the combination of the water crystals no, coming no, from no, crystals no, we no, categorize no, it as no, what no, magnesium no. sulfate coming from magnesium sulfate in a different form no. So aren't you kind of making a category no, error? No, no. In chemistry, they bond. They're confusing they connect, the structure of a thing, thing with the it thing makes, itself. It it, if you put two different that chemicals together, you put two different the chemicals net. together, the chemicals mix and create a new thing. Two completely different chemicals, add them together, they fuse and make a new thing that was neither in either one of them. So you're talking about the uh, molecular mix mixing, making a new compound. Okay, yes. that's fine, but the way that we define that thing is by its structure, not by right. its essence. We say that the magnesium sulfate is not essentially magnesium sulfate. It has an essence that is deeper than magnesium and sulfate that can be broken apart into pure and pure constituents. So yet again, I'm going to have to call category emotion. here that's, where you're confusing the structure of a emotion. thing with the thing itself. That's and emotion. Goes, yeah. So it's emotions so you're, you're, are a result. You're an emotional appeal. Well, no, no, not an emotional appeal. That emotions, emotions are not are, a structure. What are yes, you talking they are. about? Yes, they are. They are literally a structure in the brain. We can literally measure the structure in the brain, and we can mess with the structure in the brain. It's a structure in the brain. It's like crystals. I think you're appealing to that as a materialist atheist, but you can't show me the structure of happiness, the chemical structure, structure. of sadness. I don't think sure you can. Sure we can. Sure we can. Sure we can. You said one life time. comes from life. Is and, that and one, true every time? And one quick yes. question. I'll, I'll hand it over to Randolph. Sorry, and just one, answer question, that. one quick question yeah. from our YouTube audience. It, it seems a little flippant, but it's from uh, Knut Hovind. It's asking, <laughs> can you ask him if water is wet? <laughs> uh, back to our regular program. Well, why? I have, I have uh, a better question. I have a better question. Synthesis, I have a better question. What TGM tried to explain with the magnesium sulfate and the water, you said it's just the same thing, but it's it's a different structure. Uh, how long can you breathe on the water? Because it's oxygen, right? Yeah. Uh, how long, so can, how you long can you breathe? How long can you breathe under uh, uh, yeah. breathe water before drowning? A minute or two, maybe, if that, depending on whether I'm an you Olympic can't... swimmer or one to ten minutes. Well, but, but maybe longer if I've you, done different uh, exercises, but usually like one to ten minutes. According to you, according to you, water is still uh, oxygen and hydrogen right? There's no difference. So you should be able to breathe underwater because there's but enough oxygen for you to breathe. 
right? But chemistry resolves that contradiction by saying that there are necessary structures in place that either allow hold you to on, break down that what water in the what theory and get the oxygen no, 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 no. And that's no, assuming that the theory about out. water being hydrogen and oxygen is even correct. What you said, like comes from like. So if oxygen exists, hydrogen exists, and water exists, it's all like, because like comes from like, so you could be able to breathe under the water. See how your arguments falls flat there? This is what T-Jump tried to explain with magnesium sulfate and water creating crystals. This is something new. Well, T jump appeared to just be like water is something that something emerged. Just like water, just like water is not like oxygen, is not like hydrogen. Fifth, this is we have an like. audience question for you, and, by the and way. And even and hold on, and even your own explanation, humans come from humans. You are not like your dad. Your dad is different. You're not like your mother. Your mother is different. Like doesn't come from like, because if that were the case, you would be a clone. Well, if like can, uh, unlike can come from something else that's unlike it, then why are we even talking about natural principles? Why are we invoking naturalism? In that case, if unlike can come from unlike, then fine. We have a spiritual God that made physical stuff like you, me, and other stuff to square the circle. I mean, either way, it still counts. I'm just wondering what if any we have, um, uh, we working have a, definition we of naturalism have an have, other than the rejection of um, theism, spirit, we, and anything we, that goes back to God. What does naturalism is, mean when you say something is natural is, or supernatural? Um, Man, no, no one, no one, JL, no one explained to you that we can go back to the Big Bang and we have an explanation for everything, pretty much everything we see. So, so like your explanation, comes, what's why, 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 do, even has why do we need even with the Big Bang model? They talk the, about the uh, inability my, to form heavy I elements. They talk I, about the fact stop, that pause, matter is not pause, uniformly stop, distributed stop, throughout stop, the universe. Stop, there's problems stop, even stop, with the Big Bang, stop, stop, and there's no stop, person back there to witness it. Or stop. Stop. Hey, physicists, hang on. Like comes from like. He jumped as yeah. being if, um, if, a dog piled, and I'm not even getting a chance to get no, an explanation out. Shut physicists, up. Physicists, if there was no Peter, witness, Peter, Peter, hold then up, hold how up, can hold you up. claim Let, that a God stop, created stop, stop, it? Stop, stop, Like comes from like is not a principle in any version of naturalism. That's something you made up. So no nope. version of naturalism has that. Okay, then I could have been born from a unicorn. I could have been born from a horse. The reason why you reject that statement is because a horse is unlike a human and it is unnatural no. for that level of causation to occur. No, the reason I reject that is because the empirical evidence shows that isn't the case. It's not because like comes from unlike. Mm -hmm. I don't care about like comes from unlike. That's not a principle in any version of naturalism. The reason I think you didn't come from a horse is because we have lots of empirical evidence that horses have different DNA and don't create humans. And you have faith in that evidence, and you think that that uh, evidence is sufficient it, it, enough it, to declare it, that it's humans not, come okay. from humans. Physicist, physicist, so now that we're talking faith. about faith, let's talk physicist. about faith in a we're deity not, that makes everything else possible. We're not Great. Physicists, it's, it's not faith. The, faith is not evidence based. I just want to put that evolution states that a human will always be a human, a horse will always be a horse, um, a shark will always be a shark. And so any type of creationist saying otherwise, they just don't understand evolution. So then what is evolution saying that's not tautological? If well, a horse is gonna be a horse, then why I is evolution ask... invoked to say that we went from amoeba to human? Sure, and I just wanna remind everyone there are amoeba in every single branch of life, single cell, unicell, plant, um, animal and fungus and i just want to also put that when are we going to stop being a mammal would you mind answering we're created by a designer that made us to be a human specifically in that mammal class evolution is crap far eastern <laughs> mysticism <laughs> perfect yes, all is one Don't give me a problem so I believe in creationism with a creator that made things that can vary and adapt enough as humans to stay humans, but become adaptable humans, that's, nothing more. That's okay. Please don't answer like a politician. A Please explain claim. when we're stopped going to be mammals. That's fantastic. This, that is a positive claim. Now demonstrate how you know it to be true. I can demonstrate it by the paucity of logic, by the lack of logic within its internal premises. 
if evolution is necessary but, for one thing to become another thing, then what is a thing in of itself? Uh, Greg, Greg Bonson talked about this when he was alive back in the 90s. Um, uh, evolution talks you, about infinite becoming but no being. If ultimately I'm an amoeba that evolved into a human, why am I human in the first place? The because, logical paucity of evolution. If there are Europeans, why are there Physicists. Americans? Physicists, you are, we are human Physicists. because we evolved into this state. Mm -hmm. It's and far and easier. Can I ask a simple, ask a simple the, question, the Synthesis? You, you claimed it. earlier, Synthesis, 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 you claimed earlier, we cannot know any of this because there was no one there. And you now claim to know that God created. So you were there? He was, and either I believe his account or I do not, as no, passed no, no, down no, no, and no, dictated no, no. to the. Uh, uh, to the uh, I don't prophet. care if he, he was. was there. I was I'm not. asking, who who observed it? God did. He he made the freaking yeah, thing. Who, who and else? He dictated it who else? Who, who I mean, God it. can claim. God who? can just claim anything. <laughs> According to you, someone has to have been there in order to observe it, in order for it to be true. So who, other than God, observed it? Well, because oh, you're God dismissing. Is you're part. dismissing the Big Bang because humans weren't there to see it happen. So now, by that same standard. Who was there to see your God creating? Well, if you want to be technical about it, God is technically a Trinitarian. I'm not God technical about it. I'm using, I'm using your so rules, right? There's at least three persons that are there. So you could talk to God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost, okay, so and get a witness account that's much more appealing than those, no witness account are, with the Big Bang and Trinitarian men like yourself looking into the, the past and making guesses. This is, this is, are those one God? One God manifests as three persons. Okay, Three great. witnesses. So what yeah. human, which human was there to observe God, the Holy Ghost and the Son, the Father, the Holy Ghost and the Son, creating anything? Because I'm using no your standard, right? Okay. Yeah, so but you're using it for Like as you... We can, it, we can dismiss it. We can dismiss it. We can we can dismiss it for the exact same reason that you dismiss every field in science. So we're so, gonna quick. get rid of the Big Bang with no witness uh, for. Uh, I'm sorry, you're gonna get rid of creation like with at the, least three like witnesses. Like there is human no or witness. Or Big Bang like with no witness. No witness How is that logical? No, 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 no. Exactly. That like is not logical. No witness for creation. Fitness is the issue. I is, need a witness cannot... account from a god, an angel, from something. I need a witness account. And uh, creation okay, has that bring with the three God, persons okay. of the Trinitarian Hold God on, in it. hold on, hold on. Bring God here, whether it's the Father, the Holy Spirit, or the Son, I don't care. Bring him here and have him make a witness statement. We have the prophets, we have the Bible that is more than no, sufficient. No, 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 even no. if the God came here, there. you're ignoring well, that on. witness. Prophets, we wouldn't even believe him if no, he no, said no. it. I'm still, I'm sticking to your standards. The prophets weren't there at the moment of creation. Only God was. So only the Father, the Holy Spirit, or the Son, any of those can make a witness statement. Can you bring them here to bring to make a witness statement? That'd be great. No, but we have the prophets, we have the Bible, we have Jesus, we oh, have sufficient have evidence right so there. You have You're rejecting standards. that sufficient evidence. That it's, points to you being rebellious no, and not wanting no, to look at the evidence is, at all. No, no, even I'm in using God's your standard. Standard. Oh, come on. Okay, stop. Stop. Physicists, you are making assertions about our position that are that are not warranted. Okay, you're you're essentially you're you're talking. All of your reasoning here is is circular. There were there's no one there to witness creation. If your God if your God exists, yeah, I, I can demonstrate how your God how the Abrahamic God does not exist, but that's beside the point. So there's there was he no human beings standard. there. So you you saying that there's no human beings there to witness the Big Bang? And that yet there, and then you can't not demonstrate there was any witness there to witness creation, the moment of creation. You're contradicting yourself in that respect. It doesn't matter. The point is, you are making positive claim after positive claim after positive claim. You positively claim that your God exists. You positively claim that you know it created things. You positively claim all these things. You predicate all of this on that it, it satisfies some some explanation for you when there is no satisfactory explanation there. God did it is not a satisfactory explanation. 
Okay. This is an emotional appeal that you are making. Now I asked you point blank, demonstrate how you know this to be true. And you have yet to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Broke him. Oh, he got raptured. You did break him. <laughs> yep. You broke him. Any okay. emphasis? You vicious guy, JL. I, you broke I will him. point out that uh, somebody in our YouTube audience, K. Nut Hoven again, is saying if he wants a witness account of the Big Bang, it is called deep space telemetry and cosmic background radiation. So that's a serious I, I, comment. Yes, yeah, so, I didn't even. I didn't even. I, we didn't. I wanted to go there, but it, 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 this just goes to show the lack of understanding of physics, the lack of understanding of cosmology, the lack of understanding of biology that he's. Hey, hang from. on, hang on. This is a, that's a little much. Physicist, can I ask you a simple question from an audience member, real quick? Well, if oh, he's got you, nothing. I'm assuming we're done with him now. All right. Might be having technical issues. I think he's having mic issues. I think his mic is broken. Maybe that's right. Or, or he's, or he's getting God. So Taco, let's let let JL Warren finish what he's saying, and then maybe you can put the question forward. Maybe try rejoining too while he's talking. I'm assuming that we're done. We're done with that. But it, it, essentially, he's just operating from either a willful ignorance of because this has all been. This is what this is what's infuriating is because all of this has been explained to physicists in the past. And it has been, and he's been given the papers that document it. He's been given the evidence that hands it out. Like, like he says, evolution is crap. Evolution is demonstrable. We have both observed it in nature and in the laboratory. We have observed it happening within one generation, two generations, three generations, and so on and so forth, all the way up to 80,000 generations. Evolution is an understood fact of reality. And he, and then he turns around and says, No, it isn't. Crap. Yes, it is, physicists. We have observed it in nature. Thousands we have of observed it. Of bacteria, all they are bacteria. And if bacteria are more fecund and more reproducing than humankind, well, then if evolution isn't happening in bacteria in all these generations, then it's not happening with anybody else. Yes, That's it logical. Is. Yeah, no, this is no. nothing but farming. Physicists, evolution is occurring. That the of all God, Physicists, evolution can is I, can occurring. I just... Evolution is occurring Jail. every time something, every time, every time there is procreation taking place within within a population, evolution is occurring. Evolution doesn't occur to individual things. Evolution occurs in populations. This is this has been ex, this has been explained to you a number of times. If I have a population of four million dragonflies, and then by some evolutionary uh, uh, event, by some evolutionary pressure, that population is divided into two million and two million, and two million go north and two million go south. OK, over time, because of because of evolutionary pressures, certain traits will be positively selected for some will be negatively selected. <sighs> for, And that results in morphological changes in those in those two in those two populations until eventually the two can no longer breed with one another. And if enough morphological changes uh, occur, then ev eventually you will you will not have once one one, uh, one population will no longer resemble uh, dragonflies anymore, but they are still genetically genetically descended from them morphological but that's the generation that's not a new structure being i just want to ask yes it is yes it is yes it is physicists because morphological changes can result morphological changes can result in the creation of new structures and can can result in the loss of structures this is where we get homologous structures from and vestigial structures from this has all been explained to you physicists a hundred times over it is boring and we're tired of, we, and we jail, are tired of jail. taking you to school on this every single time. JL, let me explain one thing to Pythesis. He said bacteria are still bacteria. That sentence is exactly the same as saying animals are still animals. Does that mean that an elephant is exactly the same thing as a snake or a human? Animals is still animals is a category that is useless for this level of discussion. Which is Evolution exactly, is which is exactly the same thing as bacteria. becoming a human beyond just a generalized a animal a class. Is, well, then what you're saying is biological and meaning. Okay, everybody stop. This is bound. So here's the problem. Here's the problem in his reasoning. He is equating what we understand to be amoebas today as what existed 3 billion years ago. 
And that is where his failing is. Mm -hmm. Amoebas that exist today are not what existed 3 billion years ago when abiogenesis took place, okay? What we have today, that with uh, these uh, unicellular organisms, the very primordial essence of when abiogenesis occurred is where life branched out from. We are, and it is a massive tree of which all the, everything you observe today draws back to this one singular event, okay? Amoebas as they exist today are not what is claimed to have existed 3 billion years ago. That's not how evolution works. That's not the way it goes down. Okay, humans didn't come from apes, humans are apes, and we evolved alongside our taxonomically related relatives, which are the other, the other uh, taxa, the also are the other genera, which are Pongo, Pan, and Gorilla, and Homo. We are the last remaining members of that, of that, of that uh, genera, okay? And that all goes back 14, uh, what is it, like 14 million years to another common ancestor. And then those go back even further. Everything goes back in a tree. Okay? okay, but saying this whole claim that he, that human beings came from an amoeba, that is not what we claim. That is a misrepresentation of, of evolutionary biology and a misrepresentation of multiple fields. Okay, he has been ex this has been explained to him a hundred times before, and he keeps coming up just like Otangelo does, making the exact same arguments when they've been debunked a hundred <laughs> times over. They all do that. So next, that that's just mean. What's going on, Nephilim? How are you doing today, sir? Oh. Muted. You gotta <sighs> unmute yourself. Speaking of the person who, uh, <sighs> no, I'm not, I'm not gonna. Say <laughs> I would I'm not try to bring it up. I'm uh, not gonna bring it up. Here. You can try to rejoin if you want. Uh, okay, he left. So speaking of the guy who ran from a debate on evolution with me. Gotta hit the unmute he, he button, Neff. He, he, he ran from everyone's debate, as far as I know. Oh, oh. he's server muted. Um, There's probably me... a reason for that. Okay, so I guess we need to move on to the next person <laughs> until that can be taken yep. care of. Let me get him on server muted. Uh, in the meantime, why don't we bring up another guest and then we'll come back to Nephilim Free. We've got an audience who would like to hear anything. I think Boomerstein was uh, indicating in the live text chat that uh, he's got something to uh, augment what our previous guest just was saying. Yeah. But, but yeah. I think he's say a while they're bringing that up that the reason he didn't answer why we will never be a mammal is because that would debunk creationism. We're always going to be a mammal. We're always going to be primates. We're always going to be humans. That will continue into the future because evolution is a forge of nature and a fact. Well, there may be a point where where we lose attributes that technically define us as mammal, because at one point, you know, when tetrapods were first walking, you know, uh, species like Tiktaalik were walking. It's not technically a mammal, but it had mammalian traits, well, just like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were technically like uh, dinosaurs were technically combinations of birds and reptiles. And so they had both traits, you know, then it, it depends upon, you know, ectothermic or sorry, uh, ectothermic or endothermic. These things can change over time, depending upon the evolutionary pressures. So there may be a time, 10,000, 100,000, a million years in the future, if, if you know, we haven't destroyed ourselves by then, that human beings don't look anything like what we are and that we could. There, there could be a predilection towards ectothermic, uh, ectothermic responses in human beings that could result in our species becoming an ectothermic species. It just takes. Can we move takes the time. next speaker now. Even yeah. if we even in a billion years, we will still uh, be a next, multi species. Next so I did next invite speaker. up uh, Wiz Kid, I guess Whale. Uh, we'll go ahead and pull you up. What's going on, Whale? Yo, what's going on? How are you guys doing? Pretty good. What have you got for us today? Well,. I see you guys up here every Sunday, and I know most Christians <laughs> Sunday morning. Okay, I just got I, I just need to clarify. We're only up here every fortnight. That's every two weeks. Every other Sunday, we're here. And so, so how do how do you know like God ain't trying to communicate to you like on like these other Sundays? Like, uh, you know how like a cable company's <laughs> like, hey, I'm gonna <laughs> be <laughs> here around this time at <laughs> a certain time. <laughs> oh, this so, is like, a great question. So he's trying he's to get trying in touch to... with me about my extended warranty. What a lovely. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. No, that that that's all I got. I thought I'd get like a good laugh out of you guys with that one. 
<laughs> Thank you. That was a lovely question. All right. Well, no, I enjoy ta- uh, hearing you guys talk every Sunday. I enjoy everyone up here. I, I love what you guys are doing. You can put me back down now. I need to clarify every well, fortnight. Well, uh, I'm just curious. Are you a theist? Can or I, atheist or? Before you go, before you go, Will, can I answer your question? Yes, and God, I am. God, I, I God don't even know what I am. Yeah. No, God can't answer us on the other Sunday because he's outside of space and time. Oh yeah, no, that happens. No like you got, you got to like call the manager about that. I think that's like the Holy Spirit. I don't know. I think he's, I think he's yeah, busy. There, there are helping, no Sundays where he is. He's busy helping somebody find their car keys and neglecting the starving children in Africa. <laughs> and 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 helping and helping uh, sportsmen and women win games. Another, well, I, I see two more people down there with. Um, their hands waved. I was just going up here joking. I let them come up and speak. They probably have something more serious than I do. Thanks, oh, Will. It was oh, th- thanks for, thanks no for the problem. joke. No it's, all, it's always fun to keep it light. Hey, Hello, Nephilim Free. What's Hello. going on? How goes it? The giants are indeed free. Mm-hmm. I hear breathing. And most of them were created on a forum that I was part of. Also, if anybody wants to uh, chat with us, feel free to queue up. Uh, We'll bring up next or uh, in order, obviously, but feel free to raise your hand. But what's going on today, Nephilim? Oh, just uh, having fun kicking atheist ideas around the yard. Oh, what kind of ideas? Well, like evolution, like, uh, you know. I just explained evolution. Terrorism and stuff. Oh, and could you turn up your microphone a little bit? Oh, okay. I'll move it closer. Yeah, evolution. That's a nonsensical anti-science idea. It's not. I just explained it's, it. It's disproved by 20th century science. No, it's not. <laughs> sure it is. No, it's not. It's I, just, I literally DNA. just explained it. I literally just explained it to physicists. <laughs> The existence of hey, DNA. Nephi, Nephi, do you have a do you have, do you have a link to the paper that disproved it? Don't need a paper. Just need the scientific facts. No, no, is, no. You need, well, need well, a paper. in science. Well, you need a paper. Obviously, this was scientific yeah. fact. Obviously, if, if this was scientific fact, it would well, have been reported on. Talk over me, I see. Okay. Obviously, if this was scientific well, fact, the there would have been somebody who reported on it, yeah. and that would have been a published have article that you could reference. listening to when you can let somebody talk instead of pretending you want to hear them. You'll have something worth listening to. Nephilim, you have no evidence to back up your claim. So are you going to interrupt me endlessly every time I open my mouth, or you guys have any courage? No, we asked you for <laughs> evidence. You don't have it. Okay. So I, I was trying to say something. So and <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I was saying is that the discovery of the properties of DNA by themselves have refuted evolution theory and shown that we have, in fact, a designer. Because DNA is... They've true. confirmed, they've confirmed evolution. evolution. Algorithms and linguistics and those things arise only from intelligence. Chemistry has no potential to create them. There's no algorithm and linguistics in DNA. Hold a sec, Peter. What do you think the What do you think the Planet Simulator is doing over at McMaster University? How is that? What are you saying? That proves that uh, linguistics algorithms and prescriptive functional information can arise from pure chemistry. No, these are emergent properties of a brain. Okay, so you haven't. Ref- uh, you have some argument against what I said? Also, DNA arose naturally, so you yes. would need a reason why it's intelligently designed. Well, I just demonstrated it can't be. It, it can't be what? It no, can't be intelligently uh, designed. Uh, I, 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 you didn't demonstrate it. You just claimed. No, Nephi, you, there's a difference just, between claiming something mm-hmm. and providing evidence for your claim. I, I did. I told you the property. You're you're in the way. business. You're in the business of claiming, and you're very good at claiming. You're no, very terrible out. at providing evidence for your claim. No, I provided. I, I, which I, is why I, I asked. Which, modern, which is why I asked you for the paper. Okay, so I explained that modern science has discovered that DNA is a four-dimensional package of prescriptive functional information, which operates right. algorithmically and linguistically. A four-dimensional those, those properties. Can you, Cannot be can you link us? Can you can link you us to that discovery? I, I I'm just paper. curious. Do you have any cur- I'm, courage? I'm curious. When you have the courage I'm to curious. not talk over me, I'll have, you'll have something I'm listen, worth listening to. I, I'm just curious. I'll, I'll again. Do you have a link to that discovery? It's done. I'll try again. 
Okay, so yeah. yes, Do I have, have a link to I that have... discovery. Are you done? Okay, so Science Papers published this. It is published in the mainstream journals. The DNA is Where? prescriptive functional information, algorithms, and linguistics. Oh, Where? he's quoting from Creation Ministries and, and therefore, no mainstream science journals. No, no, this is creation.com. Okay, so no, literally creation.com. Link us, like nature. Nephilim, Nephilim, link us to those discoveries. Okay, so where I, can I'll, we find those? Where okay, did you here, find them? Well, he's, okay, so he's, I, I'll, Neph, I'll respond. Neph, when there's one ready. thing you didn't explain you yet because you said that these things can only come about by a mind. Is there a scientific paper that says processes and coding yeah, can okay. only come about by a mind? Endlessly appealing to authority is not going to help you if you can't discuss the subject what? without appealing to somebody else's well, no, ideas. No, no, I'm asking you. you know what? Can, we're can we're you not appealing it? to authority. We're, we're asking you, you for your okay, source. You guys, Peter, one sec. No, no. Neff, you I'm ready? asking you. We're asking, we're asking Peter, you Peter, for your source. Peter, one sec. Neff, I'm asking you, why you do you think only... Neff, one sec. I'm asking you, why do yeah, you, you think can... processes can only... That. One sec, one sec. All right. So so I, want, I, want, I wanted to hear, like, where... Why does he think that only processes uh, that are from a mind can produce, like, patterns and language? Like, that's... He just, he's asserted this. But I haven't heard him justify why he thinks that. Because Shannon information theory mm -hmm. says we can get information just fine, natural stochastic processes. So um, I just pulled up. I just pulled up the article that he's reading from, and it's on creation.com, uh, Creation Ministries International. And <laughs> the title of it, the title of it is "The Four Dimensional Human Genome Defies Naturalistic Explanations." So there is a lot of stuff here. And there is uh, essentially, this is essentially going down to the conclusion, this is an argument from incredulity. Um, yeah. And uh, completely, it says nothing about abiogenesis. It just says that it cannot possibly be naturalistic. That's all that this is saying. Um, it, it basically, it's, I claim the genome could not have arisen through no naturalistic processes. The evolutionist who wants to take up this challenge must give us a workable scenario, including the source of informational changes in account of the amount of mutation necessary and a description of the selective forces necessary, all within the proper time frame. So essentially, he the, the person who wrote this, and this article was written by Robert Carter, um, the person who wrote this is asking for what the Planet Simulator Project at McMaster University is currently working on. That is literally the question that they are trying to currently answer. This takes time. But going down to the very, very bottom of this thing, like where are his sources and everything, um, uh, references and notes, and they all the references and notes go to other things in creation.com. So there are no papers that this, that this article is connected to whatsoever. Just so this is literally... Out. Creationism, creationism stuff. Okay. I, I thought just I'd try one more out time. I'd, I'd give you one DNA more No over talking, man. Allow somebody to have a discussion instead of talking. Wait a minute. He's talking. Don't interrupt him. All right, JL, continue. So that, that debunks this. So this article that he's quoting from, from creation.com, has no reputable sources behind it. All of the sources that it's citing also come from creation.com. And at the very, very end of this whole thing, of this whole article, is literally just in the conclusion of this whole thing, which is a massive deal, um, is literally, I claim the genome could not have arisen through no naturalistic processes. There is no explanation as to why it is impossible. It's just saying, I claim it. So no, you're, 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 you're literally, no Nephilim, you're literally citing an article I found in, in 30 seconds, like, like 10 seconds. Okay, you're citing an article in which it is literally just a claim and there is no evidence given. It's just literally, on this addendum. whole thing is literally an argument from incredulity. Okay, and so that can I respond? We've been having natural genes for 4.5 billion years and we haven't had intelligent creations until eh, the past million and definitively past 100 to 200,000 years. And there you go, now follow yours. So can I respond? Okay. Yes. So I didn't refer to anything in creation.com. I'm referring to papers published in mainstream science journals, including Nature, 
Okay, the, for example, the Karolinska Institute of Sweden, one of the world's foremost biomedical research facilities, states that the grammar in the human genomic language is more complex than that of any spoken human language, published in 2012. And I provide, uh, uh, I have other sources. So, so it's it a modern discovery about the that DNA is, in fact, prescriptive functional information. Now, it hang on a second. Let's look at the first ones. Nephilim. It Nephilim. Operates so let's look at the first claim. Nephilim. Let's, Nephilim. Let's look and at the first Nephilim. one. Those are, those are the first paper you cited. From Nephilim. The first paper you You're cited over doesn't over get you to a creator. It's simply saying that, that genetics is complex. I, I'll, I'll talk to you when you don't talk over me. So Nephilim, you literally the first paper you cited is not evidence for is not evidence for your claim. It's literally just stating that genetics is very complex. No, it's that the combinations states. of GAT and GATC are very complex. That's it. No, and no, technically, actually, it's not a language. That's an abuse of language. Just like genetics, just like 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 GATC is not a code. This okay, is an so abuse that's of language. not what the papers say. The papers don't say what you say. They say that it is linguistic. That it's algorithms. I mean, and that's uh, the, the linguistics of DNA. The al the uh, grammar. Do you have links to those papers? More complex than that of any spoken human language. That's what they actually state. And remember, complexity is not papers. the hallmark yeah. of design. So what Neff is presenting is basically why it's natural. Wait, and Amy, like Amy, said, where's Amy, wait, papers? Amy. Excellent point, Amy. Amy, wait, Neff. Nephilim, do you have links to those papers um, you I, I, I don't have the link, but I can tell you where to find it. The title of the paper is Complex Grammar of the Genomic Language, published in the journal Nature, November 9th, 2015, Karolinska Institute. They state, and I quote them, their analysis reveals that the grammar of the genetic code is much more complex than that of even the most complex human languages. Yeah, unquote. and you see that in that very in the summary of the paper that I just pulled up, grammar is in is literally in quotations because they're not meaning grammar no, like they language. Don't, they don't use quotations. I'm looking at it paper. right now. I'm literally I have it pulled up on my phone. The Karolinska Institute, uh, November 9th, 2015. The Karolinska so Institute. Grammar. Okay, summary. The grammar of the human genetic code is more complex than that of even the most intricately constructed spoken languages in the world. Grammar in that first sentence is in quotation marks. Excellent. They are they are letting you know that it is not it, that, 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 it, that it is not grammar like we think of grammar. Then demonstrate it's not. It's not. They're literally indicating it in the article. I and have it pulled up right here. Isn't. It's also prescriptive functional information that can't arise from nature either. That is a claim, and no, you, you can't back that up. Well, sure. In, information arises from it, it, information is knowledge conveyed from a sender to a receiver, employing a language agreed upon by both parties. That can't. No, be you were no, no. Now you're applying information uh, to two forms of information differently, because no, what, because genetic information. genetic information is not a form of communication. You're using the communication form of, of information in a in a genetic sense, and that is an, that is an abuse of language. No, you that's can't do exactly that. That's just right, like calling yeah. genetic. It's like calling genetic code a code, like yeah, a computer code. That's an abuse of language. And I just that's want to a, say, information no, exactly is actually the to translation be. of symbols, and so it doesn't need to be a conscious agent that does it. It's why you can just have a camera reading data and translating that into information to ship a box to a correct location. Well, well that's incorrect. What they what what's been discovered is that the DNA actually possesses these properties. I'll give you a citation from Abel and Trevor's. They state, and I quote them. No matter how many bits of possible combination it has, there is no reason to call it information if it does not at least have the potential to produce something useful. What kind of information produces function? In computer science, we call it a program. Another name for software is an algorithm. No man-made program comes close to the technical brilliance of mycoplasmal genetic algorithms. Mycoplasmums are the smallest known organisms with the smallest genome to date. How was its genome and those of other living organisms programmed? Programmed, end quote. They weren't programmed. That's the problem, is that they you're were. using terminology incorrectly. In denial of 20th century science. It's not a denial of 20th century uh, science. It, it is a pointing out that you are abusing language when you do this. No. Okay, I, the, two the, the two are not analogous. The two are not analogous, Nephilim. Nephilim, the two are not analogous, and you need to stop doing it. Well, I'm just pointing out what modern science has discovered. Uh, about no, DNA. you're not. You're abusing you're, language. You're, 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 you're taking sources that abuse language. You're talking over me again. 
Yeah, you're I'm, absolutely I'm you're you're damn out. right. You're goddamn right. I'm going to talk over you, Nephilim, okay, because so you, you are abusing language in order to make your point. Someone, something you say will have be worth listening to. Nephilim, so you are abusing language to make your point. The can two things are not analogous. Is there anyone else who can just have an actual discussion? Well, I just want to say that these papers aren't pointing in the direction of a god, and a complexity is not the hallmark. Yeah. I have a God, so I want to know okay. why you think we should believe in a God. Okay. Well, that's a different subject. I didn't say the papers prove God. What they prove is that life has a designer. That's what right. they prove. You the, question you today, have a conversation. the question today is not whether yep. or not life is designed. The question is, who is the designer? That's the only question left today. Okay. Because if if the question is who is the designer then first we need to establish if the designer you propose actually exists so well, I have how to can we get how can we get some evidence whether or not your exists because if he doesn't exist he didn't design anything yeah so i do have reasons to believe that the biblical god is is the designer i'm not asking i'm not asking for, for reasons for you to believe I'm asking for evidence of your designer actually existing. My reason. Those are two different things. No, it is the evidence. That's my reason for. No, 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 no. Your reason to believe and the fact that you believe is not evidence. Okay, you're not following. That is a claim. My reasons for believing is the evidence. Can you follow that? Do you understand? Yeah. What's what's your evidence? Well, there's multiplicities of evidence. One is that the Bible proves itself to be the inspired word of God. Why should we believe the Bible? Because it has historical foreknowledge that goes far beyond what's Wait, reasonable. Why should, why like, should we believe okay, the Bible? If you're able to allow me to speak without talking over me, you'll have something to say that I'm worth it, that's worthy of me listening to it. Are okay. you able to? Okay, we're done with him. So I just want to, be I just want to know long. I'm because... sick and tired of sick and tired of his intellectual dishonesty, and I'm sick and tired of his <laughs> of his nonsense. It's, uh, it's 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 the the the, the conversation is old. It, it, we we already know where that's going to go. That his reasoning is that his re he's using the Bible to prove the claims of the Bible, and it's you know like I said, uh, there's no point in going. There's no point in getting on that merry-go-round because it doesn't go anywhere. And can I just point <laughs> out that evolution versus creationism is a proxy war because there is no evolution versus creationism. There is evolution because it's a fact, and you can either accept that fact as a theist or an atheist. Mm -hmm. And the big point, the big, the really important thing on that is that God, the existence of a God and the, the truth of and the fact of evolution and the hypothesis of abiogenesis, are, these are not mutually exclusive concepts. They're, they're not. A God could exist, a, like a God or a deity or a, like a deity could exist, and evolution could be the means by which it diversified life, and abiogenesis yeah. could be the means by which it created everything. Mm -hmm. So these are not mutually exclusive concepts, okay? okay. And so, his intellectual dishonesty and willful ignorance is just aggravating as hell. Now, now to and, add to Amy's yeah. point, uh, I, I, I often tell people, like, you know, it's creationism versus abiogenesis. That too. True, yeah. It should be creationism versus abiogenesis, not creationism versus evolution. Yeah, different very different, different things. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the YouTuber a bit of orange fell into that same trap, thinking that. Well, wouldn't, well, wouldn't it be more like creationism versus like Big Bang cosmology? Yeah, you could go all the way to the. Well, you could go all the. I mean, all the way back, I guess. Like, like creating, well, creating the universe. So, Taco, that's also correct. It, it, you know, it depends on angle that as JL Warren is alluding to that they're uh, that they're working focusing on. So if it's on uh, life, then it's abiogenesis. If they're focusing on the creation of all of the universe, well, the cosmos, life, the universe, and everything, then uh, that would be uh, the the Big Bang. Or you can go even further back to the beginning of the cosmos, which you know our universe uh, is suspected to not necessarily be the same age as the cosmos. The all cosmos cosmos could be a lot older or we could be in the first universe in the cosmos we don't know right and there's also a bunch of deistic concepts too like necessity and that type of thing anyways uh what's going on holy relic hello i want to talk to t-jump specifically about something is that fine mm -hmm. 
Are you there, T Jump? What? You have a fan. Am I getting um, paid? Yeah. Um, no, you're not getting paid. <laughs> but I just have a question. This isn't uh, an argument. I just want to clarify one point that you made. Your mom. So, okay, that's a great answer. Okay, anyway, <laughs> the point I'm trying to get at here is that you said that um, something along the lines of if I can prove that there is another B theory of time, then um, that disproves that it necessarily is the case that. Um, it disproves the fact that it's necessarily the case that there can't be like a first cause type argument or whatever. What? That was an infinite regress thing. It was like if if it's logically possible that you can have a present moment and an infinite yeah. past, that disproves the fact that it's logically impossible to have an infinite regress. Yeah, I have a question. So you, yeah, that, that is correct. But um, why? Uh, just a, a personal question. Why in my life and like all observed human history have we not seen um? B theory of time does it not seem like uh, like, uh like... <laughs> why have we not seen okay, a theory so... of what why, why, why have we not seen it enacted so why why is time seemingly enacted. sequential like why is it why is it sequentially going from the past to the present seemingly because that's the way it seems what does that have well, to do with because anything? we're, we're... We're no, three my point we, is that we, I feel like it's more likely that a theory of time no, technically exists. because we've it perceived literally in the third, doesn't matter. Like the point of the argument, the third point, dimension. Hold up, hold up. It doesn't. The point of the argument wasn't that B theory of time was likely or the most likely. Like I don't accept the B theory of time. That wasn't the point of the argument. The point of the argument was: is it, lo is it logically possible to have a past infinite regression and a present moment? Like I, I don't accept the B theory of time either. So, I got it. Um, so if uh, would you accept that the a theory of time is the most uh, likely to be true or no? No, it's not. It's not the consensus in physics. I go with the consensus in physics, which is neither the a theory nor the b theory. Okay, that's all I wanted to clarify. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. See you. Awesome. And if anybody would like to come up, feel free to raise your hand. We'd love to have you come up here and chat with us. Um, but do any of y'all have any comments on any of the guests we've had so far, or uh, any other discussions that we've had so far? Yeah, Nephilim, get good. <laughs> God, sorry. He's Nephilim's just, fun. He's just aggravating ever, ever since he ran from the debate that I was supposed to have with him on evolution. Hello, Viking Zek. Welcome. What is up, my fellow Canadian brother? <laughs> so, so, all I wanted to say is thank you to you guys in particular for lowering the uh the intelligence of the entire discord by bringing up nephilim that was amazing i my brain hurts you're welcome right. that was my idea you, you are 100 percent welcome the combination of nephilim and physicists you know just outweighs like otangelo by oh by is definitely the first step <laughs> Yes, and it was the natural progression. The only thing worse would now to be bring up Mr. Batman, and that is not a suggestion. Please don't. Uh, no, I uh, last time, last encounter we had on here with him, he got into all kinds of bigotry that uh, I ended up making some rather strong statements in response to. Uh, nothing bad. It's just, Randolph just, uh, had to make an uh, executive decision. Make... He had to make an executive decision in the only way a Canadian can. Yeah, I, I handled it politely, but I, uh, I, I stated very clearly that uh, his ideas were not acceptable. It was uh, anti-LGBTQ stuff, I believe, and anti-sexual orientation stuff. What did he say that yeah. he handled and, as well? And, what? And I, I don't know why yeah, I just it. what just happened? <laughs> I, have no, I have no idea. He popped up and said, "Vikings up here right now," so we don't need him up. So. <laughs> And now a uh, god 420 just mysteriously appeared. Wow, this is an interesting stream. <laughs> okay, so Viking, um, did you have any uh, ideas you wanted to present forward to us here? Uh, not really. Unfortunately, I'm pretty much in the same boat as the rest of this panel. Oh, oh, you're a fellow atheist. Well, hey, that's uh, I'll make a note of that in the chat here Ooh, in the wow. YouTube description. I gotta tell you, it's like, uh, it's a total side note, but as far as like Canada goes, I am like in love with Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. I really am. I just, I like that, those coastal areas. I just like, they're gorgeous. And I fell in love with those through various shows I've watched um, that, are, that, that that shoot up there in those locations. But man, those, those are some gorgeous areas up there. 
Honestly, honestly, out in uh, Prince Edward Island, you have the most beautiful country and you have the most beautiful pink roads and you have the best potatoes anywhere in Canada. He's calling for you, T Jump. The best potatoes. Yeah, so you'll find those areas are kind of quiet. They have, um, and they're quite nice for people who want to have a quiet life. If you're more inclined toward uh, big city life, you'll enjoy uh, uh, Vancouver, BC, or Toronto, Ontario, and places like that a lot more. It also well, came back full circle. We're talking about good old fashioned potatoes, boil them, <laughs> mash them, stick them in a stew. Well, if I ever if I ever emigrate, um, which is looking more likely if I get the opportunity to do so, if I ever emigrate, you know, if I try to get out of you know Gile Gilead before it becomes Gilead, um, then uh, I'm looking at uh, Nova Scotia or Newfoundland because no uh, no 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 you want to go to the Okanagan. Oh really? I'll say that I, flat out. The Okanagan I, is <clears throat> the best spot in Canada. I I have a question for the Canadians. Uh -oh. Prince Albert Island, is that a good place to get a piercing? <laughs> I don't think I've ever been to Prince Albert Island. Yeah, I haven't either. Um, I, I thought someone mentioned it earlier. I was most curious. guys only go once. <laughs> you mean Prince Edward Island? <laughs> anyway. I may, I may have misheard. So I'm I'm thinking that uh, we're probably close to the end here, uh, unless somebody else wanted to join in and uh, provide any perspective. Otherwise, we can go with our final thoughts, and uh, I, I think we'd be happy to let our, our guest here uh, give some final thoughts, if that's the case. Viking Zach, did you have any final thoughts on on our program today on uh, how uh, various things went? Oh, there's somebody actually in the stream as uh, one of yours now. But if you wanted to share some final thoughts about it uh, before we end the stream, yeah. And if anybody else that's a theist thinks they can convince us that God exists, we're totally open ears. We want to be convinced. That's why we're here, but um, not happening really. <laughs> well, What's going on, Angel? Uh, as far as any final thoughts that I have, I think that JL Warren has pretty much demolished anybody who decided to come up here. I mean, the, especially the people with actual thoughts, although I'm not sure if you could call Nephilim or Cloudy any of those. But uh, I did want to say, T-Jump, I am a huge fan of you. I love your reasoning methods. You're just, you're fantastic. Thank you. Send me money or hot blondes. Hey, uh, well, well, I, I mean, I'll never be. I, I will, no, I'm not going to say that. But Viking, did you happen to catch his debate against uh, Darth Arianus? Uh, I'm not sure if I caught Darth Arianus. That was a good one. That was so a really good one. T Jump did a debate uh, moderated by Tom Rabbit, and he debated and, and T Jump you debated Darth Arianus on whether or not you're an idiot. Oh, that was like last night, wasn't it? I missed it. I was going it to was, watch that. It was so brilliant. You have to go watch it. <laughs> it was so good. It was like two nights ago. It was so good. I just figured, how long are you going to extend the syllable no? <laughs> uh, my my opening was, is yes, I am an idiot. So. <laughs> oh, so you <laughs> took the positive position? <laughs> yep. If I can, if I can interrupt, can I make my closing statements? Because something came up and I, I have to go. Oh, okay, sure. And then uh, uh, just going to say, Viking Zach, thank you for joining us. We're going to move on to Angels Freeman just after Peter speaks. Thank you for joining us, Viking Zach. Thank you, Viking. Okay. I just wanted to say this This is uh, always a lot of fun. And, and today was it was something special. Uh, JL, thanks for the, the interaction with Cloudy. I, that probably made my day. Oh, and, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll see all of you uh, back in two weeks, I guess. Take it easy, buddy. See ya. Send okay. love, Peter. Catch you guys later. I'm actually Bye -bye. supposed I'm actually supposed to debate. Cloudy. Take care, I, Peter. He wants to debate me on the existence of God, and I'm trying to get that set up with a moderator. Um, now I'm now I'm kind of like, hmm. <laughs> but anyway, Angel, Angel. Angel's Freeman. Yeah, just like to say it was nice to see Whale come up. He's always good fun. 
and Nephilim and physicists. Oh, my word. Isn't that something? We had a whale of a time. This is a very, very yeah. fun group of guests today. It's, uh, I had fun. It's this was very fun. So, Angels I'll Freeman, I'll did, you, did you have something yeah, for us? Yeah, arguing with Nephilim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been hanging around on PNR for a while, and I've been talking with Nephilim and a few of the other people. And I just, it was just so pleasant to see you guys hold Nephilim to it in a format where he didn't have a mute button just to tell you guys, just to try to mute you. Because usually that's what he does. And once you start to get to a point where you're holding his feet to the fire, he'll just mute you. And, you know, we found sources before, brought them sources. Like, I guess my question is, how can you express to somebody like that that you've already talked to them so many times and unless... In, in unless they up their game like uh jl said like you know be better like i just don't know why they keep coming back with the same bs and never advance their arguments from you know, 2000, okay 1999 the only the only i could posit from this is that i mean you well you could posit it one of like one of two ways one is that they're being willfully ignorant they actually do understand what we're trying to say to them and they just they're just they just willfully you know ignore it it's like no nope, no nope, i'm just going to ignore all that and that they're doing it on purpose and the purpose and the only reason they would do this because they know that there there are going to be people out there that they interact with who don't have as who haven't acquired as much um education on these things that they could po potentially uh manipulate with this they could say oh look at all this that i have and then they can kind of overwhelm the less uh the less versed and manipulate them into believing their position. So, and they do this over and over. And they, and I think that Nephilim personally, he does this because he knows he's going to get shut down and it makes him, it essentially makes him look like he's being pro uh, persecuted. So it kind of fulfills the Christian persecution complex that he's got. You're stealing my ideas, JL. Come on. Right. So Nephilim will come up here and he knows he's going to espouse his stuff. We know he's going to espouse his stuff. He, he knows we're going to debunk him. We know he's going to debunk him. But if he if he if he's like no you keep interrupting me you won't let me talk like that i'm a victim i'm being victimized i can't you you're suppressing the truth and then he eventually acts such a fa fashion that he gets kicked then he can say i was the victim they wouldn't let me speak and blah 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 and it basically it fulfills his christian persecution complex and then he can go and appeal that to other people and be like they the atheists they just won't let you talk and you know it's just the big vicious circle there um that or you know he's a po and he's just doing yeah. it for the for the for the lulls i think it's the lulls because he can't be that you know i don't know what he's doing but he's definitely not in the audience he's already spoke so he doesn't care to listen to anybody else he could be busy i don't know but you know it is the end the best I, way i just to find it very life. disingenuous just very disingenuous that's all right uh, the best oh. way to handle guys like that is like a lawyer, just like J.L. Warren was kind of holding his feet to the fire. It's what they want to do to us. It's what people like Darth Dawkins want to try and do. And so the uh, mechanism that you need to use is just the simply the Socratic method. Ask yeah. questions about their own beliefs, uh, answer truthfully when they ask you questions, but it really should be a one for one, and you should be trying to figure out why Nephilim Free thinks that giants are real. Because once again, <laughs> I love all theists out there, but that is ridiculous. Well, he he linked to me. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. You uh, you know all those like. I think they're from 2008, 2010, something like that. All those uh, giant discovered articles in like Egypt and other places that were yeah, yeah. posted all over the internet. That's what he linked to me. He linked to me a couple of those when he told me that he believes in giants. Yeah. Well, he's the joke article. You know, or... Yeah. He doesn't, he's not interested in science. He's interested in filling his narrative to a way he feels comfortable. And then once he has a comfortable story, I think he just sticks to it. No need to change it. It works. Uh, I, I still doesn't. think it's funny that he ran away from a debate from JL and then claimed that JL did it. That was funny. 
<laughs> oh, that was that was hilarious. Yeah, that, I forgot all about that. That's right. That's right. I mean, I got he to read the emails, the so I know who's telling the truth there. Yeah. He, well, he laid down the gauntlet, and then he ran away. away. <laughs> yeah. I well, challenge you. It was you very to nice to see you do that, JL. Again, um, I would like to find a way to calmly not. You know, I don't want to hurt Nephilim. I'm getting. I guess I'm getting soft, but. Um, you know, at the same time, it would be nice if, if he could up his game a little bit and be more honest when he doesn't know. And just, you know, even if he just said it seems this way to me, that it must be this way, I'd have a lot more respect for him than him just telling me it is that way. Agreed. Right. So I guess I guess that's what I'm after. I'm after having the Christians be less confident in their assumptions. And I'm, I'm kind of curious how they can be so confident, like all in. And it's it's got to be some kind of brainwashing, um, self brainwashing. I don't know. It's but anyway, Dunning Kruger effect. There. But I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's a Dunning Kruger effect. Um, and 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 I will, yeah. I'll, I'll attest. I will attest. Indoctrination goes deep. Goes like big time deep. Um, I didn't realize how deep until I was on uh, I was on my the, my path of deconversion, and because I was brought up in the faith, and at one point you know that you get that you get that one moment where something just doesn't make sense. And then that elicits inquiry because my, my parents uh, raised me to always ask if it doesn't matter, if it's something doesn't, doesn't suss out, always figure out why. And so this one thing popped up, one thing led to another, and then you go down the path and eventually I was, I was, you know, but when I, when there were certain truths that I came to in my deconversion process, where you're talking about like real existential issues, like, like existential dread, like, I am fully responsible for my entire life and I am fully responsible for determining my purpose and my value. And I'm fully responsible not only for my actions, but also my inactions. That was a hard truth to swallow and almost sent me running right back to religion because religion alleviated me of that responsibility. Cause I could always say it's God's plan or God works in God moves in mysterious ways. So there's always an excuse there. But when I realized that, you know, this thing does not exist, therefore the responsibility for these things falls on me, both my action and my inaction. That's a hard responsibility to, to have to just, you know, like drop in your lap. And so I didn't realize years later, the indoctrination, how deep that, how deep those roots run and how, you know, when things get scary or things get tough, your brain's like, Oh, I don't want to deal. And then you just have to like muscle your way through that and, you know, and recognize it. What I search for and what I hope, it's like this one, the one debate that I had with a theist, and this was the most, this was the, the, the best debate I've ever had with a Christian, is essentially his position was, I believe that there's a God, I know that it is irrational, I have no evidence to support its existence, I believe in this thing because it fulfills, it, it provides psychological utility for me, it makes me feel better about my place in the universe, um, I can't demonstrate the truth of it, it's something that just... I, I derive value from, and therefore it, that's what it is. That's it. And he rec and he recognized the irrationality uh, that it wasn't rational. It was completely emotional. That there was no logical basis in it, and it's all good to go. And he was fine with that. And I was like, okay, that that's intellectually honest. I, I can't argue against that. You know, because he was able to accept that. And if they could all be that way, that'd be fantastic. So we do have one other person raising their hand if we want to go to them before we end. I was going to actually say something. Thanks, guys. <laughs> we actually already have Boomer Stein in here. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I've been waiting. What do you want, Boomer? J <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of, I don't like defending Cloudy, but I feel like I kind of have to, even though he's pushing ex Nihilo, whatever the hell it's called. Oh, uh, I the, think the appeal, he, appeal to divinity? No, no. Because um, he was talking about ex ex divinate, like um. Yeah, he, was, he, he was he was saying he was saying that his explanation was out of God. Okay, I'm okay. I'm definitely not defending him. Then. Okay, like ex okay ex divine is it is it ex divine is what he called it? Okay, oh. so I don't have to defend him. That's good. <laughs> yeah, he was just that was his explanation. It's just it's out of God. God wills it, and therefore it is. So he was. He so was you asked. For, uh -huh. so, so you asked for a mechanistic way of creation, correct? Yeah, the, like, like, you know, like how, like out of God, how did the heavy elements form and how did those come about? And, and then you know, the planets and, or sorry, the stars and then galaxies and then 
So yeah, so on and so forth. I think you can. So here, here's where it comes into just like what you think makes the most sense because I feel like we've had this discussion before. And you you said to me like you don't accept supernatural, but I mean if you can apply personhood to the changing of energy, that is divinity, because the way like even though like the way we perceive time is pretty weird. I think you can argue that energy changing is within time and any like rate of change is time. Right. But I don't see how you could apply personhood to like the first law. That's not what I mean. I mean the actual creation of like movement with energy and turning into the big bang could have actual personhood behind it. Oh, you're I talking about you like you're that. talking about like the deistic explanation. Yeah, right? yeah, that's like, what I mean. of agent. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's a fair mechanistic perspective. It's not really helpful for Christians. Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, there's nothing, I, I can reject it just because on its unfalsifiable properties, it's yeah. just kind of like, okay, we can assert that. That's fantastic. There's nothing to support it. So I'll but just it's, reject, it's the same it. either way. It's an equal right. claim as saying nothing. That's, gotcha. I just think that's a fair, I don't know, I didn't think you'd disagree, but I think that is a mechanistic way it could happen. I believe Cloudy was one of those that was defending the contingency argument. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest. I dipped halfway through Cloudy's because I had to go get gas. I'm wary yeah. about debating the existence of God with him. Mm. Not that I can't I defeat. I, I, the, the 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 Abrahamic God is uh, that's easy. Yo, when did Cloudy's voice drop? Last time I was here, he sounded like he was like 12, and now he sounds like he's actually a teenager. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we should probably uh, try to stay on topic here. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll dip. I'm out. That's it. That's it. The, the, the joke. Because that was an inside, I'm sorry, Randolph. That was, that's an inside joke from way back, uh, like way back early PNR when we would hang out and counter apologetics and Cloudy would come in. So, yeah. So. Thank you for coming on, Boomer. Yeah. Thanks very much, Boomer Stung. Uh, who's next here? Thusness. Thusness. Thusness, they came. I bring Thusness up. So, hello, Thusness. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. What have you got for us today? Um. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm. I'm just here to uh, ask about the principle of sufficient reason. I remember in the discussion with Cloudy, it came up. I don't know if he was using it to bolster his creationism. I don't really or uh, uh, theism. I don't really remember uh, that discussion. But. Uh, I remember the hosts were pretty opposed to the arguments of sufficient reason, so I'm just wondering as to what the arguments are against it, uh, against the ability to invoke causes to explain, like, fundamental things. Because um, so, it, it seemed like something the people were opposed, opposed to, so I just am not familiar with the argument against it. <clears throat> Well, uh, Quantum Foam sent me one of the technical arguments. You could ask him. He'll send you like the actual uh, syllogism to yourself. I mean, to, to, to you, not Quantum. Uh, and I just I like to go with the brute facts. If brute facts are possible, the PSR is wrong, and I'm happy with that. Can you give me like an example of a brute, of a brute fact? Sure, a universe with a potato, just a potato. Uh, wait, can you repeat yourself? So what do you say? Universe with a potato. Possible uh, world you... with nothing but a potato. And the potato is a brute fact. Um, what do you? How did you know that? How or how? How can you possibly know? Or I don't need to. I don't need to know access. anything. How, it's, it's a yeah. hypothetical possible world. All I need to know is it's not a logical contradiction, and that yeah. makes it a possible world. Wait. So how do you know that potato didn't come into a becoming via via previous causes? How do you know that it's brute? Because like, it's a possible world I literally just imagined in my brain, which it isn't that. So if so, I made so if I made up the possible world where it's a potato that wasn't caused by anything prior, that's how I know it wasn't caused by anything prior because it's the possible world I literally just imagined. That's yeah. So so that's just, there's a universe, and in the universe there exists nothing but a potato. That's it. Is there a logical contradiction with this universe? Um, well, like, uh, I don't understand how this is re relevant. No, but... no, the, the, that's the this whole point. There's no logical contradiction there, which means you can, you can imagine it. And there's no logical contradiction. So that's all that it takes. You don't have to demonstrate. It's actually a thing that, that exists. 
Although that'd be awesome if you could, but you don't have to. All you have to do is all you have to do is demonstrate that there is no logical contradiction in what you are what you are what you are uh, proposing, and because there's no logical contradiction there, that's why. That's why I was asking. There's no logical contradiction about T Jump Potato Universe. Okay. Do you, so in terms of like uh, physics and like existential experience, do you think that the principle of sufficient reason is true? Um, uh, you mean insofar as we can say the actions we see around us are caused by previous actions? Sure. Um, yeah, I don't... Does the principle of a sufficient reason pertain to like random hypothetical possible worlds where there only exist potatoes like it doesn't it just i maybe i haven't thought about it but it depends which psr you go for if you're going for the psr that says all contingent things must have some explanation or all events must have some explanation then yeah even the logical possibility of one event not having an explanation would refute the psr so if you're going for like a weak psr or something maybe not how do you know that the possible world with the potato does not have an explanation? Like on what grounds are you because negating? Because I literally possible? defined that possible world. So possible worlds, just ways the world could be. One possible way the world could be. Potato, uncaused, existing, only thing. That's it. So, so it's one of the possible worlds I'm defining. That one possible world is the one I'm speaking about. So if it was created by something else, that's not the word I'm speaking about. I'm only speaking about the one where the potato is a brute fact and it wasn't caused by anything else. Do you believe that this possible world is like currently ontologically uh, real in no, a latent I'm not, sense? I'm not a Just... modal ontic realist. Yeah, so um, I mean, the the ontology of this possible world is is uh, founded or contingent on your on your thinking about it or, or entertaining its possibility. So it's not an uncaused uh, plane or thing. No, if there's no logical contradiction in it, then that means that it's possible, which means it's, there's no logical contradiction. Therefore, the PSR, one of the principles, is false. Things that are contingent don't need a prior explanation. All it needs to be is logically possible. It doesn't need to be actually proven to be the case. You just need to show how it's possible. That's it. Um, Wait, so what's the uh, potato contingent on? Like, it just seems uh, completely abstract and not related to anything. It doesn't seem what, contingent. What contingent means could be otherwise. So it could be a tomato instead of a potato. Could be oh, an okay. apple, watermelon. Are you asking okay. what is it dependent upon? Uh, well, uh, what do you what do you mean, like? Like what's we're asking if it relied on something, right? Um, well, yeah, like uh, the the ontology. Well, this guy says he doesn't believe in the ontology of the possible world, so I think that question would be kind of irrelevant, or not, not it wouldn't apply. Uh, but I, I think I misunderstood. Actually, I think I, uh, it clears up the uh, what uh, the argument that these uh, people were making because I yeah I I it, I, I I wasn't even familiar with the formal argument or the principle of sufficient reason uh, i just i don't really read like modern philosophy so i, I just i just wasn't familiar <laughs> uh, don't sweat it just if somebody ever brings a psr just say omni potato and you've got them <laughs> <laughs> i think that works okay. for every argument just omni potato yep. well um yeah well anyway i mean yeah thank i mean you cleared it up i mean you know i don't i don't have any other uh, further questions i guess so. Um, okay. Thanks, Vesnes. Uh, see you. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming up. Thank you, Vesnes. So, t is that going to be, like, our answers for everything they bring up, just omnipotato? It should be. We should just have one day that we just, that's the only answer we can give for any question. <laughs> be great if Nephilim came that day. It'd be phenomenal. Omnipotato. So, Otangelo sent me a PM. Saying he had a previous conversation with T. Jump, let me pull it back up. So last time I was talking about the genetic code, but I was interrupted by T. Jump. I think there is more to be debated about it. The genetic code is a language, which in my view is strong evidence of design. I want to explore the topic a bit further. That's from Otangelo, so maybe he'll come up. <sighs> but rather not, because it's just an abusive language. It, it, oh yeah, for language. sure. For sure, like when he said, uh, 
the genetic code is a language, 100%. That's an abuse of language for sure. Right. All right. So um, we don't have anybody else in queue, really. So I, I think we were planning on calling it a little bit early. If a tangent wants to pop up, you're welcome to pop up. Does anybody have any closing uh, words that hasn't already said their closing words? How many potato? I'm going to go take a nap. See you later. Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I, 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 I,